Section 1 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Section 1 Introduction by William J. Locke. One of our most delightful novelists has recently written a preface to a collection of his short stories, in which he apologizes for disinterring them from magazines and resuscitating them in book form. I think he ought not to have done it. If a preface were needed, it should have been written rather as an appeal than as a warning. It should have been in the nature of a bugle blast. It should have said, in effect, Hear my faithful and gentle readers who, owing to the limitations of time and space and the worries of the world, have missed much of my best and most cherished work. Here is an opportunity of an unexpected feast. I confess that such an appeal would not have been modest, and the author in question is the most modest of our confraternity, but the assertion would have been true. Now, with the agreeable task before me of writing a preface to another man's collection, I am not bound by any such sense of modesty, and I should like to make clear once more certain issues which my friend above referred to has, to a certain extent, confused. In the first place, it must be understood that the novel and the short story are two entirely distinct artistic expressions, as different as the great oil painting and the miniature and as rarely as the accomplished landscape painter and the accomplished miniaturist are incarnate in one and the same individual so rarely are the accomplished novelist and the accomplished short story writer thus incarnate the most fervent admirers of mr rudyard kipling among whom i am proud to count myself will not claim for his novels, though possessing the incalculable and indefinable personal touch, the magical genius of expression which is to be found in all his work, even in the absent-minded beggar, the perfection of statement and the flawless technique of plain tales from the hills and life's handicap. In the same way we would not measure Guy de Montpassant's greatness by une vie, or mont Oriol, and though the late Henry Harland is best known by that study in sunshine, the cardinal snuff-box, his real lovers turn to the inimitable short stories in grey roses and comedies and errors. Conversely, some of the greatest novelists have but little value as short story writers, the so-called short stories of Dickens, the cricket on the hearth, the chimes, a Christmas carol, are between thirty and forty thousand words in length. Among Thackeray's many sketches may be found a few which we understand as short stories, but they do not rank with Henry Esmond and the Newcombs. The essential novelist, accustomed to his broad canvas, to the multiplicity of human destinies with which he is concerned, and their interrelation, to his varied backgrounds, to the free space which his art allows him both for minute analysis of character, and for his own philosophical reflections on life, is apt to find himself absurdly cramped within the narrow confines of the short story. His short stories have a way of becoming condensed novels. They contain more stuff than they ought to hold at a sacrifice of balance, directness, and clearness of exposition. Now, without dogmatizing in the conventional fashion, or indeed in any fashion, over what a short story ought or ought not to be, or asserting definite laws of technique, I think it is obvious that if a story told in ten thousand words would have been a better, clearer, more fully developed story told in a hundred thousand, it is not a perfectly told story. For though there is a modern tendency to revolt against an older school of criticism which set technique over subject, 
and to scoff at form, yet we cannot get away from the fact that the told story, whether long or short, is a work of art, and is subject to the eternal canons whereby every art is governed. No matter what a man has to say, if he does not strive to express it perfectly, he is offending. The condensed novel, being imperfect, is an offence. On the other hand, the essential short story writer engaged upon a novel is apt to be dismayed by the vastness of the canvas he has to cover. His habit of mind, minute, delicate, and swift, wars against a conception of the architectonics of a novel. In consequence, his novel may appear thin, episodical, and laboured, with scenes spun out beyond their value, thus missing their dramatic effect and spoiling the balance of the work. If, therefore, a story of a hundred thousand words could have been told more effectively in ten thousand, it is, like the condensed novel, not a perfectly told story. Briefly, the tendency of the essential novelist in writing a short story is to make literary condensed milk, while that of the essential short story writer, working in the medium of novel, is to make milk and water. Occasionally, of course, among the great writers of fiction we meet with the combination of the two faculties. Balzac, the short story writer, is as great as Balzac, the novelist. The Contes Drolatiques alone would have brought him fame. Stevenson was master of both crafts. Who shall say whether the sire de Melitroid's door or the ebb tide is the more perfect work of art? Now, among contemporary writers, Mr. Leonard Merrick is eminently one who, like Balzac and Stevenson, is gifted with the double faculty. His reputation as a novelist rests on a sure foundation, and his novels in this edition of his works will be dealt with by other hands. But, owing to the fact of the novel being in the commercial world more important than the short story, his claim to the distinct reputation of a short story writer has more or less been overlooked. Again, it is popularly supposed that a writer of fiction regards the short story as either a relaxation from more arduous toil, or as a means of adding a few extra pounds to his income. In his acquiescence in this disastrous superstition lies my quarrel with my distinguished preface-writing friend. Now, although I do not say that we are all such high-minded folk that none of us has ever stooped to pot-boiling, yet I assert that every conscientious artist approaches a short story with the same earnestness as he does a novel. Further, that in proportion to its length, he devotes to it more concentration, more loving and scrupulous care. There are days during the writing of a novel when that combination of fierce desire to work and sense of power which one loosely talks about as inspiration is at ebb and others when it is at flow. Homer nods sometimes. No man can bestow equal essence of himself on every page of a long novel, but a short story is generally written at full tide. By its nature, it can be finished before the impulse is over. There is time to weigh every word of it, attend to the rhythm of every sentence, adjust the delicate balance of the various parts, and there is the thrilling consciousness of unity. Instead of the climax being months off, there it is at hand to be reached in a few glad hours. So far from being an unconsidered trifle, the short story is a work of intense consideration, and as far as our poor words can matter, of profound importance. It may be said that anything in the nature of a plea for the short story as a work of art is hopelessly belated. I am quite aware that the wise and gifted made it long ago, and I remember the preaching of the apostles of the early nineties, but its repetition is none the less useful. 
every item in the welter of short stories with which the innumerable magazines both here and in america flood the reading public is not a masterpiece every item is not perfect work many are exceedingly bad bad in conception style and form there is always the danger of the good being hidden of bad and good being confused together in the public mind and of the term magazine story becoming one of contemptuous and unthinking reproach as was the term yellowback a generation ago accordingly it is well that now and again a word should be said in deprecation of an attitude which a tired and fiction-worn world is liable to adopt and it is well to remind it that in the aforesaid welter there are many beautiful works of art and to beseech it to exercise discrimination the writer of an introduction to the work of a literary comrade labours under certain difficulties he ought not to usurp the functions of the critic into whose hands the volume when published will come and he is anxious for the sake of prudence not to use the language of hyperbole though he has it in his heart to do so but at least i can claim for these short stories of mr leonard merrick that each by its perfection of form and the sincerity of its making takes rank as a work of art in none is there a word too little or a word too much everywhere one sees evidence of the pain through which the soul of the artist has passed on its way to the joy of creation everywhere is seen the firmness of outline which only comes by conviction of truth and the light and shade which is only attained by a man who loves his craft the field covered by mr merrick in this collection is one which he has made peculiarly his own mainly it is the world of the artist the poet the journalist in the years when hopes are high and funds are low when the soul is full and the stomach empty it is neither the bohemia of yesterday's romance nor the bohemia of drunken degradation but the sober clean living struggling bohemia of to-day it is a sedate hard-up world of omnibuses lodgings second-rate tea-shops and restaurants yet he does not belong to the static school who set down the mere greyness of their conditions he is a poet making the violet of a legend blow among the chops and steaks as in the lady of lions to rosie macleod living up ninety-eight stairs of a dingy house in a dilapidated court in montparnasse comes the prince in the fairy tale there is true poetry in the laurels and the lady with its amazing end and yet his method is simple direct romantic he writes of things as they really are but his vision pierces to their significance he can be relentless in his presentation of a poignant situation as in a very good thing for the girl a realist of the realists if you like but here as everywhere in his work are profound pity tenderness and sympathetic knowledge of the human heart he writes not only of things seen but of things felt whatever qualities his work may have it has the great quality essential to all artistic endeavour sincerity william j locke end of section one section two of the man who understood women and other stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Section 2. The Man Who Understood Women our bitterest remorse is not for our sins but for our stupidities excerpt from wendover's new novel nothing had delighted wendover so much when his first book appeared as some reviewer's reference to 
the author's knowledge of women he was then six or seven and twenty and the compliment uplifted him the more because he had long regretted violently that he knew even less of women than do most young men the thought of women fascinated him he yearned to captivate them to pass lightly from one love affair to another to have the right to call himself blasé alas a few dances in the small provincial town that he had left when he was eighteen comprised nearly all his sentimental experiences during his years of struggle in london he had been so abominably hard up that lodging-house keepers and barmaids were almost the only women he addressed and as his beverage was a glass of bitter the barmaids had been strictly commercial to be told that he understood women enraptured him instinct he said to himself now and then a man is born who knows the feminine mind intuitively and in his next book there was an abundance of his fanciful psychology denied companionship with women he revelled in writing about them and drew from the pages in which he posed as their delineator something of the exultation that he would have derived from being their lover there were even pages after which he felt sated with conquest at these times nothing accorded with his mood so well as to parade the park and pretend to himself that the sight of the most attractive of the women bored him but as loneliness really cried within him pathetically he had an adventure culminating in marriage with a shop assistant who glanced at him one evening in oxford street after marriage they found as little of an agreeable nature to say to each other as might have been expected so a couple of years later they separated and the ex-shop hand went to reside with a widowed sister who made up ladies own materials at crouch end gradually he came to be accepted at his own valuation to be pronounced one of the few gifted men from whom the feminine soul held no secrets then when he was close on forty a novel that he produced hit the popular taste and he began to make a very respectable income now for the first time he had opportunities for meeting the class of women that he had been writing about and he found to his consternation that they failed to recognize him as an affinity after all they were very amiable but like the farmer with the claret he never got any forder he perceived that his profundities were thought tedious and that his attentions were thought raw it was a sickening admission for an authority on women to have to make but when he tried to flirt he felt shy at last he decided that all the women whom he knew were too frivolous to appeal to a man of intellect and that their company wearied him unutterably but though he had reached middle age he had never as yet been really in love in the autumn of his forty-second year few people judged him to be so much he removed to paris some months afterwards in the interest of a novel that he had begun he deserted his hotel in the rue d'antine for a pension de famille on the left bank this establishment which was supported chiefly by english and american girls studying art supplied the colour that he needed for his earlier chapters and it was here that he made the acquaintance of miss cyril miss cyril was about six-and-twenty bohemian and ambitious beyond her talents such penchants de famille abound in girls who are more or less bohemian and ambitious beyond their talents but rhoda cyril was noteworthy her face stirred the imagination she had realized that she would never paint and the free and easy intercourse of the latin quarter had wholly unfitted her for the prim provincialism to which she must return in england my father was a parson she told wendover once as they smoked cigarettes together after dinner 
i had hard work to convince him that english art schools weren't the apex but he gave in at last and let me come here it was paradise my home was in beckenhampton do you know it it's one of the dreariest holes in the kingdom i used to go over to stay with him twice a year i was very fond of my father but i can't tell you how terrible those visits became to me how i had to suppress myself and how the drab women and stupid young men used to stare at me as if i were a strange animal or something improper in places like beckenhampton they say paris in the same kind of voice that they say hell i suppose i'm a bohemian by instinct for even now that i know i should never make an artist my horror isn't so much the loss of my hopes as the loss of my freedom my my identity i am never to be natural any more after i leave here i am to go on suppressing myself till the day i die sometimes i shall be able to shut myself up and howl that's all i've got to look forward to what are you going to do asked wendover looking sympathetic and thinking pleasurably that he had found a good character to put into his book i'm going back she said a shining example of the folly of being discontented with district visiting and church bazaars i go back a failure for beckenhampton to moralize over my old schoolmistress has asked me to stay with her while i look round you see i've spent all my money and i must find a situation if the beckenhampton parents don't regard me as too immoral it is just possible she may employ me in the school to teach drawing unless i try to teach it then i suppose i shall be called a revolutionary and be dismissed she contemplated the shabby little salon thoughtfully and lit another cigarette from the boule miche to a boarding school it'll be a change i wonder if it will be safe to smoke there if i keep my bedroom window open wide yes it would be as great a change as was conceivable and rhoda cyril was the most interesting figure in the house to wendover she was going to england in a month's time there was no reason why she should not go at once save that she had enough money to postpone the evil day and during this valedictory month she and he talked of their friendship in the tortuous streets off the boulevard she introduced him to humble restaurants where the dinners were sometimes amazingly good at ridiculously low prices together they made little excursions and pretended to scribble or sketch in the woods looking at each other however most of the time and then at evening there was an inn to be sought and the moon would rise sooner than the friends and in the moonlight when they returned to paris and the penchon de famille sentiment would constrain their tones it was all quite innocent but to the last degree unwise the ex-shop assistant still throve decorously at crouch end on his allowance and wendover should have seen that he was acting unfairly towards miss searle to do him justice he didn't see it he had confided the story of his marriage to her and it did not enter into his thoughts that she might care for him seriously notwithstanding his experiences had given him no cause to esteem himself dangerous and the lover who has never received favours is in practice always modest though in aspirations he may be one ask the suitor of quick perceptions has been made by other women as everybody but the least sophisticated of debutantes knows but if he did not dream that he might trouble the peace of miss searle he was perpetually conscious that miss searle had disturbed his own a month's daily companionship with a temperament plus a fascinating face would be dangerous to any man to wendover it was fatal his thoughts turned no longer to liaisons with duchesses his work itself was secondary to rhoda searle silly fellow as he appears the emotions wakened in him were no less genuine than if he had combined all the noble qualities with which he invested the heroes of his books 
besides most people would appear silly in a description which dealt only with their weaknesses wendover loved and he cursed the tie that prevented his asking the girl to be his wife how happy he might have been he had feared that the last evening would be a melancholy one but it was gay the greater part of it was gay at any rate as soon as the door slammed behind them he saw that she had resolved to keep the thought of the morrow's journey in the background to help him to turn the farewell into a fete her laughing caution was unnecessary her voice her eyes had given him the cue her journey was to be undertaken in the distant future life was delicious and they were out to enjoy themselves he had proposed dining at armenonville it wasn't the paris that she had known but champagne and fashion seemed the right thing to-night and no fiacre had ever before sped so blithely never had the boy been so enchanting and never had another girl been such joyous company after dinner the ambassadors the programme they didn't listen to much of it they were chattering all the time it was only when the lamps died out that he heard a sigh it was only when the lamps died out that the morning train and the parting and the blank beginning of the afterwards seemed to him so horribly near the little salon was half dark when they reached the penchon des familles everybody else had gone to bed wendover turned up the light and though she said it was too late to sit down they stood talking by the mantelpiece you've given me a heavenly memory for the end she told him thanks so much i shall be thinking of it at this time to-morrow so shall i said wendover she took off her hat and pulled her hair right before the mirror shall you will you write to me yes if you'd like me to i'd more than like it i shall look forward to your letters tremendously there won't be much to say in them they'll be from you i wish you weren't going she raised her eyes to him why she asked wendover kept silent a moment it was the hardest thing that he had done in his life if he answered because i love you he felt that he would be a cad besides she must know very well that he loved her what good would it do to tell her so doubtless she had repented her question in the moment of putting it yes he would be a cad to confess to her she would think less of him for it he would choose the bow roll and she would always remember that when he might have spoilt their last scene together and pained her he had been strong heroic we've been such pals he said that she mightn't underrate the heroism he turned aside as the noble fellow in books does when he is struggling after a pause she murmured blankly it's time i said good-night she went to him and gave him her hand her clasp was fervent it was encouraging to feel that she was grateful her gaze held him and her eyes were wide dark troubled he was sure that she was sorry for him good night my dear said wendover still as brave as the fellow in the books and when he had watched her go up the stairs when she had turned again with that look in her eyes and turned away he went back to the salon and was wretched beyond words to tell for a fool may love as deeply as the wisest this was really their good-bye in the morning the claims on her were many and he was not the only one who drove to the station with her when she had been gone between two and three weeks he received the promised letter it told him little but that she was the new drawing mistress of her thoughts her attitude towards her new life it said nothing he replied promptly questioning her but she wrote no more and not the least of his regrets was the thought that she had dismissed him from her mind so easily he did not remain much longer in the boarding-house its associations hurt him too much a sandy-haired girl with no eyelashes and red ears occupied the seat that had been rhoda's at the table and the newcomer's unconcerned possession of it stabbed him at every meal 
having taken precautions against letters for him going astray he returned to the hotel and there month after month he plodded at his book and tried to forget nearly a year had gone by when he stood again on the deck of a channel boat he had not spared himself and the novel was finished and he was satisfied with it but he was as much in love as he had been on the morning when he watched a train steam from the gare st lazare as he paced the deck he thought of rhoda all the time it excited him that he was going to england he might chance to see her he might even run down to beckenhampton for a day or two it would make the situation harder to bear afterwards of course but he looked up beckenhampton in the railway guide often during the next few days the distance between them was marvellously short the knowledge that an hour and a half's journey could yield her face to him again had a touch of the magical in it an hour and a half from hades to olympus the longing fevered him he threw some things into a bag pell-mell one morning and caught the ten fifteen the george hotel and from the hotel he directed the driver to the school the little town was grey and drear he pitied her acutely as he gazed about him from the fly he understood how her spirit must beat itself against the bars he realized what her arrival must have meant to her behind one of the windows of this prison she had sat looking back upon her yesterday how the year must have changed her he wondered if she still smiled the fly jolted into the narrow high street and he saw her coming out of the post office yes she still smiled the smile that irradiated her face and made him forget everything else they stood outside the post office together clasping hands once more you what are you doing here she cried i was just going to see you i've just come from the station how are you you look very well i'm all right are you back for good yes i left paris a few days ago did you stay on at the pension oh no i gave that up soon after you went you've finished your book eh how did you know i saw something about it in a paper and how's paris i dream i'm back sometimes paris is just the same i suppose you never saw anything of the others afterwards kitty owen or the McAllister girl no i never came across any of them i was working very hard well tell me things what's the news you're still at school then no no aren't you i was on my way there what are you doing i'm married the blood sank from his cheeks married i've been married four months a woman came between them to post a letter and he was grateful for the interruption let me congratulate you thanks my husband's a solicitor here you'll come and see us i'm afraid i should have been delighted of course but i have to be in town again this evening we'd better move we're in everybody's way she said will you walk on with me when does the book come out in a few weeks time i'll send a copy to you really it would be very good of you i've often looked at the book columns to see if it was published have you i was afraid you'd forgotten all about me you you might have written again you promised to write i know why didn't you what was the good it would have made me happier i missed you frightfully i i think that was why i left the pension i couldn't stand it when you'd gone well are you happy oh i suppose so i'm glad so you won't come and see us it's impossible i'm sorry to say as a matter of fact i didn't mean to see you again at all that's a pretty compliment ah oh, you know what i mean it seemed better that i shouldn't but i think i'm glad i did i don't know i've wondered sometimes whether you understood we shan't meet any more and i should like you to know don't she exclaimed thickly for heaven's sakes i must 
said wendover i loved you dearly they had walked some yards before she answered her voice was a whisper what's the use of saying that to me now the bitterness of suffering was in the words they flared the truth on him the annihilating truth my god he faltered would it have been any use then her face was colourless she didn't speak rhoda did you care if if i had asked you to stay with me would you have stayed i don't know tell me yes then i would have stayed she said hoarsely whom should i have hurt i was alone i had no one to study but myself i wanted you to ask me stayed i'd have thanked god if you had spoken you were blind you wouldn't see and now when it's too late you come and say it i wanted to be straight to you he groaned i sacrificed my happiness to be straight to you it was damnably hard to do i know but i didn't want sacrifices i wanted love oh it's no good our talking about it she stopped and sighed we shall both get over it i suppose is it too late pleaded wendover brokenly quite things aren't the same last year i was free to do as i liked i have no conventions but i have a conscience there's my husband to consider now and and more too i shouldn't be contented like that to-day i should have injured others you and i let our chance slide and we shall never get it back smile and say something about nothing there are people who know me coming along and he did not sleep at the george after all in the next train that left for euston a grey-faced man sat with wide eyes cursing his own obtuseness and he has not met her since there is of course a brighter side to the history although rhoda is unhappy she is happier than she would have remained with wendover when the guilt was off the gingerbread and though wendover will never forget her he cherishes her memory with more tenderness than he would have continued to cherish the girl but neither she nor he recognizes this and in wendover's latest work one may see the line that has been quoted our bitterest remorse is not for our sins but for our stupidities the reception of the novel was most flattering and as usual the author's insight into the mind of woman has been pronounced remarkable end of section two section three of the man who understood women and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by Peter S. Fay, New York, Peter S. Fay dot deviantart dot com. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Chapter Two A Very Good Thing for the Girl. Bagot told us this tale in the stage door club one night we were sitting round the fire talking of perfect love and somebody asked him if he had ever thought of marrying once said the comedian cheerfully couldn't you afford it his talent and the remains of his good looks were worth fifty pounds a week to him then but there had been days well listen to bagot it wasn't that I couldn't afford it, he said with a laugh. Actors never wait till they can afford it. I escaped in a curious way. What saved me was being such an artist. Fact. I was really smitten. If I hadn't been an artist in spite of myself, 
I should be shivering in the last train home to Bedford Park now, instead of talking to you, dear boys, in an armchair with a glass at my side. What? Oh, I'll tell you about it with pleasure. Of course you know I made my name as the Reverend Simon Tibbets in poor Pulteney's Touch and Go. Some things a man doesn't forget, and I remember how I felt when I settled for the part better than I remember yesterday. You see, it was my first London engagement, and I had been trying to get one in London for sixteen years. Sixteen years I had been on the road, and seen the amateurs with money sauntering onto the West End stage from their varsity club. My agent had told me to try my luck at the office over the theater one morning in July, and when I went in, there was nobody there but a young man who I guessed must be Pulteney. He was sitting at the table with a pencil in his hand, fiddling with a model of one of the scenes, and looking as worried as if he had been Chancellor of the Exchequer. Have I the honor of speaking to Mr. Pulteney? said I. In those days, I imagined authors were important persons. He flushed and smiled, rather on the wrong side of his mouth, I thought. That's my name. I was sent round to see you about the part of the clergyman in your farcical comedy, Mr. Pulteney, I said. I had really been sent to see the stage manager, but soft soap is never wasted, and I was always a bit of a diplomatist. He asked me to sit down, and we talked. He was smoking a cigarette, and I thought for a moment he was going to offer me one. I suppose it occurred to him that it wouldn't be the right thing to ask an actor to smoke in the manager's room, for he threw his own cigarette away. He was a gentleman, poor Pulteney, though he was a deuced bad dramatist. The manager came bustling back soon and began to hum and haw, but Pulteney put in a word that made it all right. I was told it was a capital part and a big chance for me, and I skipped downstairs and out into the street feeling as puffed up as if I owned the Strand. As a matter of fact, the salary wasn't much. I had better money in the provinces, but the thought of making a hit in the West End so excited me that I was nearly popping with pride. Great Cumberland Place! Wasn't I sold when the part came? You've no idea how duffing it really was. I don't mind saying that a good many jolly fine comedians would never have got a laugh in it. When I read the jokes, I could have cried. It wasn't as funny as the author wrote it, dear boys, believe me. I don't want to brag of what I've done. I'm not the man to gas about myself, but it was the character I put into it that made Pulteney's peace. Well, the rehearsals weren't beginning for three weeks, and I kept hoping I'd see how to do something with it before the first call. I spoke the lines one way, and I spoke the lines another way, and the more I studied, the glummer I felt. I had my dinner at Exeter Hall several times and listened to the people giving their orders. It was cheap, and I thought I might hear the sort of tone I was trying to get hold of, but I didn't. On the Sunday, I went to three churches and sat through three sermons. Honest Injun! And that was no use. Talk about an RA's difficulty in finding the right model. I spent eight dusty days scouring London for a model for the Reverend Simon Tibbets. Then one afternoon, I had come out of Prosser's Avenue. As it happened, I wasn't thinking shop. I wasn't thinking about anything in particular. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice. A voice? I heard THE voice. I heard the voice I needed for the part. I jumped. My heart was in my throat. 
There, smiling up at a six-foot constable, was a little parson asking the way to Baker Street. He looked like an elderly cherub with his pink cheeks and his innocent, inquiring eyes. I held my breath in the hope he would go on talking, but the policeman had answered him, and he tripped along with merely a thank you. He tripped along with the oddest walk I have ever seen, and I dodged after him, never taking my gaze off his legs and studying them all the way to Charing Cross. As I expected, he was going by bus. There was one just moving. Up went his umbrella, and the next moment I was on the step too, intending to lure him into conversation as soon as I could, and master his voice as nicely as I was mastering his legs. Full inside, said the conductor, putting his dirty hand before my face. I was so annoyed I could have punched his head. Well, there was nothing for it but to go on top and wait for someone to get out. Hang it, nobody did get out, and I saw no more of my little model till we reached Baker Street. I meant to let him walk a few yards, and then ask him to direct me to Lord's, but there was a surprise for me. He tripped across the road into the station. Oh ho, I said to myself, training it? So much the better. We're going to have a comfortable chat together, after all, you and I. I kept as close to him when he took his ticket as if I'd designs on his watch, and I heard him say, Third class to Rickmansworth, if you please. This was rather awkward. I didn't want to pay a long fare, and I didn't know the line well. I had to book as far as Rickmansworth, too. When we got round to the platform, the train was there, and he hovered up and down for five minutes or more, looking for a seat to suit him. I began to think we'd both be left behind. Then, just as they were slamming the doors, he made up his mind. In he went, and I after him. And, what do you think? We were both on the same side of the compartment with a fat woman and a soldier between us. Two passengers between us, I give you my word, and no room opposite. Not only I couldn't talk to him, I couldn't even see him. Every time we drew into a station, I prayed the compartment would thin a bit. I sat tense, watching the faces. Not a sign on them. You've heard of the American rustic who got so exasperating standing up in a crowded car that at last he shouted, Say, ain't none of your people got homes? That's how I felt. Bagot's imitation of the rustic was very good, and we signified our appreciation in the usual way. When the laugh was over, someone told the waiter we were thirsty, and the storyteller filled his pipe. Well, he resumed, puffing, to cut a long journey short, we reached Rickmansworth without my having had a glimpse of my gentleman. I was about desperate now. He hadn't taken a dozen steps when I overtook him and asked if he would be kind enough to inform me whether any decent apartments were to be had in the village. It didn't seem worthwhile to have had all this bother just to hear him speak again for ten seconds, and I was wishing myself back in my apartments in Kennington. I said the first thing that came into my head. It turned out to be the best question I could have put. I am a visitor myself, he said beaming at me, but I believe there are rooms to be had in Cornstalk Terrace. Yes, I am almost positive I noticed a card in the window as I passed through the street this morning. I stood simply lapping his voice up. Is it difficult for a stranger to find? I asked. No, indeed, he said. It is quite near. But I am going there if you care to accompany me. Oh, you're too good, I exclaimed, and upon my word, I could have hugged him. 
The road was a great deal nearer than I wanted it to be, for he was chirruping to me beautifully, and I hated to part from him. When we arrived, I effervesced with gratitude, and he hoped I'd find comfortable quarters, and then I'd went straight back to the station, and heard that I had just missed a train. Pleasant? Rickmansworth isn't the sprightliest place I've ever waited in either. I had some nourishment in the bar of the hotel across the way, and I examined the high street. It wasn't extensive. The barmaid had told me there was a park close by, so I started to discover it. I wasn't keen on the park, you understand, but I thought it would be a nice quiet spot to rehearse in and see if I had caught the little clerk's voice. As I was going along past a row of villas, blessed if I didn't come across him again, standing at his gate. He supposed I had been hunting for lodgings all the time, so, of course, I had to keep the game up. He was a friendly old chap, and, honor bright, I felt sorry to think I was going to turn him into ridicule on the stage. Still, he would never know, and actors can't be choosers. He went inside to ask his landlady if she could recommend any diggings to me, and a minute afterwards, out he fluttered to say he had quite forgotten there would be a couple of rooms vacant in that very house next day. Christopher Columbus! I had had no more idea of taking rooms than I had of taking the Theatre Royal, Drury Lane. But it was too gigantic a chance to miss. I fixed the matter with the old woman there and then, and the next morning my model and I were living under the same roof. Pass the matches, one of you fellows, my pipe's out. At the back of the house there were some lettuces and a clothes prop that were called a garden. My parlor was at the back too, and after dinner I saw the rector airing himself. By now I had learnt he was a rector. I lost no time in joining him, you may be sure. I wasn't paying two rents to go to sleep on the sofa, and we discussed politics and public libraries. It was a bit heavy for me, but I didn't worry much what he talked about, so long as I could hear his dulcet tones. I ought to have said there was a bench against the clothes prop, so far as her means permitted the old woman did things handsomely. There was a bench, and we sat down on it, and while we were sitting there the door opened, and out into the sunshine there came a young and beautiful girl. She wore a white cotton frock, and there was no paint or powder on her face, and she had the kind of eyes that made you want to say your prayers and be good. I'm not going to gush, I'm holding myself in, but on my honor, she was just the saintliest picture of English maidenhood ever seen in a poet's dream. My daughter, said my model. I was so staggered that I bowed like a super at a bob a night. Yes, the old woman did things handsomely. There was room for three on the bench. She sat by me, turning a backyard into a paradise. I meant the girl, not the old woman, and I forgot to study her father for a half an hour. I heard where his living was and why they were taking a holiday, and I stammered that I was an actor and was afraid they'd be shocked. I was stupid to own it, though it was all right, and they didn't mind. But there was something in that girl's eyes that forced the truth from you in spite of yourself. I had been going to say I was in the city, but the lie stuck. There is some fine country round Rickmansworth, Ricky as the natives call it, and we used to explore the three of us. We'd go to Chorley Wood and to Chenny's. What a good back cloth Chenny's would make. By the end of the week, we were together nearly all the day. They invited me into their room to supper, and after supper, Marion would sing at a decrepit piano. The meals were quite plain, you know. Sometimes we'd pick the green stuff in the garden ourselves, but boys, 
the peace of that little village room in the lamplight, the minister and his child, the simple God-fearing man, and that girl with her deep grave eyes and earnest voice, their devotion to each other, the homeliness of it all. To me, a touring player, it was sweet, it was wonderful, to be welcomed in an atmosphere of home. If the comedy had been put into rehearsal on the date arranged, it would have been better for me, but it wasn't. The rehearsals were postponed, and soon I was thinking much more of Marion than of my part. I used to talk to her of, well, things I had never talked of to anyone except my mother when I was a kid. Somehow, I didn't feel ashamed to talk of them to that girl. She took me out of myself. She raised me up. The footlights were forgotten. Oh, I had no right to think of her in the way I did, of course. What could I hope for? There was a world between us, and I saw it. I told myself that I had done all I came to do, and that I ought to go back to town at once. I told myself I was mad to stay there. But I knew I loved her. I loved her as I have never loved a woman since. And there were moments when I thought that she was fond of me. Bago, it was rapidly becoming evident to us, had forgotten that he had prefaced the story by congratulating himself on not having married the girl. His voice trembled. We saw that, carried away by his own intensity as a narrator, he was beginning to believe he was a blighted being. But we looked sympathetic and let him work it up. One day she owned she cared for me, he continued with a faraway air. It was the day before they were going home, and we were talking of our friendship. Somehow I, I lost my head, and she was crying in my arms. I asked her to marry me. I swore she would never repent it. She sat listening to me with her hands limp in her lap, and a look on her face that I shall see till I die. She was afraid, not of me, but that her father wouldn't consent. They had no violent prejudice against the theater, but she had never been to one in her life. For her to marry an actor seemed an impossible thing. I went to him right off. I told him I worshipped her. I implored him to trust her to me. It was an awful shock to him. I don't believe he had a suspicion of the state of affairs. He reproached himself for letting it come about. But he was very gentle. He said he had hoped for a far different future for her. Still, that all he wanted was for his child to be happy. He said he couldn't stand in her way if he knew she was really sure of herself. In the end, he promised she should marry me if she wanted to in three years' time. When I parted from her, we considered we were engaged, and in the event after they left, I went to town. I went to town, and there was a call for the first rehearsal of Touch and Go. I had forgotten business. I had forgotten everything but Marion. That call paralyzed me. I saw what I had done. I would realized the situation. The girl I was to marry reverenced her father, and I meant to burlesque him on the stage. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't. How could I think of it now? It wasn't that I feared their finding it out, as I tell you, they weren't playgoers, and their home was a good way off. Besides, it was the heartlessness of the thing that frightened me. To make myself up as her father? To speak the bland, hypocritical lines of the part in her father's voice? To mimic him? To turn him into ridicule to amuse a crowd? I say, how could I do it? All the same, it was precious difficult to avoid, for I had studied him so long. But I went to the show box for the first day and rehearsed as I had expected to rehearse before I met him. Perhaps not so well. It was a strain not to be like him after all my study, and it made me pretty rotten. I rehearsed so the first day, and for three or four days, 
and presently I began to notice that the management was a bit unhappy, and that Pulteney nearly twisted his mustache out during my scenes. If an author has written a bad part, trust him to blame the actor. He buttonholed me at last and begged me to put a little more character into it, and I tried to, but I knew it was a failure, for I could only see one character all the time, and that one I wouldn't touch. When I was in the stalls once, he and the manager sat down and put their heads together. It was dark in front, and they hadn't seen me as they came around. I heard them say something about a pity they hadn't a West End actor for the part. I knew they were talking of my part, and it got my dander up. I knew I could act any of that West End hoity-toity company off the stage. I knew I had only to let myself go. When I went on again, I determined I'd show them what I could do. I determined I'd show them that they had a better comedian than any 40 pound a weaker. I sent them into fits. Hello, they said. The women in the wings stopped talking about their dresses to watch me. The highly connected amateurs from Oxford and Cambridge began to give at the knees, and I could hear the leading man's heart drop to the boards. The actor from the provinces was wiping them out. That rehearsal was the sweetest triumph of my life. She'd never know. She'd never know, I kept telling myself. She couldn't hear of it. By the time the wig that I ordered was tried on, I felt as sure of success as I was of my lines. I was soaked in the part. I wasn't acting the little rector. By George, I was the little rector. Trip, face, and chirrup. And the first night came and I was to play in London at last. They told me the house was crammed. All the swell critics were there, all the fashionable first-nighters. I was so nervous that the wig paste shook in my hands when I made up, but I was ready much too soon. I went downstairs and waited. The doorkeeper gave me a note. Of all the... It was from Marion. A friend had brought her up to see me, and she was in the theater. I was stunned. I thought I was going to fall. You know, every man in this room knows that for an actor to remodel his performance at the last minute would be a miracle. I couldn't do it. It wasn't in my power. But even then I thought I'd try. I said I must try, though it would ruin me. And I heard my cue. My first lines went for nothing. I floundered. The audience were ice. I saw the people on the stage looking at me aghast. Then suddenly I got a laugh, a gesture, an invitation. Something I had been trying to hold back had escaped me. The laugh went to my head. I made them laugh again. I said I'd explain to Marion that she'd understand that she'd forgive me, and even while I said it, my other self, the self that wasn't acting, knew it was a lie, and I was losing her. I couldn't help it. The laughter made me drunk. I did it all. I knew the disgust she must be feeling. But the audience were roaring at me now. I felt the shame that she was suffering with my own heart. But the artist in me swept on. The manager panted at me in the wings. You're great! You're immense! Gad, you're making the hit of the piece! The stalls were in convulsions. The gallery had got my name. Bago! They were shouting after each act. Bago! Pulteney rushed to me with blessings at the end. The house thundered for me. It was London. I knew that I was made. But across the flare of grinning faces, I seemed to see the angel I had lost and the horror in her eyes. Bago bowed his head. His pipe had fallen. Tears dripped down his cheeks. By the time he was quite sure, he had been mourning for her ever since beside a lonely hearth. She wrote to me next day, breaking it off, he groaned. She wouldn't listen to reason. She said it might be art, but it wasn't love. Did you ever see her afterwards? we asked. Once, he said, years later. 
She married some county chap with an estate and all that. I saw her driving with her little boy. She looked very happy, I thought. Women soon forget. After a pause, he added bitterly. If one of you fellows, he glanced at the only author in the group, cares to write the true tragedy of a man's life, there it is. You might call it the price of success. But we all thought a more appropriate title would be the one that I have used. End of section three. Recording by Peter S. Fay, New York, Peter S. Fay dot deviant art dot com. Section four of the man who understood women and other stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Elaine, Pasadena, California. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Woman Who Wished to Die. My meeting with Mr. Peters was so momentous that I can't resist mentioning it was due to someone I had never seen, to a trifle. I can't resist referring to my own affairs for a moment. I was supposed to be at work on a novel, and I had a mind as fertile as mashed potato. One day in August I tumbled a receipt out of a desk and saw that the lady to whom I had sent my stories to be typewritten had had nothing from me to typewrite for two months. The discovery dismayed me. I was ashamed to realize how slowly I was getting on, and resolved to try a change of surroundings. My trip altered the course of lives, and I shouldn't have made it but for the reproach of a stranger's receipt. I decided upon Ostend by way of Antwerp, where I wanted to see the pictures. Also I meant to visit Brussels, where I wanted to see my prettiest cousin. And in Antwerp, behold, Mr. Peters! As I was wandering through the gallery, an American asked me if I could tell him in which of the rooms he could find the last communion of St. Francis of Assisi. Having just been directed to it myself, just been startled by the faultless fluency of an official's English, I had the information pat, and the American and I proceeded to the room together. I remember feeling it incumbent on me to be pained by the first words he spoke in front of the picture. I am told, he remarked, that Rubens sold this work for sixty pounds, English money, and that forty thousand pounds were subsequently paid for it. <laughs> Rough on Rubens! I affected the tone of the superior person. You would see it better if you stood further away, I said. What do you think of the painting? Oh, the painting, he answered. I am no judge, but the way the value of that property has risen just astonishes me. I did not think I should like him but I began to like him surprisingly soon. He was a sad-faced middle-aged man with a simple manner that was wonderfully winning. In less than five minutes I was humiliated that I have sneered at him in front of St. Francis of Assisi. By what right, how much did I understand of it myself? My attitude had been nine-tenths pose. This man was genuine. He spoke of what he found interesting, and he proved anything but a fool. We went down the steps of the Musée des Beaux side by side, and strolled through the hot streets, among the swarm of ragged Flemish children. <laughs> there are more ragged children to the square yard in Antwerp than in Westburn Park, to the quarter of the hotels. It turned out that we were staying at the same one, he on the first floor and I on the fifth, and after dinner we drifted together to the place Vert and talked there under the trees while the band played. He told me that he had not been to Europe before, and I discerned that he was a lonely man persevering with the effort to enjoy himself. The fact is, he said, handing me his cigar case, I ought to have made the trip some years ago. Won't you try a cigar, sir? There's nothing the matter with Europe, but I guess I'm not quite so keen on sightseeing as I was. When I was a lad I was dead struck on coming over, but I hadn't the dollars then. I promised myself to have a good time when I was thirty, and I hustled. When I was thirty, I had made a few dollars, but I saw no chance of the good time. I was still hustling. One afternoon it occurred to me that I was forty. It displeased me some. 
It seemed to me that good time was never coming. At the start, I had aimed to be the boss of a business, but now the business had got so big, it was bossing me. Well, I said, you have made your pile and you have nobody to spend it on but yourself. Next year you shall quit and have that good time you have been working for so long. But it didn't come off. The business went on swelling and I went on saying, next year. And before I knew where I was, I was fifty. And his voice dropped a little. And I have never had the good time yet. He was leaving for Austin the next morning, and when we parted, I was sorry he wasn't to remain in Antwerp till the end of the week, like myself. However, at Austin I expected we should meet again, for I did not mean to stay long in Brussels. It is a beautiful city, and many of us would admire it much more if it did not set us yearning for Paris. The resemblance is striking, but the fascination is absent. To go to Brussels is like calling on the sister of the woman one is in love with. Brussels is Paris provincialized. One realizes it before one has sat outside a cafe for an hour and watched the types go by. Literally, it is provincialized in August, when most of the theaters are closed and the streets are peopled by excursionists. I had intended to stay three or four days at most, but duty to my relatives kept me with them for ten or twelve, and at last when I did reach Austin, I had almost forgotten Mr. Peters. The thought of him recurred to me as I made my way towards the Casal on the first evening, and I wondered if he was still here. It was eight o'clock, and now that the glare of sun upon the blistered de Gay had faded, and the radiance of electricity had risen in its stead, the town was looking its best. Ostend was still dining. The long, continuous line of hotel windows fronting the sea was brilliant. Window after window, wide, curtainless, and open to the view. A frontage of gleaming tables and coloured candle shades, a dazzling frontage of flowers and faces and women's jewelled necks and arms. In the Casal, the orchestra was playing L'Amico Fritz. I had listened to the music for perhaps half an hour when I saw Mr. Peters. He was with a friend and he passed without observing me. They sat down a short distance off and I noticed that he was talking with much animation to her, with much more animation than he had shown with me. Indeed, I think that was what I noticed first of all, the unexpected animation of Mr. Peters. But the next instant I was engrossed by his companion. She was not youthful. I didn't consider her pretty. Her dress, rich as it was, appeared to me a doughty sort of thing among the elaborate toilettes around us. Then what engrossed me? Well, it was the expression that she wore. I am trying to find the word. Pleasure, of course. But that says nothing. As nearly as I can explain, it was the wonder in her look. The wonder, that is it. There were crow's feet about her eyes, and her gaze shone with a young girl's wonder. Eventually the interest in the conversation was mutual, and I assumed that they had known each other in the States. Then a second time they passed me, and I heard her speak, and she had no trace of the American accent. It began to seem to me that Mr. Peters had been losing no time at Austin. I saw him with her again on the morrow, and on the next day, but two or three days went by before I saw him alone. When we did have a chat, I couldn't withstand the temptation to allude to her. "'You're in better spirits,' I said. "'Have you come across anyone from the other side to cheer you up?' A suspicion of a smile flickered across his thin, shrewd lips. "'No,' he drawled. "'No.' I have met no acquaintances in Europe yet, but he handed his cigar case to me. Won't you try a cigar, sir? But I am getting along. I used to wish he would present me to her, but he never did. Constantly those two figures sat together in the Cursal, in the concert room or on the terrace. If I found the little woman, I found Mr. Peters. Never to my knowledge did she speak to anybody else and always the girlishness of her gaze held and mystified me, always, that is to say, until the end was approaching. Of course, I didn't know that it threatened the end then, but I couldn't fail to perceive the difference. The curiosity she had inspired in me was so strong. I had watched her so intently for nearly a fortnight. Oh, it may sound vulgar. I don't defend myself. That was the first time I glanced across her face and saw trouble there. I was sensible of a distinct shock and in the next few days I said it was heavy trouble. 
It was as if the blaze within her were dwindling, as if it were dying out and leaving her cold and grey. I said, it is a great word, but once I said the look on her face was terror. I did not attach any importance to the fact that Mr. Peters was sitting alone on the terrace when I went to the Casal one evening, because I supposed that he was waiting there for her to come in. It was when I found him alone in the same place much later that I was surprised. You know how you understand sometimes, without a gesture, that a man wants you to sit down by him, but doesn't want you to speak. I knew that Mr. Peters wanted me to sit down by him, and didn't want me to speak. I think we must have sat looking at the track of moonlight on the sea for a quarter of an hour before either of us said a word. Then he remarked dryly, My friend is gone. You must miss her, I responded. He mused again, and added his cigar case to me with his usual question. I said I would have a cigarette. You have found me dumbfounded, he resumed, puffing his cigar deliberately, by the most singular occurrence I have heard of in my life. I am beginning to get my breath back. You may have noticed the lady. I said that I had. I guess that you assume her to be a wealthy woman? I said that I did. Well, sir, she is about as poor as they make them. I have lived too long to be extravagant with emotions, but that little lady's history has just broken me up. As a writer, you may find it worth your attention. It was because she had always been solitary. That was what started the trouble, her loneliness. It's an awful thing to conjecture how many poor little women in London are breaking their hearts with loneliness. Never a companion she had, never a pleasure. Morning she walked to her employment, evening she worked back to where she lodged. She was a girl of eighteen then, and she walked cheerfully. And she was cheerful when she was twenty, and twenty-five, and thirty, always keeping her pluck up with the thought of something brighter ahead. You know, always hoping, like me, for that good time. Go on, I said. When she had been clerking years and doing homework in her leisure, she had put a small sum by. But she was frightened to touch it. There was the growing fear of the lonely woman that one day she might take sick and need that money. And the good time didn't come. And her youth went out of her, and lines began to creep about her eyes and mouth. She looked in the glass and saw them. And she didn't walk to and from quite so bravely now. Twenty years odd she had had of drudgery, and the hopefulness was dying in her. She was just faint with longing, sir. She wanted to put on pretty things before she was old. She was starving for a taste of the sweets that she was meant for. He blew a circlet of smoke into the air and watched it. That stage passed. It seemed to the woman, as time dragged on, that she hadn't the energy left to long for anything. She was tired. When she lay down to sleep, she wasn't particularly keen on waking up any more. As I see the matter, it was by no means the work that had done the damage. It was the dullness. It was the emptiness of her life, the forlornness of it. By and by, she had to go to a doctor, and he talked about depression and melancholia. He said what she ought to do was live with friends. She was about as friendless as Robinson Crusoe before Friday turned up. He recommended her to seek gay society. She said she was much obliged, and went back to her lodging, and sat staring from the window at the strangers passing in the twilight. I don't know whether you have struck a case of melancholia. A man I was fond of was taken that way in Buffalo. Out of business he would sit brooding by the hour, with his eyes wide, and never saying a word. I stayed talking to him once half the night, persuading him to put a change of linen in his grip and start for Europe in the morning. I told him it would do him good to hustle round the stores, buying most things he needed to put on after he arrived. I guess my arguments weren't so excellent as my intentions. When I went downtown after breakfast, I heard he had shot himself. Melancholy is likely to be serious. No, the doctor's advice wasn't much use to the little woman. Her walk to the office lay across some bridge. One evening, as she was crossing it, the thought came that it would be sweet if she were lying in the river and heard the water singing in her ears. Then she tore herself away because she had turned giddy. Every morning and evening she had to cross that bridge, you understand me. Every morning and evening that thought pulled at her, and she stopped by the parapet and looked down. In the pause he made, the music from the concert room was painfully distinct. 
They were playing Invitation to the Boss. Well, just as with the friend I lost in Buffalo, he went on quietly. While she did her work like a machine all day, she was proposing to die. She had grown so woeful tired that it was a relief to her to think of dying. You will smile at what I'm going to say. One afternoon she saw an ordinary picture advertisement stuck on a wall, a picture of a continental resort with fashionable ladies parading on the digay. She told me that, with the thought of death great in her mind, she stood right there in the London street, looking at it. And, sir, her regret was that she was going out of the world without once having worn a pretty frock or bought a handful of roses in December. You may laugh at the idea of a commonplace poster influencing a woman at such a time. I'm not laughing, I said. She harped on that grievance of hers till some of the interest of her girlhood stirred in her again. The enthusiasm had gone, but she was wistful, and she'd sit thinking. She'd sit looking at her savings book, all she had to show for her life. She figured out that she might break away from her employment and have luxury for a month. When the month was up, she'd be destitute. That didn't matter, because, you see, she was quite prepared to go to sleep in the Thames. That little drudge and that stuffy little lodging took a notion to escape for once into the sunshine. She asked herself why she shouldn't live for a month before she died. She was timid when she went to buy the showy frocks. She touched the daintiest of them lovingly, but she was too shy to choose them for herself. She had felt that she had entered the store too late to wear the thing she had hankered for so long. She came here the day after I arrived. She appeared a sad little body, sitting next to me at table. Perhaps that was why I took to her so. But now it just amazes me to think of the way she livened up when we had grown friends. I have heard her laugh, sir. I have heard her laugh quite happily, though her cash was melting like an ice cream in an oven, though she had come to tremble each time she changed a gold piece, though she had come to shudder at each sunset that brought her nearer to the end. It was only this afternoon that she told me the circumstances. I had seen she had anxiety, and I asked questions. I looked to meet her again this evening, but I got a letter instead to say I should never meet her any more. When they handed me her letter, she had gone. You don't mean she's... She's dead, I whispered. Not yet, he said. She wrote that our friendship had helped her some. She wrote that she was going back to her old lodging and would struggle on. But she resigned her position, and she has changed her last banknote. How long do you surmise that she will have the heart to struggle? He lit another cigar, and among the jeweled exotic crowd, we stared absently over the rail at the humble flock of weary trippers who lacked the shillings to come in. One may do worse than cross to Ostend merely to stand by that slender rail and watch the two worlds that it divides. At last I said, She must have liked you very much. Her feelings for you made her want to live. And then, to remain here with you, she squandered the money that she needed to keep her alive. It makes me feel good to hear you say so, he returned. It is not encouraging that she has disappeared, knowing that she had never mentioned even the quarter where she lodged. But it would be the proudest moment of my life if that little lady would consent to marry me. When we get up, we shall say goodbye. I am starting for London right away. Without a clue to her address? Yes, sir, without a notion. I don't know where she lodged, and I don't know where she worked, and London's a mighty big city. But I estimate there are about two sovereigns between that woman and the river, and I have to find her before they're gone. In his glance I saw the grit that had built his fortune. I tried to be hopeful. If she's hunting for a situation, she'll look at the newspapers, I said. She will look at the columns that interest her, he answered, but I mayn't advertise on every page. You can pay for inquiries. You may bet I'll pay. All that worries me is that inquiries go slow. I suppose you don't know which bridge it is. She crosses every day. We can build no hopes on the bridge, he replied. I did not interrogate her. I did not suspect it was to be our last meeting. She may struggle longer than you think. She may be brave. You mean it kindly, he said. But you have heard her history. I opine that I've got to discover that address within a week. I am racing against time. 
There's just this in my favor. She has a name to be noticed. She's called Joanna Fayed, and I guess there can't be many women called that, even in a city the size of London. What an extraordinary thing, I faltered. I can give you Joanna Fayed's address on half a hundred receipts. Why, she must be the lady who typewrites my stories for me! End of section four. Recording by Carol Elaine, Pasadena, California. This has been a LibriVox recording. Section five of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. K. Edison, New Jersey. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Frankenstein II. I was at the Throne Theatre to see Orlando Lightfoot's comedy. Entering the buffet, in the first interval, I met Orlando Lightfoot. Hello, old man, I said. Congratulations on large quantities. Thanks, said the new dramatist. Have you seen it before? No, but I saw in the papers that it was an emphatic success. How beautiful Elsie Millar is in the part. We induced one of the personages behind the bar to notice that we were present and removed our glasses to a table. Orlando sighed heavily. What's the trouble? I inquired. My emphatic success, he said. But it's too long a tale to tell you, Nov. I suppose you want to see the second act? The vindictiveness with which he pronounced the last two words was startling. I stared at him. My dear Orlando, I began, but he cut me short. Call me Frankenstein, he groaned. Like Frankenstein, I've constructed a monster that's destroying me. Before I created this accursed comedy, I was a happy man. It must have been a very long while before, I said. When I had the misfortune to share your rooms, you used to remark casually at breakfast that you wished you were dead. Anyone is liable to express dissatisfaction in moments, but on the whole I was cheerful and buoyant, especially when you were out, he insisted. I frequently had as much as five pounds at the time. I'm not boasting. You know it's true. Five pounds at the time is prosperity, if a fellow hasn't got a monster to support. Since I wrote the comedy, a five-pound note has been as ephemeral as a postage stamp. I pinched and pawned to start the monster in life. What it cost me in typewriting alone would have kept me for a month. It has gorged gold. It has devoured my all. And now, by a culminating stroke of diabolical malice, it's breaking my heart. There's nearly a quarter of an hour before the act, I said. Give me a cigarette and a story. I want one badly. An appreciative editor is eager to send a check. Halves? asked the author of the emphatic success. Halves, I agreed. Well, said Orlando, the devil tempted me in the pit of the Wardwell one night. Elsie Millar was in the cast. She had very little to do, but as usual she did it exquisitely. I had always admired her, wished I knew her, and that night I thought, by Jove, wouldn't I like to write a big part for her? Wouldn't she make a hit if she only got the chance? I came out after the performance, imagining her in the sort of part she's playing in the monster. The plot was beginning to put its head round the corner, and I wandered out of the strand onto the embankment, trying to get hold of it. The embankment was deserted, and the river... Yes, I said, cut that kind of thing. I can put it in when I do the writing. I don't want to miss any of the second act. Well... I went to bed about three o'clock with a plot that enraptured me. When I woke up and saw it in the daylight, it didn't look quite so fetching, as is the way of plots, etc. Still, it had good features, if it wasn't a Venus, and I curled its hair and titivated it generally till it was fascinating again. The dialogue was the most interesting work, especially the love scene. I enjoyed that. It was like making love to a nice girl myself and saying the right things at the time instead of thinking of them afterwards. I ought to have been turning out stuff for the papers, but I let them slide, and at last the play was finished. It sounds as rapid as filling your pipe, told like this. When you do the story, you should stress the alternate ups and downs of the business, the nights when I wrote epigrams and felt like Pinero, 
and the mornings when I read them and felt like cutting my throat. Don't forget that. It's real. I'll remember, I said. I'll have a paragraph on it. Well, I had two copies of the thing, typewritten at Miss Beck's in Rupert Street, and pretty they were, tied up with pink bows, till I put in all the improvements I had thought of after I posted to her. The improvements I had thought of after I posted to her made such a mess of the copies that I had to have two more typewritten. However, I couldn't pretend she was dear, and I paid and looked pleasant. Guilelessly, I imagined my expenses were over. Sonny, they were just beginning. Miss Beck's bill was only the preface. A man who knew the ropes told me I should be a fool to have the script hawked about before it had been copyrighted. How do you do it? I said. Oh, he said, it's very easy. You give a private performance of the piece in a building licensed for public entertainments. There are a few details to be observed. When I grasped the details, I knew I had committed a reckless extravagance in writing a play. I examined my belongings and doubted if they would run to luxuries like this. Still, I had constructed the monster, and it had its claims. I did my duty by it. I hired a hall in Walton's store for an afternoon. I invented two columns of fashions for men to pay for the hall in Walton's store. Whipping a tired brain, I invented them, and then they fetched eighteen pence short of the rent. I posted one of the nice clean copies of the monster to the Lord Chamberlain to read. I didn't want him to read it, especially since I had learned the compliment was to cost me guineas, but that was one of the details to be observed. I had to pawn my watch for the Lord Chamberlain, and he didn't even send the nice clean copy back. He buried it in archives. More typewriting expenses. After that, I had to have the parts typewritten. My dress clothes paid for the parts. Then I had to advertise for artists to read them. I got my artists cheap, a half crown a head, but my watch chain went after my watch, and the monster began to attack my library. Any more details? I asked. One or two, said the man. You must have a couple of playbills printed, and don't forget to register your title. Well, I won't bell on the drinks, but by the time I was through with the Waltham Store Hall and Stationer's Hall, the monster had left nothing in my wardrobe except a Macintosh, and had consumed a complete set of Thackeray bound in calf. Orlando groaned again, and I murmured sympathy. I also reminded him that the second act must be drawing near. All right, he said testily. Listen. The monster was now my legal property. It was about the only property I did have now. But anyhow, the monster was mine. I was informed that an official license for it would reach me in due course. It might be my next move. An average intellect might have been shattered by the sacrifices I had made for the beast. I was still brilliant. Did I send the thing to a theatre uninvited and wait six months to see it expelled? Not Orlando. I realized that I was an outsider. I realized that I needed someone to take me in. Elsie Millar was playing at the St. James then. She had never heard of me, but I wrote to her. I said I had written a comedy with her in my mind, and that I'd like her to read it before I offered it to a management. What for? What for? Because I thought she might be so enamored of a part that she'd move mountains to get the piece produced. My prolix friend, I said, I perfectly understand your inward reason. But what was the reason you gave to the lady? Oh, said Orlando, I borrowed from a letter that I once knew an actress receive from a full-blown dramatist. I wrote that I was, quote, desirous of hearing whether she would care to play the part if an opportunity arose, end quote. Suggestive? For an amateur who had never been through a stage door, it was consummate impudence, I admitted. And she replied? She replied that she would be pleased to read the piece if I sent it to her private address. It departed to her, registered the same day, and I wish you wouldn't keep interrupting me. Well, a fortnight went by, a fortnight of suspense that I can't describe to you. I don't want you to describe it, I exclaimed. For heaven's sake, remember that the act will be starting directly. I'll describe your feelings when I write the story. If you don't write it better than you listen to it, there's a poor show of a check. He complained. I say a fortnight went by. Then she wrote that she had read my comedy and was delighted with it. Look here, if you don't undertake not to speak another word till I've finished, I shan't tell you any more. Is it understood? I nodded. 
and for a spell Orlando had it all his own way. She wrote that she was delighted with it, and asked me to call on her one day about half-past four. I could hardly believe my eyes. Really, it looked as if the monster's rancor had worn itself out. I felt tender towards the beast again, my affection revived. I said that it was like a monster in a fairy tale, transformed to a benevolent presence by the heroine. I thought that a pretty idea. I hoped I should get a chance to mention it to Miss Millar when I went. Of course, I meant to go the next afternoon, weather permitting, and I was so eager to see what sort of weather it was in the morning that I trembled when I pulled up the blind. Thank heaven it was raining. I breakfasted gratefully, and my only fear was that the sun might come out later on. Fortunately, it didn't. The drizzle continued, and all was well. By your idiotic expression, it's evident you've forgotten that the only decent garment remaining to me was a Macintosh. My suit was socially impossible. If it had been a fine day, I couldn't have gone. She lives with her mother in a top flat in Chelsea. When I was shown in, she was alone. Her voice was just as sweet as it was on the stage. She isn't a bit like any other actress I've met. She talks rather slowly, and she's very quiet. Even when she is enthused about the piece, she spoke quietly. I think it's beautiful, she said. I'm glad I asked you to let me read it. I nearly didn't, because... Because you didn't know my name? I said. Well, yes, she said. So many people write to one, and their pieces are generally so impossible. Is this your first, Mr. Lightfoot? My first? And it has threatened to be my last, I said. I've been copywriting it, and the complications have nearly ruined me. I had begun to feel myself another Frankenstein with a monster, and then you turned the monster into a prince of light, like beauty in the fairy tale. It didn't go so well as I had expected, but she smiled a little. You'll let me give you some tea, she said. Won't you take off your Macintosh? No, thanks, I said. It isn't very wet. Then we had tea and cake, and got a bit forrader. She said she wished she had a theatre to produce the thing. And I said I wished I had an agent to place it for me. She asked me if I'd like her to show it to Alexander, and I said the English language would be inadequate to express the gratitude I'd feel. Of course, I added, she mustn't do all that for nothing. And she said she'd find it reward enough to play the part. I said pickles, then, quite naturally, because she was an exceedingly nice girl, and I liked her. I told her she should have any share of the fees she chose to ask for. Oh, nonsense, she said. No, it isn't nonsense, I said. It's only fair. Oh, well then, she said, if I get the piece done for you anyway, you shall give me the usual agent's commission. Does that satisfy you? We were talking quite chummily by this time, and I had another cup of tea. Before I went, her mother came in. Her mother didn't treat the commission so airily. Her mother wanted the girl to have a contract. But that was all right. I put it on paper for her when I got home. There was nothing for me to see her about again for two or three months. I had heard from her that Alexander had no use for the piece, and that Sir Charles Wenham had promised to read it on Sunday. Then she wrote that she was going on tour, and I called to say good-bye to her. There wasn't a cloud in the heavens, and I was still dependent on the Macintosh, but it couldn't be helped. I stayed longer that time. I could have stayed to supper if it hadn't been for the Macintosh. Of course, she went on working at the business while she was away, and she used to write me what she was doing about it. She was a regular trump, and I liked getting her letters and answering them, though the prospects never came to anything. At last, she wrote that she was coming back, and I called to say how do you do to her. It still hadn't run to a new suit, and I attribute a great deal to that Macintosh. It curtailed all my visits. I haven't had a fair chance with a girl. I had never loved before, so quickly. I was fond of her already. I hope when you write the story, you'll bring her charm out strong. You had better send the manuscript to me, and I'll put in some of the things she has said loyal, womanly things, without any grease paint on them. As I sat there that afternoon, sweltering in the infernal Macintosh, I knew I'd like to marry her. I knew that if the comedy ever caught on, I'd try to make my agent my wife. Well, 
when a production looked as far off as Klondike, there came this offer for the peace from Cameron, who had just taken the throne. She was as excited about it as I was. The throne isn't quite the house I'd have chosen, she said, but you'll get a beautiful cast. Cameron will take pains with the smallest detail. You'll be pleased with everything. Oh, I mustn't answer for your leading lady. I laughed. There was no need for me to tell her I had faith in my leading lady. You have given me a chance, she said. It'll be the best part I ever played. If this engagement makes me, I shall owe it to you. There was one of the things without any grease paint on them. Wasn't it sweet? She'd have had every excuse for reminding me all the time what a service she had done me. We talked it over like pals. She said that, of course, Cameron would play the colonel himself, and that he wanted to get Fairfax for the lover. Who's Fairfax? I said. I don't know him. The lover is an important part. All the pretty scene of yours in the orchard act will go for nothing if your lover is not good. Oh, Fairfax is a very clever young actor, she said. We have never played together, but he has just made a great hit at the Imperial. I saw him there. He was very good indeed. Well, things couldn't have looked more promising. Cameron was enthusiastic. He didn't pay any money on account, but he gave me a cigar. The percentage he agreed to was satisfactory, and the girl I loved considered me her benefactor. Making a discount for disappointment, I hoped for a hundred a week from the throne. Besides that, there'd be the provincial tours, and there were the American and colonial rights. I had visions of a house in Sloan Street and a motor car. Then the expenses began again. I couldn't attend daily rehearsals through August in the Macintosh, so I managed to raise a pony on the agreement. The interest was iniquitous but I was bound to have decent clothes, and on the threshold of a fortune I didn't fuss. I went to a tailor, and I bought a two-guinea panama, and had eighteen pounds left. Fairfax turned out to be a plain young man with a big head, and I didn't think so much of his reading as Miss Miller seemed to do. However, he improved. She, of course, was divine, and Cameron was all right. On the whole, I was satisfied with the rehearsals dramatically. Financially, they were a shock. The luncheon adjournments upset my calculations. I always had to adjourn with Cameron, though I'd rather have taken Miss Millar, and Cameron lunched extensively. If a man stands you Bollinger one day, you can't offer him bass the next. I had expected to enjoy the rehearsals, but the eighteen pounds were vanishing at such a rate that I thanked Providence when the last week came. Well, by dint of missing a rehearsal or two, I had contrived to cling to a fiver, and I shook hands with myself. I counted on it to keep me going till I got the first fees. Vain dream. They decided to try the peas in Worthing for three nights, and I had to pay fares and an hotel bill. Old chap, when I walked here to the throne, on the night of the London production, I possessed one shilling, and that went on for a drink for the acting manager. In the morning, I hadn't the means to buy newspapers with the notices of my own play, Penniless, I read them in a public library among the unemployed. Of course, the notices bucked me up. With an emphatic success, I could smile at being stone broke till the hundred a week came in. But it didn't come. The box office sheets gave me the cold shivers when I saw them, and the queues at the pit and gallery doors were so short that the niggers gave a playing outside. The piece always went very well, but there was never any money in the house. The audience always looked very nice, but none of them had ever paid. They look very nice this evening, don't they? Paper, paper in rows, paper in dreams. A hundred a week? By the first Saturday night, I reckon my week's royalties would almost cover the cost of my worthing trip. And then I was optimistic. Cameron sent for me. He said, I'm afraid I must take this piece off at once. The dressing room reeled. I muttered that the notices had been good. It's more than the businesses. Look at the booking, he said. I hinted feebly that the best people hadn't come back to town yet. He said, well, I'll give it a chance to pick up, if in the meantime you like to waive fees. I waved. I heard him in a kind of stupor. I've never had a bob. Orlando paused. His head drooped sadly. I ascertained that the barmaids weren't looking, and pressed his hand. It's hard lines, he said. We must have another talk after the show. You won't mind my bolting now? 
The bell rang ever so long ago. The second act must be half over. A curse upon the second act, he burst out. Why did I ever write the second act? Don't see it. But I must see it, I urged. I want to see it. What's the matter with it? The dramatist was silent again. I saw that he was struggling with strong emotion. At last, he said in a low voice, The rest of the story, so far as it's gone, is more painful still. Perhaps you suppose that, now it had stripped me of all and involved me in the meshes of a money lender, the monster's malignity was appeased? Not so. Pecuniarily, it could harm me no more. But through my affections, I was still vulnerable. The monster's most insidious injury you have yet to hear. I noticed during the rehearsals that Fairfax was struck with Miss Millar, and lately Miss Millar has shown an unaccountable interest in the big-headed Fairfax. I call it unaccountable because Fairfax, in his proper person, can't be said to account for it. She's always saying how tender he is in the part. The part is tender. I own the man can act, but I gave him the lines to speak. I invented the tender things for him to do. She doesn't remember that. Consider what happened when I wrote the piece. I imagined a charming girl in an orchard. I imagined myself in love with her. She had Elsie Millar's face. She answered me with Elsie Millar's voice. With all the tenderness, all the wit, all the fancy I could command, I tried to make this charming girl fond of me. Materially, I was producing half a dozen pages of dialogue. Psychologically, I was lending my own character to any man who played the lover's part. It fell to Fairfax, and it's all Fairfax with her. Oh, she has been very sympathetic about my failure. We are still friends, but there is another man now. She talks more of his performance than of my comedy. It's natural, I suppose. She understands his work better than mine, but I desert the second act. You shan't see the second act. The second act is the other man's glamour to her. She is falling in love with the part and thinks it's with him. The monster gave him his opportunity. And he is stealing her from me with my own words. Talk to her as you have talked to me, I said, and hope still. I can't help hoping, he answered, but... An attendant entered the buffet with a note. Mr. Lightfoot, sir? Orlando tore it open and passed it to me mutely. I read, Dear Mr. Lightfoot, I hear you are in front tonight. I have been waiting to tell you something all the week. Mr. Fairfax and I are engaged to be married, and we owe our happiness to your play. Will you come around afterwards to let us thank you? Yours always sincerely, Elsie Millar. Poor devil, I exclaimed. Well, the monster has finished with you enough, at any rate. You know that you are disappointed in love. And you know that the last of the expenses is over. Yes, he said. You think your editor will send a cheque for the story? In overdue course, I told him. Why? Well, he moaned. How am I to find the money to buy her a wedding present? End of section 5 Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey Section 6 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Tale That Wouldn't Do. I can tell what's the matter with you, said the bachelor girl. You've got a story to write. I had merely shaken hands with her, put down my hat, and chosen a chair by the fire, so I was surprised. My dear Sherlock Holmes, I exclaimed, this is wonderful. Accustomed as I am to your offensive society, I must own that I fail to see. Nothing could be plainer, my poor Watson, she returned. I have observed that you never look so unhappy as when you have to do any work. Like all her deductions, the thing was marvelously simple when she explained it. Her baptismal name is Patricia. She is an extraordinarily nice girl with seventeen faces. She changes them while she talks. There are her moody face that is almost ugly, and her hopeless face with tragedy in it, and her radiant face that's bewildering, and the fourteen others. If she didn't laugh at orange blossoms, you might approve her. 
well it's quite true i answered i have a story to write or rather i haven't a story and i am obliged to write one i want to find a story about love something piquant and yet tender with egyptian or american she asked sharply passing cigarettes american i said but it won't prevent my going on something piquant and yet tender with a note of pathos and a vein of sentiment and columns of drivel she put in what do you mean by coming here on a wet day and babbling about sentiment don't you know how ill it always makes me now never mind your story be a good fellow and cheer me up i haven't met a man for a month i'm not a man i'm married i mentioned and don't talk to me as if i were a chiffon girl or we shall fall out think i want you to flirt with me i have no illusions left besides i don't believe you could manage to flirt did you ever try once you don't say so was it a success tremendous she nodded biggest joke you ever heard really i said don't get up to make the tea then keep where you are and tell me about it so she crossed her feet on the fender and told me there was somebody i knew she said bob that wasn't his name really but we can let him go at bob i agreed there's no need to give him away i was only a kid about nineteen just beginning to paint you wouldn't have known me in those days i was utter intensely utter to look at i used to flop like the burne jones things i wore garments in my hair so she showed me her comedy face one of the fourteen others he said i was a good fellow when one found me out and told me not to make a guy of myself i'd have boxed anybody else's ears but i liked dick we rechristened him bob i reminded her oh yes well i've let it slip now it doesn't matter it was no one you know he said my clothes and my slang didn't harmonize and that i was bound to change one or the other i couldn't change my slang so i bought a human frock and he sent me a hundred nestors as a present for a good child don't run away with the idea that i was sentimental about him we were chums he used to say the reason he took to me was that i wasn't silly like a girl he used to say i was the best pal he had he was only two or three and twenty younger than i was in some ways the poker's your side stir the fire yes we were awfully good pals for years when he went to work in paris did i tell you he was an artist when he went to work in paris i could have howled with loneliness i was so dull i didn't seem to have anybody to say my best things to have you ever missed anyone like that something funny would come into my mind and i'd wish i could say it to him i think wouldn't it be lovely to be saying it to dick don't you know the feeling i don't think i was ever so near to howling as when i thought of something funny i hope you do understand that i wasn't sentimental if you fancy i felt anything but friendship for him i shan't tell you any more i understand perfectly i said of course we wrote to each other but i was never good at letters and anyhow what's the use of saying funny things if you can't hear the man laugh he was away about a year he had meant to stay for two or three but one day he wrote that he was coming home sooner than he had expected he turned up the next afternoon and it was dick and pat and well it is good to see you again you know the first few minutes were jolly then i saw that he was keeping something back i said what you're going to do is to sit down there and tell me all about it you're in trouble and i want to hear what a brick you are he exclaimed a man's always astonished when you notice anything that's as plain as a pillar box a woman would have been waiting for me to say it from the moment she came into the room is it money i said well in a way he said it is money he had a small income from somewhere or other but i had known him hard up for a thicken and i thought perhaps i might be of use i could have lent him a fiver just then without any bother as it happened so i asked him how much he wanted about a thousand a year he answered well that told me everything and i couldn't speak for a second he was only my friend but he was such a dear good friend and i knew it would never be the same thing between us any more who is she i said that started him and he gave me a catalogue of her fascinations that made me tired 
she was a chiffon girl she'd gone over to paris with his sister and been taken to see dick's studio tea and twaddle he admitted she didn't know anything about art girlish he called her i could imagine her in the studio saying an artist's work must be such fun and calling every picture sweet by what he said it seemed to me she was treating him pretty badly for all she was so girlish she wasn't satisfied to accept him and she wasn't satisfied to let him go didn't want to marry a poor man but didn't want to lose his admiration for the last six months he seemed to have been always bidding her an eternal farewell and getting a note from her about nothing a week afterwards she was back in london now that was why he was here his gush about her gave me a headache. It's a treat to be able to talk it over with you, Pat, he said. Yes, I said, ripping. He wanted to know if I thought she liked him. Well, it was clear she liked him, though whether she liked him enough to live in a fifth-floor flat in West Kensington, I had my doubts. But she wasn't nearly good enough for him. That was the main thing. I said, even if she'll have you, are you sure you're wise to go in for marriage yet? don't think i'm speaking selfishly old man we shall never forget we were pals you and i and i'll drop in sometimes after you're married and smoke a cigarette with you if your wife will have me just the same it's you i'm thinking of your own happiness we're both such real pals dick i know i may talk frankly to you won't you be hampering your work won't you have to sink your ideals and paint the new kitchens and baby's first rattle to make the pot boil are you sure the game's worth the chandler's shop girls are good fun at a dance or to flirt with up the river but to settle down with one of them for life dear boy a fellow's got to reckon up the cost of course he wouldn't listen told me i was a confirmed bachelor girl and couldn't understand if you'd ever been fond of anybody yourself he said you'd know that when one really loves nothing else matters i don't mind what i sink I don't mind the cost. I want Rosie. She's worth all the pictures in the world. Shh, I said. Don't blaspheme. And dear old chap, don't think I'm unsympathetic. You asked me for advice, and I gave it to you honestly, that's all. You were always a good sort, Pat, he said. But I didn't ask you for advice. I asked you if you thought she liked me. Oh, as far as that goes, I said. I dare say you could marry her if you went the right way about it you should have seen him jump how so now you are asking me for advice i said well don't make yourself so cheap dick it was horrid to have to tell dick he had made himself cheap i hated her for it but it was true you've run back to her every time she lifted a finger show her you mean what you say you can offer her a home of a kind and you've got a future if you don't let circumstances spoil it very well then tell her she's got to marry you or say good-bye to you once and for all he answered that he had told her so yes i said repeatedly but tell her so and stick to what you say the next time she whistles don't go she'll like you twice as much for it i think it surprised him to find that i understood anything about girls but i was a girl myself though he didn't seem to remember it he cheered up wonderfully after that funny my coaching him how to win her when i didn't want him to wasn't it but he trusted me and i was bound to play straight with him i should have been a cad if i hadn't played straight with him when he was trusting me still it was funny you know it makes me laugh whenever i think of it i detected no amusement in her voice she paused a moment he dropped in a few days afterwards she went on and told me he had done it he told me she had said she liked him very much but didn't want to marry and that he had wished her good-bye don't come down in a hurry this time i said when you hear from her next week send her a few civil lines and sit tight of course he did hear from her congratulating him on getting into the academy and saying she was going to see his picture on monday afternoon and when my lady went he wasn't there one to dick it was black monday for me though i had nothing but rosy all day long and that was only the beginning of it she didn't make another move for two or three months and he thought he had lost her 
he weakened then he told me he used to tramp the room thinking half the night his sister and i were the only people who knew and his sister had gone to pangbourne so i got it all rather rough on me but i was awfully sorry for him i was sorry for him his eyes in the morning then the girl made another step she fished for an invitation to spend a week at pangbourne by that time he was in such a fever that he wanted to propose to her again as soon as she arrived but his sister said no she said the best thing he could do was to make the girl fancy he was getting over it i don't know how much trouble she had with him but she rubbed her idea in pretty thoroughly for he came and asked me to help him he said alice thinks alice was his sister's name he said alice thinks i ought to be down there when rosie comes and pretend i don't mind any more if you go at all i said that is what you ought to do at first he said she thinks if rosie once saw me making up to somebody else it'd be all right well i always told you that you would let her feel too sure of you i said the only thing is he said there's no other girl there will you come down and see me though pat i did flare out then to ask me to i mean it did seem well it was a little too much he was all apologies in a minute i never saw a man so taken aback in all my life no idea of offending me i have been such a pal that he didn't imagine i'd cut up rough said he had asked me as he might have asked alice only as alice was his sister she'd be no use he kept saying how sorry he was to have annoyed me and looked amazed well in the end i said i'd go if you had heard him you'd understand it was such a trifle in the way he put it and it seemed so strange of me to make a fuss oh i said i don't care i'll go down and talk with you if you like why not so i went he treated rosie beautifully a nice friendly manner that widened her eyes blue eyes and a dolly complexion and flaxen hair she only needed the ticket my clothes take off but she was very pretty nothing to find fault with excepting that she hadn't a brain alice had invited a man who didn't count to take her into luncheon and dick took me rosie was displeased with me at luncheon afterwards dick showed me the garden and i brought him back with a flower in his buttonhole rosie was worried during the evening in the moonlight i said pensively it must be divine on the water now and rosie looked as if she hoped i'd be drowned we were away about an hour curious we had never been on the river together before he didn't bore me too much about her he talked of his work and mine and we had a lot in common it was about the last time we really did have a talk together oh well he had the game in his hands from the beginning before we had been down there two days he told me they were engaged hurrah i said good luck to you old man you've been a trump he said if it hadn't been for you she might never have known her own heart i'm so grateful to you pat i'd like to kiss you oh rats i said i don't go in for sentiment the bachelor girl's voice trembled she paused again i had flirted though she added defiantly when rosie was watching and it was a great joke they were married in the autumn i never see him now but he's selling the new kittens and baby's first rattle for big prices it's time we had tea well you wanted to think of a tale and you've been told one instead not that it would do for you it isn't pathetic it wouldn't do at all i said it's very humorous and i looked at the fire as i answered because i knew she was crying end of section six recording by eva davis Section 7 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. 
the man who understood women and other stories by leonard merrick the laurels and the lady part one part one when willie childers was sent to the cape he went to the last country on the face of the habitable globe to which he was suited it is certainly a question whether he would have made a success of life anywhere but at the cape he was so much out of place that he became conspicuous in paris when he had learnt the language he would at least have felt at home he would have drifted by slow degrees into a congenial set in london but on the diamond fields a young man who hoped to be a poet and who already wrote verse was an incongruity that defies comparison to give him his due he was conscious that his presence was absurd there and justified the chaff that it received and he loathed the fields with a deeper loathing than any other member of its perspiring population but he could not go to the length of altering his nature and becoming brisk and enterprising nor did he want to do that it was not with his nature but with his environment that he found fault lucky rhymes to him were scrip and share and he was full of confidence that his mellow meters were going to make him celebrated one day he would rather have been left in peace with plenty of stationery than have had the business of any broker in the market it was as a broker that he began his uncle blake somerset was the manager of the fortunatus mining company in boldfontaine and when willie came down from oxford somerset wrote to the dulwich villa that now all that damn university foolishness was over the boy had better buckle to and try to make a living it must be conceded that willie had not distinguished himself at oxford and displayed no ability for any of the recognized professions all the same the suggestion that he should buckle to in south africa sounded to him preposterous dimly he had had visions of being called to the bar and obtaining pleasant chambers where he could write poetry all day without being disturbed but he had reckoned without his mother without her faith in her brother's judgment the letter had made a strong impression on her mind and at the idea of its being scouted she both showed temper and shed tears the lady's antecedents and sympathies were commercial she too had felt brazenose to be foolishness indeed she had felt the adjective which she might not use and the possession of a son who seemed content to roam about the garden with a book of rossetti's or walter pater's and who confessed that he didn't know the multiplication table was causing her considerable disquietude she wondered if there had been any eccentricity in the past on poor dear robert's side yes the maternal view was different from willie's she retracted her suggestion that he should read for the bar it had been but a half-hearted compromise when she made it and declared that the cape offered far finer prospects she decided that it was just the plan to take the nonsense out of him and she answered her brother to the effect that his nephew would sail in two or three weeks time though she refrained from explaining to him what kind of young man his nephew was somerset was not long in finding it out he himself looked like a farmer or as one expects a farmer to look he had a big red face and a loud laugh and was powerfully framed his biceps might have been a gymnast willie was a disappointment the moment he alighted from the train being slightly built and consumptive looking and he had no conception of business that was evident in their initial conversation without a suspicion as yet of the young fellow's tendencies somerset felt instinctively there was something wrong with him the ignorance of things that he ought to have known might be excused in remembering the kind of training that he had had but there was something worse than ignorance there seemed to be a hint of incapacity not only had he no ideas about making money he didn't appear interested or intelligent in the matter 
a fact which promised no brilliant future for him considering that all he would have at the widow's death was three or four hundred a year nevertheless being responsible for his coming blake somerset did his best for his relative in a rough way look here he said after a few days i think broking will be about your mark here youngster you ought to earn ten or twelve pounds a week at it if you're smart i'll take you round the market to-morrow and introduce you willie replied that he was much obliged what do i do he inquired do you sell the stones you go into the dealer's offices every morning and ask for parcels and then you cut about into all the other dealers and show em it's a pity you don't know anything about a diamond but you'll soon pick a smattering up and you're always safe to say i've a nice little lot that will just suit you the description was not very attractive to the oxford man but being already uncomfortably conscious that his uncle did not think much of him he made a gallant attempt to simulate an alacrity that he couldn't feel the introductions were duly effected and having procured a license willie embarked on his career as a diamond broker without delay he was equipped with a morocco leather satchel furnished with many pockets and designed to carry all the parcels that were to be entrusted to him but he did not get any he hadn't effrontery enough when he made his applications he asked as briefly as possible if there was anything for him and slunk out mortified as soon as the man said no this though he did not fail to observe that his more experienced competitors entered with a cheery greeting an air of confidence and sometimes such a good story i must tell you mr meyerstein which proved much more effectual half an hour after the market opened he had repeated his dreary formula vainly in every doorway in the street then he returned to his hotel and dreamed of fame and england his uncle hearing of his speedy withdrawal told him that it wouldn't do if he wished to succeed he must remain on the scene and manage to look as if he were succeeding willie with a heavy heart took the hint and from ten o'clock till four henceforward with the thermometer at a hundred degrees in the shade he bustled round and round the crooked little flaring road vaunting his empty satchel as if he were very busy indeed but the pretence did not seem to impress any of the dealers who sat in their shirt-sleeves behind the wide windows weighing diamonds in lacklustre scales and when he called they always replied that they weren't sending anything out this morning just the same at last somerset wrote to his sister that her boy had better return to dulwich he said wittily that there was no opening on the fields for poets he had discovered willie's bent by this time and warned her that living was expensive there the future laureate would loaf more cheaply at home mrs childers replied that she felt such surroundings to be desirable for the formation of her son's character he had no father and a young man who did not seem to have any proper ambition would be a great responsibility for her to cope with alone perhaps by and by blake might be able to put him into a clerkship or something that would enable him to keep himself decently in the meanwhile the extra expense would not amount to so much as his passage would cost somerset who had lost all interest in his nephew accordingly looked about and presently contrived to obtain a post for him and willie went into the magistrate's court at du toit's pan to keep the criminal record and take affidavits of assault and other offences at a salary of three pounds a week that had been two years ago and as if to justify his uncle's poor opinion of him he was a clerk in the same place still this afternoon he sat idly before his desk in the sweltering office and gazed through the bars of the open window at two or three kaffir prisoners in charge of a police sergeant waiting till their names were called 
they had their backs against a wall and their feet in the thick hot dust through the door that communicated with the shed-like court he could hear the droning tones of the assistant magistrate disposing of the case in hand presently the voice of the interpreter shouting john sixpence piccaninny tom fool proclaimed the turn of the negroes outside the sergeant gave them a push and they moved forward apathetically drawing their blankets closer about their skinny thighs the baking wall and the glare of dust were all that was left to see childers closed his eyes wearily his sight had been troubling him of late and leant back in his chair wondering if life had any surprise in store for him if anybody else on earth was so entirely wretched his faith in himself had deserted him by now and he no longer foresaw himself a celebrity he was very young indeed for confidence to have gone but he was not naturally self-reliant and it had been chaffed out of him he was sick with a longing for sympathy quite the last thing attainable here in truth he presented one of the most pathetic figures that the world displays though he was regarded in the camp as cutting a ludicrous one for while he experienced all the emotions of genius his vesuvius brought forth a mouse he was in temperament an artist and in destiny a clerk his verse was disgraceful at times much more rarely than he knew there was a flash of something better than grace in it but in the force to set him free from the environment that crushed him it was lacking he flapped feeble wings like stern starling in his cage crying i can't get out the interpreter brought in the list for the misdemeanors and sentences to be entered in the record good afternoon massa childers i'm going home good afternoon Magasa. part two it was a quarter to five mr shepherd the assistant magistrate a young man with a pink and white complexion who had grown a beard in order to make himself look older consulted his watch and yawned hey ho poet tired sir tired and dry we'll have a liquor as soon as we shut the shop by the by the mail's in the assistant magistrate was always among the first to know when the mail was in being engaged to a girl in england later on she would make her home here and cry to be back in glapham childers was also interested in the arrival of the mail he had submitted his volume of poems four months since to perhaps the only firm of publishers left for it to go to and it was within the bounds of possibility that there might be a line by this time conveying their regrets are they delivering yet he asked i didn't hear said mr shepherd my letters always come to the club i say are you going to the theatre to-night not to-night of course i shall go some evening or other but i expect all to-night seats are gone no they say there are still some left to fight for at the doors all the best ones are gone you bet two pounds each great scott better than clerking eh better than trying niggers in the pan too said the assistant magistrate did you ever see her at home willie shook his head have you i saw her once yes in my last holiday i don't know french but i shall never forget it as long as i live no kid she is the greatest actress in the world she turns you inside out i wish she played in english said willie filling his pipe she might just as well they say she speaks it fluently have you got a match boss rose de Chane had been tempted to kimberley there had been an excited rumour of her coming the year previous but the negotiations fell through and there was nothing better than a prize-fight on the border of the orange free state now the famous actress had actually arrived the local papers had been teeming for weeks with all the anecdotes of her that had been worn threadbare in paris and london a decade and more ago her eccentricities her extravagance her pet tiger cub and her eighty thousand pounds worth of dresses the public read the stories all over again and enjoyed them 
such of the stores as sold photographs had crowded their windows with her likenesses and the walls of the corrugated iron theatre and the bar beside it were placarded with the name of rosa de chaine in letters five feet long every editor on the fields had rushed in person to interview her and this morning's independent detailed her impressions of the place which she had artlessly declared seemed to her to contain a larger number of handsome men and pretty women than any other city of its size that she had seen even rosa de chaine cannot afford to neglect such impressions willie lit his pipe and puffed at it with a sudden sense of pleasure yes he would go this evening if he could get in it would be an emotion tasted earlier than he had expected it did mr shepherd mean to go ted shepherd said that he did the five shilling seats were quite good enough for him and they would go together if willie liked he glanced at his watch again and started the devil he exclaimed we've stopped five minutes too long come on poet we'll go and have that drink they picked up their wide-awakes hurriedly and strolled into the club. The boy behind the bar had fallen asleep and was dozing as peacefully as the flies allowed, for work in the mines did not conclude till sundown, and the club was almost deserted at this hour. The only members visible were a digger, whose enterprise had terminated by reason of exhausted capital, and a law agent without any clients, and a medical man who had many patients but rarely received his fees the civil servants had brandy and soda and the assistant magistrate played with the dice box i'll shake you who pays for both tonight if you like poet he said willie nodded and won and ordered fresh brandy and soda to celebrate his victory they had scarcely swallowed it when they became aware of an angry mutter mingling with the whir of the buckets and the throbbing of engines across the road a clamour of impatient voices the digger who was looking at a picture of hyde park corner in the illustrated london news and wondering how long it would be before he saw the original again became aware of it also and he dropped the paper with apprehension i'm afraid that's about me he said turning rather pale what's wrong johnny asked shepherd it's the boys i expect you see i couldn't pay em this morning they'll go for me if they get the chance willie went to the door followed by everybody excepting johnny teal a gang of some fifty niggers zulus kaffirs and basudos of all ages had surged to the foot of the step a low gravelled veranda before the club and were demanding their wages or Mr. Teal's blood. It is the boys, said Willie. I thought so. Well, tip em some of your verses, poet, and calm em down. Why don't you pay the beggars? said the law agent. Pay em, echoed the ex lessee of the Mui Clip Mining Company. That cursed ground hasn't yielded working expenses for weeks. Pay em? Do you think I'm the standard bank? The doctor exhorted him to come forward and he came gingerly. His appearance was greeted with loud yells, and a hundred naked arms were lifted in execration and appeal. In the instinctive way that the negroes lifted their arms there was a touch of dignity, even of tragedy, that would have gladdened a London supermaster's heart. Presently, however, by dint of fervid promises which he had no prospect of being able to fulfil, Teal succeeded in inducing the posse to depart and, this consummation attained, he dragged his supporters jubilantly to the bar. Childers was not among them. He made his way through the dust and ox-wagons on the market square to the post-office, only to find the publishers had not written, and then, retracing his steps, he went into his room to lie down. His eyes ached badly, and he was sure that he saw less clearly still the doctor had told him that the trouble was caused by his general condition and advised him to rest his sight as much as possible but rest had not improved it nor had the lotion and the tonic done any good 
soon afterwards the piercing shrieks of engines announced that work in the mines was over for the day and now men poured up in shoals to wash and dine and to exchange to-night their bedford cords for dress suits that were relics of a european past in kimberley dress suits were worn more frequently but kimberley was three miles from dutoit's pan and by comparison fashionable there were even men in kimberley who wore stiff collars every day and the theatre was there dutoit's pan had nothing but the club and an hotel and a corrugated iron church it was early when childers and his chief met again and drove into the larger township but a crowd had already collected under the electric lamps of main street and when the doors were opened and the pair at last gained a seats they squeezed into them breathless a long procession of carts sped over the bare connecting road in the next half hour the rush hummed with carts comparatively small as was the theatre it appeared to those in it to contain the population of all the camps when the orchestra came in the house looked like a hill of white arms and bosoms and shining shirt fronts a novel and agreeable flutter of suspense stole through the audience women glanced and smiled towards one another with little excited nods many had forgotten for the instant where they were and in fancy were transported to the francais or the gaiety where they had seen to shame last some touch of the excitement below communicated itself to childers upstairs as the three foreign knocks sounded he leant forward eagerly the play was la dame aux camellias it began with a few lines between de varville seated by the mantelpiece and nanine the maid willie strained in vain to distinguish what was said he had never read the piece though he knew the plot there was the entrance of nichette she spoke briefly to nanine and left and then followed an exhausting conversation between the man and the girl during which the audience suppressed their impatience as best they could few understood more than a word here and there though many assumed an air of keen appreciation there was the peal at the bell there was the servant's exclamation say madame she came on in her best style while the women caught their breath at her gown she affected unconsciousness that an audience was criticizing her but they would not have it they were too grateful to her the applause broke out vociferous and sustained the diamond fields were welcoming the only important actress that had then come to bless them and it was nearly a minute before she could speak as the act proceeded childers found his throat tightening queerly the story has been as much abused as any that was ever written but sickly unhealthy morbid or not it is a story that appeals to almost every imaginative young man it fascinates him strongly as it develops perhaps he too may one day meet a marguerite in secret he has often wished to do so and he identifies himself with its hero who on the stage is so splendid in his romance and passion and in the book by his own confession as errant a cad as ever escaped having his head punched from a theatrical point of view it has a greater recommendation it provides a leading actress with an opportunity which few modern dramas equal and to-night duchene who had carefully selected it for her opening performance availed herself of the opportunity to the fullest she was at this time nearly forty years of age but behind the footlights she did not look a day more than twenty-five her grace her power the tricks which in their apparent spontaneity concealed such cleverness that it demanded a fellow-player to appreciate them as they deserved took one novice among the spectators by storm at the end of the second act he felt that he was in the presence of a revelation during the fifth act tears rolled down his face and he tried furtively to hide them with his programme afraid that shepherd would ridicule him the result of willie childers going to see rosa duchene was really a foregone conclusion 
gunpowder had met the spark and only one thing could happen a poet that he was a pseudo poet matters very little who had been eating his heart out on the diamond fields was confronted for the first time in his life with a beautiful woman who was a genius when the curtain fell and the people rose and screamed at her willie did not scream he kept his seat quivering hysterically he was wrenched by the death scene that he had witnessed the agony of the lover's cry was in his own soul he wanted to walk away somewhere alone the companionship of shepherd was torture to him and he thought that he would have given anything that could be named to have the right to go to her and stammer what she had made him feel such exaltation sounds very absurd but closely examined it is not so absurd as it sounds after the illusion of intimate confidence that is created by sympathizing with a great actress through the range of emotions that she represents laughing with her laughter and grieving with her when she grieves one leaves the theatre having seen nothing at all of her real nature but how much has one seen of the young girls with whom one may more conventionally fall in love at a dance both have uttered things that were not natural to them during the evening and to say the least of it the actress's pretense has been as attractive as the girl's one man would like to take her out to supper another would make of her an ideal and an inspiration she has charmed them both and the fact that suppers may be more in her line than inspiration is irrelevant he escaped from shepherd and taking up a position by the stage door waited there in the hope of obtaining a glimpse of her when she left the hope was not fulfilled she must have come out by another exit the intense dry heat and the sun's blinding glare had been succeeded by a faint breeze and as he drove home his mind spun more quickly for its freshness and the rapid motion of the cart he thought again of his volume of verse at the london publishers and saw it accepted and triumphant an unfamiliar exhilaration throbbed in his veins and fancy mounted beyond control playing all sorts of pranks unexpected and delightful till it seemed lifting him into heaven it was only when the horses stopped that he returned to reality from the stagnant pan came the croaking of frogs and the howling of innumerable stray curs the mine yawned deeply in the night and with the suggestion of gigantic gallows the structures of the hauling gear round the reef rose blackly against a luminous sky from the club there was the click of billiard balls and a jingle of glasses but he did not go in part three shepherd was the first to suspect what was the matter probably because he saw more of childers than anybody else did possibly because incriminating compositions on the government stationery fell under his notice indeed it is said that the girl at clapham received a tribute in verse from the assistant magistrate about this date anyhow suspicion arose and willie's reception of the tentative chaff was as damning as plain acknowledgment and much more comical altogether it was voted the most comical thing that the poet could have done Childers in love, pure and simple, would have been an amusing object, but Willie Childers in love with Rosa Duchesne was a situation that tickled Dutoit's pan uncontrollably. It became the favorite pastime to lure him into the smoking room and invent anecdotes about his enchantress. He was old enough to have forgotten how to blush, but he blushed still, and his face, while the stories were told, supplied them with a superfluous sauce piquant. And cartoons were made of him and pasted on the wall. In one he sang, Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you I give and was depicted on his knees to the actress with an ode in one hand and a child's money-box in the other life was made in various ways a burden to him though no one meant any harm 
good morning have you been to the theatre childers became the stock joke a catch-phrase with which he was greeted by everybody and when he did go to the theatre now he slunk in late and hid himself at the back of the gallery from shame it was when half of duchene's season of six weeks had expired that the chaff stopped and it stopped abruptly for the first time men spoke of willie childers in a tone of gravity one morning he had not appeared in the magistrate's court he had sent a few lines in a painful sprawling hand to say that his sight was much worse that he was afraid it was serious and a few days after that the news circulated that he was blind in improving tales when the misunderstood boy loses his sight all his acquaintances reproach themselves for their cruelty towards him and flock to his simple parlour to listen to him talking like a tract and derive a lasting moral from the patience he displays it did not happen like that in willie childer's case because the men had no idea that they had shown any cruelty excepting for ted shepherd and one or two other very occasional visitors he passed his time in unbroken solitude of course it was useless for him to remain on the fields any longer somerset who in a few months time was going to england for a brief holiday had arranged to take him home in london a specialist was to be consulted and perhaps an operation might be performed meanwhile willie was removed to the manager's cottage on the fortunatus works his uncle came there to sleep between the hours of the club's closing and sun-up each morning during the day a kaffir fetched his meals from the carnarvon hotel he had no one to talk to he knew none of the pursuits by which the blind contrive after years to occupy themselves he could do nothing but think and compose verse in his head he sat helpless in the blazing iron shanty listening to the clamour of machinery throughout the day or the crooning of kaffirs crouched round their bonfires when the moon rose and in this fashion a fortnight wore itself past johnny teal was the man others participated and so were guilty among them blake somerset but johnny teal was the man that suggested the trick let it be stated there was a girl in the rush in those days referred to as paul patchouli she had opened a shop at the back of the diamond market for the sale of bad scent after she left the ladies orchestra with which she had come from natal her real name was not known she called herself olive esmond but that has nothing to do with it she was not considered pretty she was in fact thought very plain even in a spot where men were not exacting in the matter of feminine attractions and a little comeliness went a long way she was however an amusing girl not wholly uneducated and a fortnight after willie's retirement to the cottage opposite the fortunatus tailings heap it transpired that she had a singular accomplishment she could imitate rose duchene to the life she did it so well according to an enthusiast who had heard her that she might have got an engagement at home at a music hall he said you could have shut your eyes and sworn duchene was speaking it was precisely this criticism that gave johnny teal his idea if you could shut your eyes and think duchene was speaking she might be presented to a blind man as duchene herself some of the group to which he propounded it certainly demurred they said it would be blackguardly to play tricks with childers now and objected a good deal in an irresolute way but teal set himself to argue their scruples into air for childers to have a conversation with polly under the impression she was the actress wouldn't do the poor chap any harm he insisted on the contrary it'd give him immense pleasure and as to the humour of the cell it would be one of the best practical jokes ever perpetrated in the camp that was true 
and a strong temptation reiterating that the victim need never know that no disappointment was entailed that the scene would be no less delightful to childers because the happiness was illusory he had his way at last and polly was interviewed and coached a deputation went up to kimberley to see her we want you to help us in a tremendous spoof polly they said you've heard of willie childers no she had not heard of him who was he well he thinks he's a poet and he has lost his sight and he's in love with duchene explained teal now we want to tell him we're going to introduce him to her and then bring him to you do you see he'll make love to you as violently as he knows how and you're to pretend to be awfully taken with him and kid him on do you see of course she'll talk all the time like to shane and end by vowing he's the only man in the world for you and we two or three of us all be hidden about the place somewhere watching the game do you see you know do you think you can do it the girl laughed she was not disgusted by the infamous taste of the project it struck her as being an uncommonly funny one you may bet all you've got i can do it she said rather what a lark when'll you bring him boys well it's got to be carried out carefully said teal one of us must go and say that he has met her and then very kindly say he'll try to get permission to present childers to her he's as green as they make em but it won't do to rush the thing through as if it were as easy as ordering a drink say thursday eh right said polly thursday is he really crazy for her or just spoons shouldn't wonder if he knelt down and kissed your boots she threw back her head and laughed again i shall enjoy this she exclaimed it's something i like no time was lost in acquainting willie with the privilege that might be in store for him and for a moment the expressions of gratitude into which he broke made the conspirators feel almost as despicable as they were they left him in a fever of suspense for a couple of days and then he was told that teal and ted shepherd were to take him to duchene on the following afternoon i let her know you wrote poetry said teal i cracked you up a lot before i asked permission to bring you it wanted a bit of nerve to do it considering i'd only met her once myself but i knew how keen on it you were willie who was trembling groped for his hand and pressed it indeed he could hardly realize that the bewildering thing had happened it was actual he had to repeat it the prospect of sitting by rosa duchene and hearing her talk though he wouldn't see her dizzied him at night he could not sleep and he passed the long morning praying to hear each hour strike on the little american clock that he had bought to let him know how the time went since his watch became useless when teal and the assistant magistrate arrived and guided him up into the cart the effort of replying to them was pain he thanked god when he could be silent his breathing apparatus was playing the same tricks that it had played in the theatre and the clip-clop sound of the horse's hoofs seemed to be vibrating in his inside the hotel to which they were bound was not the queen's where duchene was really staying but a third-rate hotel called the royal and his companions had misgivings lest he should detect the difference on reaching kimberley teal began to talk again eagerly to distract his attention but it was taking unnecessary trouble his affliction was too recent and his excitement too great for the dupe to have such acuteness of perception the driver stopped and shepherd who had agreed to come less because he looked forward to being amused by the deception than because he wished to see that it was not carried too far helped the blind man down his pink and white complexion pinker than usual they were met in the hall by a kaffir servant who had been carefully rehearsed in his part he showed his teeth in a grin of appreciation is madame duchene in said teal we're expected 
the negro disappeared and after a few minutes returned to conduct them to a poor ground-floor room that opened on to a step and a back yard at one end was a small bedstead with a wash-hand stand at the foot the rest of the furniture consisted of a chest of drawers a chintz-covered couch and a couple of basket chairs a few coloured plates from the summer numbers of the english illustrated papers had been pasted on the walls madame de chaine soon come he said respectfully madame says the boss please wait that he grinned more widely still and pointed to the window behind it half a dozen bearded faces were pressed half a dozen arms waved gay salutes great scott exclaimed teal as the kaffir retired we're in a drawing-room again eh he gave a soft whistle expressive of admiration and astonishment what do you think of this it's all right said shepherd confusedly teal nudged him and frowned all right he echoed well i don't know what you were used to my lord but it's about as fine as anything i ever struck look at that tapestry and those bolly idols over there why the woman must be mad to carry such things about with her what's it like asked willie in a reverent voice it's oriental said teal shouldn't you call it oriental shepherd by gum i should like to see her flat in paris if this is the sort of thing she goes in for for six weeks what's the eastern smell don't you notice it it was a pastille that had been set burning in the soap dish he affected to explore for it among countless treasures this is it he said in this pagoda affair what does she keep her room so dark for a bit mystic ain't it take care don't move childress or you'll tumble over a tiger's head hello there was a woman's step in the passage and as they caught it willie turned a dead white the group outside who could see but not hear puffed their cigarettes and continued to stare in curiously here she is murmured shepherd stand up boy willie obeyed as the door opened and Paul Patchouli came in. End of section seven. Section eight of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick The Laurels and the Lady, Part 2 Part 4 Good afternoon, gentlemen, she said languidly. Oh, monsieur, be seated, I beg. Her monsieur was the only false note, and of that he was no judge. Every pulse in his body leapt at her entrance, every nerve in him quickened at the rustle of her cheap little frock across the floor. To him it was brocade of a mysterious rose tint, and there was old lace on her bosom. She sank into one of the basket chairs, and looked towards his companions for approval with her tongue in her cheek. "'I am very pleased to see you,' she said. "'Your friends have spoken about you to me.' "'You see one of your most ardent admirers, madam,' said Teal, "'and a poet. "'I am afraid Mr. Shepherd and I are in the way at the meeting of two artists.' "'Willie lifted his hand in discomfiture. "'Don't make me absurd,' he stammered. "'Don't laugh at me, madam. "'I'm not an artist. "'I only hoped to be one.' but I'm grateful, ever so grateful, for your letting me come here. To have spoken to you will be something to remember all my life. The girl smiled almost as broadly as the negro had done. You are very, very, what is the word in English? Complimentary, she drawled. 
you must not make me vain you know and you are too modest also is it not mr teal i am told that your poems are quite charming even shepherd was amused she was doing it very well the spectators at the window pushed against one another inquiringly will you not recite one to me she asked bravo said teal the very thing go on childers let madam hear something you've done i couldn't said willie forgive me madam i couldn't indeed in paris said polly many poets recite their verses to me yes truly you are too modest monsieur well as you please then let us talk you are fond of the theatre eh he bowed passionately of late he answered awkwardly aha but he can make pretty speeches too a modest poet you mr teal have not said anything so nice to me but perhaps you do not feel it either everybody raves about madame duchene said shepherd mr teal and i are very honoured to be er very honoured indeed he caught signals from the onlookers and drew teal's attention to them they were growing impatient out there the dialogue was lost upon them and viewed as a pantomime the scene was dull polly saw the gestures too and shook her fist at the crowd joyously to-night she resumed i play one of my favourite roles marguerite in point of fact she was mistaken duchene was to play frou-frou but willie could not read the newspapers any more i've seen you in it he said eagerly i was at your first performance i shall never see you in it again why he flushed i said see i can't see you at all how long have you been like this asked the girl deprecatingly nearly three weeks it seems it seems a year i suppose it must yes said childers it seems much longer than it is i dare say i shall get used to it by and by but a day's a long time at first i'm all alone and there's nothing to do it must be awful she murmured mr childers is going home very soon said shepherd and then all of us poor beggars will be jealous of him you and he may meet in london madam added teal you'll go to the theatre next time madame de Shane plays in london won't you childers perhaps she'll let you call on her there too polly shifted her chair irritably will you be able to go about in london mr childers i don't know many people in england he said i'm afraid not i shall be in dulwich with my mother but you will make friends she urged won't you you won't be tied to the house always i shan't be very lively company i don't suppose many men'll be anxious to be my friends ah well exclaimed teal a boy's best friend is his mother ain't she madam gentlemen said polly springing up i'm sure you two would like a cigar on the step don't move mr childers they'll come back to you johnny teal stared you would like a cigar on the step she repeated and as it was evident that she meant to be obeyed they said that it was a very kind suggestion and withdrew teal consoled himself with the idea that they were to be afforded a view of willie on his knees she did not speak for some moments after the door closed she sat in the chair that teal had vacated with her back to the window her expression had changed and her face was quite soft are you pleased they've gone she asked yes answered willie simply so am i i want to talk to you i like you do you know i never was so sorry for anybody in the world before you make me feel almost glad i'm blind i've prayed that i might talk to you one day i used to pray to see you too but that's impossible now that night he paused, afraid. What night? said the girl. Your first night here. You know, I wasn't blind then, and, oh, it's like a dream. Is it really you I'm telling it to? It's me, 
said Paul Patchouli, her eyes shining. And what? I came away praying to be great, just to have the right to meet you. I've always wanted to succeed, of course, ever since I was a child, but that night it was different. It was to know you, to hear you say you had read my verse, to feel there was a sort of, a sort of sympathy between us. Are you laughing at me? She put out her hand and touched him. She had given her hand to many men, but never quite like that. Willie had a wild impulse to lift it to his lips, but did not do so, afraid again. She had hoped that he would. Do you like me as much as you thought you were going to? she asked, after a silence. Yes, said Willie. You're just what I was sure you must be. Really? Really? That's good, she said, smearing a tear off her cheek with the hand that was not resting on him. Shall you come again? I mean, alone. May I? he cried. Do you mean it? Oh, but how can I? I forgot. I can't go anywhere alone any more. This is the first time I've been out since I lost my sight. Teal and Ted Shepherd offered to bring me. The beasts, said Paul Patchouli in her throat. If I may come again with them? No, don't do that. Where do you live? Perhaps one day, as you're all by yourself, I'll come and see you. But I don't want you to talk about it if I do. I... No, I never shall come. Why? Why not? I won't speak a word of it to a soul if you don't wish me to. But it would be a charity. I'm sure you'd have no need to mind. Oh, I'd bless you, madam, please. Why do you like me? she said sullenly. You must be an awful fool to like a woman you don't know. I do know you now, he faltered, shrinking. And besides, besides what? said Polly. I had seen you on the stage. Is that nothing? Never mind the stage. Imagine you've only seen me here today. Well? You want me to come? I implore you to. Oh, yes, because I'm Duchesne. If I weren't a great actress, you wouldn't care a button whether I was sorry for you or not. Well, what is the address? I'm in the manager's cottage, Mr. Somerset's cottage, on the works of the Fortunatus Mining Company, he gasped. Any driver will take you to it. It's in Boltfontaine. I know, she said. You know? I mean, I've heard the name. No, my acquaintance with the diamond fields is not so extensive as all that, monsieur. But I will find it, and I will come. Her accent was much more marked in the last sentence than it had been a few moments ago, but its resumption was unnecessary. The first impression had been all-powerful, and he was drunk with delight. Indeed, when the entertainment was over, he was the only one who was entirely satisfied with it. Johnny Teal and his party felt that the hoax had panned out less brilliantly than it had promised, and Polly, alone in her room, threw herself on the bed and cried miserably, without knowing why. Part 5 It was significant that she did not call upon him for three days, though she wanted to do so very much. It was significant also that, when she did go, she put on her prettiest hat and frock, and made herself look as dainty as she could, though her host would not be able to see her. Her visit intensified that strange emotion to her, pity for a man, and the step, once taken, she went again, without vacillating. And bad shilling was dispatched for meals for two from the Carnarvon, and their afternoons were so pleasant that sometimes before they parted, stars were in the sky. There was now demanded of the girl an infinitely more difficult achievement than that required of her at the Royal Hotel. She found herself expected to realize and respond to an artist's aspirations. She could not do it quite, but if she simulated more comprehension of them than she could feel, she did, by degrees, come to gain a glimmer of the blaze within him, too. She had to strain for it hard at first, 
so hard that she was surprised at her own patience many of his confidences were meaningless to her foreign why should he await an answer from the publishers with such suspense when he didn't expect much money even if they took the book but during those long afternoons and evenings while willie talked to rosa duchene as he had never thought to find himself talking to any one polly sat opposite him in the rocking chair with attentive eyes learning a lesson once just as she was leaving blake somerset came in he had heard that his nephew was receiving visits from a lady in the cottage and guessing who the lady must be intended to put a stop to them he was rather ashamed of himself for having allowed the joke to be played at all and the discovery of the lengths to which it had been carried annoyed him polly started in alarm but childers who had no cause to be embarrassed performed what he believed to be the ceremony of introduction with perfect calmness i don't think you have met my uncle he said have you mr somerset madame duchene somerset was about to answer with a brutal laugh but a gesture from the girl checked him when they were outside and out of earshot she stopped and looked at him appealingly are you going to give me away she said are you going to tell him don't i'm not doing any harm please don't tell him this is damned nonsense exclaimed somerset the boy's an ass but you've no right to have a game like this with him you know it won't do i'm not doing any harm she insisted really of course it's a beastly shame in one way but but it does cheer him up you must see for yourself how much brighter he is and and if you tell him you'll break his heart rats said somerset don't talk such piffle you'll break his heart she flared out not that you'd mind much i suppose if you did well go back and do it go in and say that isn't rosa duchene who comes to see you it's a girl they call paul patchouli and everybody's been kidding you go on then you won't have to take him to england because he'll be buried here before you start and it'll be you who have killed him as sure as a gun do you mean to tell me said somerset blankly that you think he'll never find out you must be as daft as he is you little fool oh, well i don't care do as you like can't last long that's one thing when are you coming again i'm coming to-morrow said polly and if you think it all so shocking i wonder you let those swine bring him to my room at all events i don't guy him as you meant me to then she jumped up into the cart and drove away and somerset dropped into the club and told teal that funny as it sounded he believed that girl was mashed on the boy and the posse of conspirators sat and viewed the development of their plot with open mouths she meant her deception to conclude with the actress's departure and it was only when the time came that she perceived how strange a hold the deception had established on her how much she liked the young man who talked to her of things that she had never talked of before the temptation was too strong to be resisted and prompted by the fact that duchene's season had been extended for a week she told him when she went on the morrow that it had been extended for six weeks childers joy was pitiful to behold he had been happier of late in his blindness than he had ever been when he had sight the sudden news that his paradise would endure when the groan of its closing gates was already in his soul was a relief so intense that its outcome frightened her from the beginning she had been aware that he was in love with her but now she saw how wildly he was in love and she was aghast her life had not accustomed her to regard sexual attraction as a serious matter though she had not continued to view her imposture lightly she had not grasped the full responsibility of it till then she gazed at him wildly with trembling lips like a child who has smashed something are you so glad she faltered so glad is all that the consciousness crept through her as she asked it that she too was glad 
not in the frivolous way that she had thought but as a woman is glad to remain with a man who has grown dear to her she moved slowly over to him and took his hands down from his face and dropped on her knees before him wondering at them both willie she whispered say something i love you he couldn't answer but she felt what she had done and she forgot then that the whole thing was a lie forgot what an exclamation would burst from him if he could see her it was her own kisses that he was returning it was her own clasp that made him shake like that the deception had gone further still and there began for the blind man a period in which he tasted all the triumphant rapture of possessing a beautiful and celebrated woman whom he adored when he embraced polly his delusion gave him rosa duchene in his arms when polly clung about him it was duchene's touch that thrilled his blood and duchene's lips that burned he lavished on polly the madness of the passion that duchene had inspired he saw with his brain the form of the famous woman that intoxicated him while polly the insignificant was lying on his heart the ecstasy of the delusion dizzied him rosa duchene was his own visited him daily vowed she was wretched when they were apart she a genius renowned all the world over discussed with him the prospects of his poem's acceptance and entered into his hopes and fears why was he a nonentity if only he could climb nearer to worthiness one afternoon a fortnight later when polly went to the post office to inquire if there was anything for him she found that the publisher's reply had at last arrived she saw their name on the envelope and a roll of manuscript which the clerk handed to her also showed that the work was declined she took the things almost as disconsolate as her lover would be and wondered on her way to the cottage how she was to break the news to him how she could be gentle enough he had come out on the step to listen for her he knew where she had been and the eagerness on his face made the words that she had to speak more difficult to her still dearest said childers and waited there's a letter said polly reluctantly i haven't opened it yet the rejected manuscript oppressed her she put it down on the table with her sunshade from them yes read it he begged breathlessly read it rosa for heaven's sake she opened the envelope looking not at it but at him it was hateful that it should be she who had to bring the disappointment the color was fluttering in his cheeks and the thin hands held out towards her quivered suppose she told him a fib suppose she said he couldn't see the answer as the notion flashed into her mind she caught her breath and willie heard her they've taken it he exclaimed she was trying confusedly to discern what difficulties such a falsehood would entail but his question decided her she could not crush him with the truth after that yes she said in a low voice they have taken it rosa rosa oh my god read it to me what do they say they say oh darling i am so glad for you so glad willie aren't you happy i told you it'd be all right now didn't i what do they say they say how can i see if you hold me so tight silly boy it's only a line dear sir we shall be pleased to publish the poems you have submitted they will be what is it they will be brought out soon that's all so so perhaps they aren't going to pay you for them but you won't mind that will you they'll publish them and they say pleased they might have said willing but they say pleased to her the communication that she had invented sounded very meagre but she need not have striven to apologize for it to him the bare fact was more than enough they were going to bring out his book 
he would hold it hug it and soon he had been craving all his life and on an instant fortune rained favors on him with both hands balzac's expression of every artist's prayer recurred to him to be celebrated to be loved he marvelled giddy with exultation that he could be so calm in the face of miracles he was rosa duchene's lover and now his reveries was to be given to the world then a frightful misgiving seized him you haven't deceived me it's true he gasped it's quite true cried polly how could you think such a thing they embraced again and he told her how proud she would be of him by and by you'll make me he panted if i have written these before i knew you what shall i do now i shall be great rosa i shall be great the man you love will be known too you'll have done it for me what a beautiful world we live in and it's the same world that was so ugly the other day oh darling life it blows kisses back to me you fill me with emotions and ideas that tumble over one another i shall pour them out in my work my mind and heart are bursting sometimes too small to hold all you make me feel i'll dedicate every book to you you who will have inspired them all oh thank god i'm a poet to worship you as i do and be able to lay nothing at your feet would have been torture he wandered about the room with her arm round him while her troubled gaze turned from time to time to the roll of manuscript on the table did you believe i was an artist when we first met he broke out again or was it only pity did you feel we had something in common different from the others oh how vain of me that sounds but you know you know how i mean it i know she said and you did you did feel there was a bond between us tell me i want so much of you dearest i want more and more and more every day i want more than i can tell you and more than the utmost it's as if nature hadn't provided for such a love what can i do you know your thoughts before you speak them i'm jealous of that you're mad he nodded i dare say nothing satisfies me but i can't see you if you knew how i strain i'd give my right arm to see you now turn your face up and let me try great god it's a wonderful thing to be a woman and somehow it doesn't seem enough to be a man one day i'll try to tell you all i feel for you if i could do it it'd be the finest poem ever written and what a relief when she left the moon was shining she slipped the manuscript up under her dust cloak and reaching home hid it away remorsefully at the bottom of her box what would be the result of the lie she had told she upbraided herself bitterly for her cowardice but now for him to learn that his work was rejected would be a blow unbearable now whatever happened he must not know he would curse her part six in the night the remembrance struck her that she had left the note in his possession she was seized with the terror that he might show it to somerset and discover the truth with the rudest shock possible she lay tossing restlessly and the sun had scarcely risen when she drove to boldfontaine with a face of ashes willie was not visible he was dressing with the aid of the kaffir who attended on him she sank on to the first chair inside the door and tried to gather voice to call to him he entered from the bedroom almost at the same moment and his appearance suggested that the catastrophe had occurred his greeting however dispelled her fear i've had news about my mother he murmured she's dead the mail carrying Childers' poems had also brought a letter to Somerset. Mrs. Childers had opportunely died of pneumonia, avoiding the arrival of a son who had had no proper ambition and who was now blind besides. 
Somerset had had a long talk with him the previous night, after Polly's departure. The widow's death put difficulties in the way of the young man's return to England. The manager was going with the object of enjoying himself. Moreover, in three or four months he was to be back on the fortunatus works. He had pointed out that there would now be nobody to take charge of Willie in London. It was an awkward thing to determine what was to become of him. Seldom had a young man who had inherited about three hundred and fifty a year been such an encumbrance. All these facts Childers imparted to Polly. "'We haven't decided what I'm to do,' he went on. "'I couldn't stop here permanently, even if I wanted to. I'm bound to be a nuisance, you see. It wouldn't be fair for a fellow like me to plump himself on an uncle for life.' "'Have you told him about your book?' "'No. It wouldn't interest him. And we talked about my mother's death. No, I didn't say anything about it.' "'And I wouldn't if I were you.' she exclaimed. I wouldn't say anything to a soul till it is printed. Let it be a secret between us two till the right time comes. That's what I thought, darling, he said. Yes. She passed the day between relief and dismay. It was piteous to think of the loneliness of his situation. She could not have loved him more tenderly if she had been his wife. The further complication that had arisen to harass her appeared, temporarily, graver than anything else. Willie was no less dismayed. His grief for the loss of his mother was not all. He longed for Duchesne to propose his travelling to England by the same boat as herself, to say that she would be his constant companion till they had ascertained whether an operation was feasible. This way out of the difficulty must have presented itself to her, he thought, but she had not suggested it, and for him to do so was impossible. A little constraint crept into his conversations with the girl now, and while she inwardly commented on the difference, he was tremulously waiting, in every pause, for her to make the offer that had never entered her head. Their dream might have continued in England, more deliciously than he had ever dared to hope, and instead they were to be divided entirely, by her own choice— he was bitterly wounded, and not even the anticipated arrival of his book, the subject on which he chiefly talked with her, was potent to banish his mortification. His allusions to his book were, indeed, often perfunctory, but their effect on his listener was disquieting enough. The first of the consequences of her lie was already at hand to worry her, she repented that she had said soon in her improvised acceptance, and wondered how soon a publisher's soon might mean. Childers was equally ignorant on the point, and in answer to her nervous queries, he said that the copies might reach him any week. She could do no less, after this, than pretend every mail day to go to the post office to inquire for them, and affect to be disappointed when she informed him that nothing had come. She groped, perplexed, in the labyrinth that she had created, questioning helplessly how to sustain it. If the truth were exposed at this stage, she would have done him the cruelest, the most cowardly wrong imaginable, and she'd make away with herself. Her only excuse for the deception was that, so far, it had been successful. If the truth came out, after all, it would be the end of her. She'd be like that girl in Bullfontaine Road who had taken carbolic acid the other day and been found in a blue heap on the floor. After each mail, she gave thanks for another respite, but when four mails had been delivered, she feared that a longer delay would excite his suspicions. And, facing the inevitable with the courage of despair, she nerved herself to contemplate the boldest stroke that she had planned yet. While she was perpending it, the prospect of Willie's making the voyage with his uncle was extinguished definitely. Somerset was starting at once, at a couple of days' notice, for a very brief trip indeed. His subordinate on the Fortunatus had been offered a better appointment, and it was necessary for the manager's vacation to be taken while the other was still on the works. In the circumstances, 
Willie would be more than ever a burden. Somerset explained that he would make time to see the solicitor to the estate and endeavour to arrange for the boy to be looked after in London. There were always fellows going over, and he could travel with someone else later on. That he himself should take him was impossible. Willie did not remonstrate. But the end of the imaginary extension of Rosa's season was terribly near now. Rosa de Shane, as a matter of fact, was at this time at Monte Carlo, dropping some of the diamond field's money at the tables, and he felt hopelessly that the woman he loved was fading out of his life for ever. He could have cried with the pain of it. He sat in the slip of a sitting-room the night before the departure, while Somerset banged his portmanteau about and made cheerful remarks. Somerset was wondering whether he should drop a hint to the lad about Polly. He decided that he would ask Ted Shepherd to keep an eye on him instead. Willie was longing for him to be gone, longing to be free to abandon himself unseen to his misery. In the morning he felt his forlornness, less when the sound of the cartwheels had died away, leaving him to the mercies of bad shilling for the next two months, than he had done while the preparations were going forward but the consciousness that they all found him an incubus was bad to bear. His welcome to Polly when she appeared was the outcome of the consciousness and alarmed her. Having taken off her dust coat and hat, and tried vainly to make him talk, she began to prepare their tea. At last, glancing at him, she said diffidently, "'Has anything happened? You have not much to say. What's the matter?' "'Oh, nothing particular.' My uncle is gone, that's all. Gone? Gone where? To England. It was settled two days ago. Didn't I mention it? No, she said. You didn't? It's strange you forgot to. Then you're quite alone here now. All night, too? Yes, he answered, all night, too. But he did not say any more, and with a stare of puzzlement, and her face a little paler, she stood silent. The kettle had been filled, and the wick of the spirit lamp was lighted. She stood waiting for the water to boil. "'It's boiling, Rosa,' said Willie. "'I can hear it.' "'I was thinking of something else,' she said, starting. "'There!' After a moment's struggle with himself, he asked, "'What were you thinking of?' "'What's the difference?' said the girl. "'I was thinking, too.' "'I know!' She ran to him impulsively and bent over the chair. "'We aren't the same to each other. What is it? Tell me.' He laughed, or sobbed. "'It's you!' "'Me?' "'Oh, don't make me say it. You know as well as I do that I shall be alone in this heaven-forsaken hole, that, for all one can see, I may end my life in it. He's gone, and you're going.' Picture me sometimes. You'll always be able to think of me just as you left me. That's the advantage of knowing a log. Willie, she cried, what do you mean? Why do you— I shall see more of bad shilling after you're gone, if he's kind. I shall learn to look forward to his remembering me and listen for his black feet on the boards as I used to listen for you. Has anything happened? My God! "'Why do you talk to me like this?' she exclaimed. "'Don't you think I'm sorry enough for you? "'You talk as if I could help it. "'How can I help it? "'If I can, tell me the way. "'I'll do it. "'I'd love to do it. "'You reproach me for nothing.' "'The boy's eyebrows were raised significantly, "'and she flung herself on him in a whirlwind. "'If I can help it, tell me the way. "'You shall tell me. "'I don't know what you mean. "'I swear I don't. "'I won't let you go till you tell. "'You haven't thought?' "'She shook her head vehemently. "'So why don't you say? "'Oh, I forgot. "'I was shaking my head. "'No, no, no. "'I don't know, Will. "'You'll refuse if you want to. "'Answer!' "'Yes, I'll refuse if I want to. Answer!' "'We, you and I, might go to England together.' Her clasp on his neck loosened, and she lay in his arms, limp with dismay. 
this the natural course in the role that she was assuming was a complication utterly unforeseen by her go together she gasped you don't wish it yes yes i do i do but how it'd be quite easy let your company go on ahead and we can follow by another boat i've thought of everything in that drawer there's my money you'd take it and get our tickets to cape town i don't know exactly how much money there is but it's nothing like enough for our passages and when we got down to the colony i should wire to the lawyer and he could cable me out a hundred or two go on will muttered polly feverishly go on the blessed revelation that she was not expected to pay for her own passage a thing that would have been as impossible for her as to buy the kimberley mine had brought the colour to her cheeks again the one question that dizzied her now was how could she sustain his belief that she was the actress if they travelled on a steamer full of people well when we were home we would go to a great oculist somebody who sits in his consulting-room and charges a guinea a minute somebody with a strange manner that we don't like at first and who doesn't look like an oculist a bit but is marvellously clever like the one in poor miss finch and he'd give me back my sight my sight my sight and i could see you when we kiss she yearned at him pitiful and afraid to think it should never have struck you rosa i've been breaking my heart because you didn't suggest it i thought you didn't care for me any more that you had grown tired won't it be glorious i shall see your beautiful face close at last and it'll be you who helped me to do it sweetest tell me we are going it seems too wonderful to be true we're going she said she put her hand through the open window and pulled at the water bag roughly made of canvas with the neck of a beer bottle inserted for a spout it hung there to render the mawkish lukewarm water fit to drink the iciness of its contact with her forehead now cleared her brain end of section eight section nine of the man who understood women and other stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Laurels and the Lady, Part 3. Part 7 compared with this new and stupendous difficulty the dreaded need for meeting his demand for the copies of his reveries appeared a simple matter enough when she came next she placed a parcel on his knees with so little misgiving that she was surprised at herself the poet gave a cry of delight my book it's my book she told him to cut the string but his fingers shook and he couldn't manage it oh i can't you she took the penknife from him and then let him unfold the wrappings himself six volumes met his touch with an electric thrill all alike but each to be caressed apart from the others each of them lovable and delicious how delicate was the surface that he stroked he was holding his firstborn and he thanked god the emotion was the true emotion though it was conjured up by fraud it was the bliss of ignorance but none the less bliss he was holding his firstborn and polly had given him a joy no meaner than heaven would have given had it granted him the power that he fancied he had displayed six copies of another work and imagination were as potent as reality tell me what it's like he whispered it is she said a pale curious fawn the edges are stained a deeper shade and the name of william childers is at the bottom of the cover a little to the right in dark antique lettering let me trace it show me 
she obeyed terrified watching his efforts breathlessly i can't make it out but it looks well eh? it looks well it looks beautiful she said the paper's thin he murmured i'd hope they'd give me better paper it's thin she confessed remorsefully but very good-looking i think it looks more uncommon than if it had been thick and the type big is there a wide margin there's a very wide margin asserted polly give me your finger again there all that is margin and the type splendid i can read it from here she could she could read the norman conquest edward was not a vigorous king he had little authority while he cuddled the book with a long-drawn sigh of content perhaps soon i shall be able to see it rosa when do we go need we wait long i'm on fire but oh i'm happy too happy happy i'm happier than i ever hoped to be although i've no eyes since i knew you my whole life has changed how can i repay you suddenly a passionate desire seized him read me the first poem he prayed read me seek eater at astra let me hear rosa duchene speak my verse she stood speechless her head was swimming rosa wait she stammered it's new to me you are a poet and it's new to me wait till i know them willie i have a reputation to lose she thanked her guiding star she had retained the manuscript and he his disappointment passing thought how sweet was this timidity in such a woman he told her his thought with triumphant tenderness she resolved that he should have plenty of opportunities for the triumph in future she had proposed that on the journey before them she should adopt his surname to explain the unavoidable suggestion she had urged that while duchene's features might be familiar to many duchene's name would be known to all and entail perpetual embarrassment in agreeing with this he had removed her initial anxiety from her mind freed from it she made the needful preparations with less of fright in her soul and now since they were to go she was sometimes eager for them to be gone soon there was the contingency that a man might drop in on him and at the final instant destroy the whole fabric of the deception that she had weaved she strove to persuade herself that she might preserve her lover's delusion more securely where she had only strangers to fear than she could have done on the diamond fields but then her reason mocked her for the hope so many things might happen she dared not look ahead alternately she longed and trembled for the hour that was to see them start she was fighting pluckily but in moments the enormity of the undertaking to which she had set her hand paralyzed her and at every step she seemed called upon to vanquish a further obstacle that had not been suspected till it barred the way when the morning broke at last her predominant sensation was pleasure her own luggage was ready and while bad shilling went for their breakfast she was busy packing the remaining things of willie's she was still on her knees endeavouring to fasten the box while willie sat on it when the boy returned his additional weight for he was a boy of about forty years of age weighing twelve stones disposed of the matter and they sat down to the coffee and steaks at the untidy table gaily reminding each other that it was for the last time the negro had come back with a cart and the meal concluded they made haste to leave as they mounted to their seats the doors of the cottage and of all the sheds about the works banged violently the long low swishing sound was heard that heralded a dust storm in another minute the air was dark and they hid their faces to shield them from the hissing stinging grit such dust storms were of constant occurrence but in this one the little hottentot driver appeared to read a warning for he lashed forward the horses furiously they gained the station before the rain that he had foreseen began to fall but it did fall in floods sweeping less fortunate animals off their feet
and Polly's cheerfulness deserted her as she glanced back into the deluge. Superstitiously, she felt that the adventure had opened under ominous conditions. Part 8 However, the thirty-odd hours in the train were uneventful, and they reached Cape Town safely. Again, both were exhilarated. The comparative freshness of the atmosphere, to her the sparkle of the sea beyond the jetty, and to him the scent of it. The odor of flowers and the rustle of trees were delicious after the desert they had left. And he drove in a hansom again, a white hansom, with a colored driver, truly, but a hansom. They went straight to a little inn of which Polly had heard outside the town. It seemed to her to be almost at the foot of the mountain whose squareness broke off so sharply against the intense blue sky and, obtaining rooms, they sat down and smiled at each other in delight. "'How clean everything feels,' said Willie. "'The towels and the chair covers, it's jolly.' She had been thinking so, too. Inside it was clean, and outside it was green and tranquil. The road that the hostel overlooked was, at this part, an avenue of firs, glinting here and there with branches of the silver leaves that are sent to England as birthday cards, with stiff little views or sentiments painted on them. Presently a Malay maid-servant, a starched white triangle from the armpits down, with a bright silk fez upon her head, came in with their dinner, and they tasted fruit once more, not fruit as it was procurable in Kimberley, but luscious peaches and purple figs and a watermelon plucked since an hour. They sat dawdling over their coffee by the window while the moon rose, and now and again the thrum of a banjo was borne to them on the stillness. And Childers smoked a cigarette, because the situation seemed to call for one, though he enjoyed it only with his fingers now. In the morning they took one of the trains that pottered between the suburbs and Cape Town and sent the cablegram to the solicitor. But they were not impatient for the money to arrive. They contemplated with fortitude the two or three days that they would have to pass here. When the answer came, and they left the bank with a roll of notes in Polly's pocket, they went to the office of the company that had a boat sailing next to engage their passages and here they met with their first disappointment. All the berths were booked, and it was necessary for them to wait for the Union steamer, which left a week later. It was disconcerting, but it couldn't be helped. After all, they were comfortable at the inn, and though Childers experienced more regret than Polly, he was not very seriously chagrined either. They walked home talking, for it was an agreeable walk after one had passed the smell of the tannery at Pappendorp. He spoke of the suspense in which he waited to learn how the critics received reveries, the humiliation he would feel if they sneered at it. And then the girl told him how the scene about them looked, of the fields of arum lilies, despised like buttercups in England, of the clusters of maidenhair fern fluttering in every hedge. Look, she exclaimed, oh, I'm sorry. I mean how sweet this is, Will, this villa. Those high cactuses, cacti, what is it, divide us from the garden, but here at the gate one can see in. The lawn is yellow with loquat trees and crimson with japonicas. It's all patches of color and shadow, and it's got a perfect duck of a step. And, oh, a lovely old negress with white hair who's coming down to us. Let's go on. She'd bother us to go over it, perhaps. It's to let. "'We shall find a difference when we get to London, shan't we?' he said. "'Fancy it! January! The cold, the wet, the bustling crowds in the foggy streets, and the mud carts slopping over! What a contrast!' "'London has got suburbs, too. Dulwich, where you lived, is a suburb, isn't it? It wouldn't be like that if we went to Dulwich.' "'No,' he said. We shouldn't find crowds in Dulwich because the people who live there never go out, and there'd be no mud carts because in deadly Dulwich the mud is never cleared away. But its long, dreary, desolate roads aren't like this one in the least. Cape Town appeared to him, in spite of his affliction, much more attractive now than it had done eighteen months before when he saw it. 
the thought occurred to him that he might turn their enforced delay to account by consulting one of its medical men and obtaining a second and more authoritative opinion he mentioned the idea to polly and she ascertained that the best man to whom he could go was an englishman dr eben drysdale they heard very encouraging accounts of his ability though not a specialist he had effected some remarkable cures in ophthalmic cases it was said and after polly had written for an appointment willie grew more and more excited at the prospect of the visit the girl herself did not know what to desire as they mounted the steps of the house her knees knocked together to hope the man might say that no operation would succeed sounded so heartless that she was ashamed to look at willie while her struggle with the hope was going on yet for his sight to be restored would mean a tragedy for them both she often prayed though to many it may sound improbable and she shaped an inward irresolute prayer as they stood waiting to be admitted she said oh god you know all about it help me to want the thing that he'll like best in appearance dr drysdale was not impressive when willie had finished explaining he said yes yes to be sure and you're on your way back to the old country eh well let's see let's have a look he put on a strange contrivance and examined the eyes through a peephole in it and how long is it since the trouble began my sight has been weak for a long while it's been getting very bad for the last eight months and about nine weeks ago it failed altogether at least i wore a shade for a few days and then yes yes said dr drysdale can anything be done asked polly the doctor pondered well i wouldn't say that no one over there would advise an operation you might go to follett or to mcintyre i dare say mcintyre might do it and it's possible it might be partially successful but your husband she bowed the question is whether it's good enough for him to go to england on the chance anyhow i shouldn't recommend him to live there i don't understand said willie heavily it wouldn't do your lungs any good you know here you've everything in your favour my advice to you is to stay where you are let's tap you about a bit you might take off your coat and waistcoat yes and your shirt too now then draw a deep breath again my lungs aren't strong stammered willie i know they never have been but what you're implying's news to me polly rose in consternation do you mean that he's ill doctor very ill i mean said dr drysdale suddenly evasive that i wouldn't recommend england for him that's all it isn't a climate that we choose when there's a tendency to any pulmonary complaint and and as your husband says his lungs aren't exactly strong there was a pause that lasted some time we may as well go said childers at last I'm glad to have had your opinion. Good morning. But as Polly went to the head of the stairs, he turned and spoke to the doctor hurriedly on the threshold. I want it straight, please, he said in a low voice. If I live in England, how long shall I last? One can't say, said the other, deprecatingly. Nature at times. Roughly, I'm not a child. How long? So far as I can judge, from a cursory examination i should give you about two years good god and here here with care and if you avoid excitement you may live for ten more but you must avoid excitement mind the girl was coming back eager to miss nothing willie heard the frou-frou of her skirt if i can't avoid excitement he questioned desperately if that's impossible the doctor shrugged his shoulders. You won't live so long. Part 9 Willie and Paul Patchouli left the house silently. She could not express her comprehension in words, and she loathed the passers-by that prevented her taking him to her heart. To him the shock was awful. 
now he knew the meaning of various sensations that he had set down to lassitude and depression she squeezed the hand that rested on her arm my poor boy she said it's it's rather hard lines isn't it she noted absently the brutal blue of the sky the fierceness with which the bay sparkled the noise of a little traffic in the road was deafening you must stop in cape town and get well she murmured are we going back by train yes he said drearily i suppose so his thought was not that his sight was lost for ever not that england would never now be anything to him but a memory it was that she and he must separate she would go perhaps a little later than they were to have gone together perhaps much later but she would go it seems that it was fated he said what was fated he had taken it for granted that she must be thinking of the same thing but she was suffering with her own identity and had not remembered to view the situation as duchene why that you were to leave me out here after all leave you then realizing the position she was staggered would duchene leave him or would she stay regardless of everything else she didn't know it looked to her impossible that rosa duchene would renounce her career and become the jest of europe in order to remain with willie in cape town but mightn't it look impossible because rosa duchene was nothing but a great name to her she was a woman too if a great woman loved him just as much wouldn't she now be suffering just as much wouldn't she ache to stay with him just as much as she herself was aching it was so difficult we must think about it she said would consent entail discovery or was his belief in the actress's devotion equal to accepting such a sacrifice without suspicion as the train bore them homeward she sat staring from the window asking herself the question she was now grateful for the presence of strangers she did not want to speak on the platform willie exclaimed what do i care we'll go together all the same i'd rather be with you and die rosa than be left alone and live don't let's think about it any more we'll go as we'd arranged are you mad she cried he persisted but she would not listen to him and all the afternoon she waited trying to perceive whether he was ready to receive the suggestion that she craved to make during the evening both were very quiet. She had wheeled her armchair to the sofa where he lay, and stooped from time to time to kiss him. But her sympathy seemed empty to him without the words that he was yearning to hear, and to herself, till the words were spoken, the caresses that she could not restrain seemed almost an insult. "'When shall you sail?' he asked, breaking a long silence. "'When you are tired of me.' she answered oh you'll go before then really coquetry appeared heartless to him he wondered at her for the first time i wish you were a nobody i've been too vain perhaps of being loved by rosa duchene now i'm punished for it it's your position that comes between us her lover or her career what woman would hesitate he did not know it but in his tone was the reproach that was her clue. She shivered with joy before she spoke. "'I can't tell you what woman would hesitate,' she said with a laugh. "'What do you mean?' he faltered. "'Supposing,' she said, twisting a piece of his hair round her finger. "'Supposing,' he echoed breathlessly. "'Supposing that once upon a time there was an actress,' who came to South Africa, and met a man she was fool enough to like very much, to love very much, to love as I love you. Suppose they had meant to go to London together, and then, one morning, learnt that the boy was too ill, that the woman must give up everything to stay with him, or go away alone and give up him. 
if through that first dreadful day she wasn't able to decide if just at first she did hesitate if she tried to stamp her love out only to find that it was worth more to her than the stage than her paris than her life if she cried to him willie i'm ashamed forgive me and let me stop what do you think the man would say rosa he gasped i love you i love you i love you she muttered straining him to her you won't have so long to wait as you think i shan't last more than three or four years even here you shall live for ever she swore you shall be immortal they went the following day to view the little house that had delighted her so much it was to be let furnished and the old white-haired negress that she had seen in the garden was prepared to remain as servant they settled to take it then and there and less than a week later they were installed the afternoon that they moved in polly went into town alone she explained that there was something she wanted to buy a shade for the parlor lamp and willie who was vividly interested in the arrangement of their home although he could not see it said let it be a pretty color darling something that'll make the room nice to look at in the evening she left him on the step where she could see him at the moment she reached the gate on her return but when her purchase was made she did not hasten to rejoin him there she turned up adderley street instead into an avenue near the foot there was a big building it was the public library and she entered it please she said nervously to a gentleman who was standing behind the counter i want a criticism of a book of poems it doesn't matter who wrote them but they must be fine poems and the critic must say that the poet's a genius could you help me the gentleman was taken aback what kind of poet he inquired there have been many fine poets do you mean a poet who is still living i really don't mind at all whether he's living or dead said polly impartially so long as he's good enough well we have just received a work that might suit you how would this do he handed her victorian poets by stedman if you go into the reading-room you can look through it she clutched the fat green volume thankfully and taking a chair at one of the tables where there were pens and ink hurriedly skimmed the contents the names looked promising tennyson browning swinburne a host met her eye including dozens of whom she had never heard to her impatience however it soon seemed that the author found more faults than merits in even the best of them nowhere could she come across exactly what she sought at last after infinite pains she selected a lot of appreciative paragraphs and managed to dovetail them into a fairly consistent whole but a panegyric on byron which she saw too late for it to be inserted satisfactorily without her omitting a eulogy of keats detracted from her satisfaction i'm very much obliged she said to the librarian did you find what you wanted he asked curiously yes thank you she said at least it'll do to go on with but i shall often have to come again she now proceeded to the station and she reached the garden as the sun was setting willie was still where she had left him in her hand was a copy of a london paper a paper that he had often referred to with awe and anticipation she put her sheet of fool's cap on the rustic table and gave him the paper sweetheart she said i've brought you your first review he turned very pale his voice was tremulous what do they say what's in it she told him the paper's name i'll read it to you she took a seat by the table and read the minor poetry of the last few years she began is of a strangely composite order we can see that the long popular browning at length has become a potent force as the pioneer of a half dramatic half psychological method whose adherents seek a change from the idyllic repose of tennyson and his followers with this intent and with a strong leaning towards the art studies and convictions of the rossetti group 
a neo-romantic school has arisen in which mr william childers whose reveries is now under our consideration leaps at a bound into the foremost place his songs resemble those of rossetti in terseness and beauty while with browning they escape at times to that stronghold whither science and materialism are not prepared to follow art so complex as mr childers was not possible until centuries of literature had passed and an artist could overlook the field essay each style and evolve a metrical result which should be to that of earlier periods what the music of meyerbeer and rossini is to the narrower range of piccini or gluck all must acknowledge that sic itur et astra is perfect of its kind take this and that exquisite ode to a memory or my soul and i we call them poetry poetry of the lasting sort and attractive to successive generations we believe that they will be read when many years have passed away that they will be picked out and treasured by future compilers she paused that he might breathe half an acre of heaven had fallen into the rondebosch garden and its glory was flooding him after a few seconds she bent again over her manuscript and read on for several minutes to the end when she had finished they did not speak she lay her head on his breast while his soul uttered thanksgiving on the heights to which her lie had lifted him he had touched the pinnacle he was thrilled with an intenser joy than comes to one man among millions a joy so vast that few of us have the imagination to conceive it happy happy you and fame could life give any more the brief cape twilight was beginning to fall and she guided him inside she led him into a chair and kissed him his lips and his sightless eyes your chair in our home she murmured oh and the lampshade here it is what colour did you choose rosa it's couleur de rose said polly and she put it on some months later on the border of Malbray and Rondebosch, there lingered in the last weeks of his life a famous poet. He had never spoken with his publishers, but from time to time they wrote to him in terms of respectful admiration, and then the celebrated actress, who shared his exile and acted as his amanuensis, read their letters to him and cashed the very small drafts that they apologetically enclosed at the primitive shops from which the villa was supplied its tenants were known as mr and mrs childers but as they had not been seen at church none of the neighbours had called on them nor in fact did any one suspect their great importance and as the poet being blind was always attended by the actress he made no acquaintance when he was out he had just published his second work which had enhanced the reputation won by his first the volumes were beloved belongings from the shelf on which they were kept he often took them down and fondled them to a stranger parting the expensive covers the contents might have been startling in view of so much pride he might indeed have been pardoned the impression that he was looking at mavor's spelling-book and a child's history of england but the poet held them with rejoicing. To clasp them was rapture, second only to clasping his companion, a plain young woman whom he addressed by another woman's name and passionately believed most beautiful. End of section 9《セクション10》of《The Man Who Understood Woman》and other stories。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama.《The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories》by Leonard Merrick, Chapter 10. The Child in the Garden. 
when he reached the village of thergrimabes at last and after athens the journey had been extremely trying the curate gathered that miss netterville was out as it was six months since they had met and he had written to her that he was coming her fiance was vexed the innkeeper had laid eager hands on the portmanteau and the traveller signed to him imperatively to put it down no no he exclaimed i must sleep somewhere else if there's another inn to be found in the hole he remembered that it was useless to inquire for one in english upon my word his thoughts ran it's most annoying of course we can't both lodge in the same house and none of these peasants will understand a word i say how very tiresome to be sure really it's most inconsiderate of gertrude to be out when i arrive i shall have to be very firm with her i see that i shall have to speak even more strongly than i intended it was midday and the sun was blazing the straggling white road baked under his dusty boots the heat and the thought that miss netterville would probably return to luncheon to say nothing of the difficulty of seeking accommodation without an interpreter decided the curate to remain for a while a lemon squash he commanded at a venture bring me a lemon squash and then as the order produced only smiles and shrugs he raised a hand to his mouth with a gesture which he felt to be rather southern and graceful the landlord responded volubly and though he brought wine instead the rev aloysius chasel was too thirsty and fatigued to make objections to it he sat in a little vine-clad arbour with the wine on a bench and his portmanteau at his side and was much inclined to wish that he had not left bedfordshire the situation was undignified from first to last he felt it was no less than three years now since gertrude had promised to be his wife and their marriage had been delayed for nothing but the scientific coldness of the young woman's disposition when a girl who was betrothed to a church of england clergyman with private means allowed him to pine for her in his parish while she devoted herself to the study of archaeology abroad it was time for the clergyman to put his foot down thought aloysius and that was what he had travelled from bedfordshire to do meanwhile miss netterville was trudging along the road to greet him with a frown on her intellectual brow she was quite aware that she was treating him unfairly and surmised pretty shrewdly what he had come to say and it would all be a great bore the idea of marriage had never attracted her at any time man other than prehistoric had always been rather repellent to her than the reverse and she wondered why she had been weak enough to disturb her life by becoming engaged she approached the arbour with no enthusiasm hello al she said i didn't expect you so early have you been here long i've been here the best part of an hour replied aloysius it was disappointing to find you were not at home well how are you gertrude aren't you going to kiss me she inclined a cheek awkwardly such physical expressions of good feeling were distasteful to her and she stared at the portmanteau what did you bring your bag out here for she asked why didn't you take it upstairs upstairs echoed the curate it must be taken to another hotel but i can't speak to these people i had to wait till you came in i'm afraid that there's nothing else resembling a hotel for miles she said thergrimabes is rather primitive you know it seems so primitive that i'm dismayed to find you in it but with all your contempt for the conventions i suppose you don't want us to be talked about surely you understand that it's out of the question for us both to sleep under the same roof in the circumstances oh my dear aloysius she cried please spare me the artificialities go to one of the goat herd's cottages if any of them has a bed to offer and you care to lie in it but don't talk to me as if i were an ingenue in bedfordshire i've got beyond that sort of thing have they given you anything to eat lunch will be ready directly we may as well go inside gertrude he began strenuously i've something to say to you and it's just as well to say it at once your letters haven't been very satisfactory over and over again you've left a question of mine unanswered we've been engaged for three years now and i want you to fix a day for our wedding will you marry me next month next month oh no it's impossible but why frankly dear i am losing patience why is it always impossible marriage needn't interfere with your work 
you can write quite as easily when we're married as you do now. In Bedfordshire, she said with a fine smile. I don't approve of the tone in which you mention Bedfordshire, exclaimed Aloysius. I presume that a book may be written in Bedfordshire as well as in Thergramabs, or in Egypt, or any other of the remote places that you've a craze for? The whole thing is preposterous. It looks a little like affectation. It would be preposterous for a girl of twenty-eight to roam about the world unprotected in any case. Unprotected, she echoed. Unprotected? You are talking a language that I've forgotten. Really, your notions are the most antique things in Greece. I say that it would be preposterous for a young girl to roam about the world alone. In any case, you might be robbed and murdered here, and considering that you're engaged to me, it's more preposterous still. It puts me in a very false position, and it's not an easy matter to explain. People have begun to talk. In Bedfordshire? she inquired again. Yes, in Bedfordshire, and they would talk in Bloomsbury or Belgravia or anywhere else. It's not proper, Gertrude. It is thought very improper indeed. You must remember that you are young and pretty and... Oh, don't, she said warily. What an odious word. I'm not accustomed to consider my personal appearance, but I do trust that I'm not pretty. My sister often says that you would be extremely pretty, returned Aloysius, if you didn't strain your hair back and paid more attention to your clothes. But your prettiness is not the point. The main thing is our engagement. You haven't the right to behave like this. You aren't free to indulge your eccentricities. You owe a duty to me. Miss Netterville lit a cigarette and gazed thoughtfully across a mulberry tree. Characteristically, she had made no change in her costume on the day of her lover's arrival, and she had stated a fact when she declared herself indifferent to her appearance as a rule, but in spite of the ill-fitting blouse, the unbecomingly dressed blonde hair, in spite even of the coldly intellectual eyes, she looked a desirable woman. A psychologist might have thought she looked also a woman with potentialities. But Aloysius was not a psychologist. He saw only the obvious. And not the whole of that. Of course I am to blame, she said at last. I know. But then I never pretended to the kind of temperament that you admire. To me, my paramount duty must always be my work. To you, my paramount duty is to do the sort of thing that any other woman could do equally well. It is curious that I appeal to you. To be quite candid, love in its physical aspects is unpleasant to me, quite apart from the fact that marriage would be an abominable hindrance to my studies. I have no gift for domesticity. The prospect of district visiting appalls me, and tea parties bore me to death, and I have no leaning towards maternity. I oughtn't to have promised to marry you at all. I have more important things to do in my life. There are shoals of women capable of adding to the world's population, but the women capable of adding to its store of knowledge are comparatively few. You are expressing yourself very strangely, muttered the curate. Very strangely indeed. If I understand you, you are breaking our engagement off. I don't want to be unkind, she said but I am quite sure that you ought to do better. That is a matter on which you must allow me to judge for myself, on which I did judge for myself when I proposed to you. I could certainly wish that you held more feminine views, and that you did not express the views that you do hold with such unusual bluntness, but for good or ill, I love you. You must admit that to break off our engagement after all this time would be to treat me cruelly. I really don't know what I could say to people. You could say that you had given me up. Everybody would consider you were quite justified. I am not in the habit of telling falsehoods, Gertrude. I should have to acknowledge that you had thrown me over. At the end of three years, after I had travelled to Greece to see you, I had looked forward to a tenderer conclusion to the journey, I must say. He, too, regarded the mulberry tree. I, I am not unreasonable. I quite appreciate your interest in your work. Archaeology is a very interesting subject, I am sure, and... Miss Netterville made a gesture of impatience. Please don't patronize the ages. You mean well, but it's irritating. I was about to explain that if next month would be inconvenient to you on literary grounds, I would cheerfully wait until the month after, said Aloysius, with pained surprise. Let us both make concessions. 
let us say in two months' time. Eh, dearest? We have both let our tongues run away with us, haven't we? Both been a little hasty? What do you say? You shall share my study. You shall have your own shelves in it. Only the other day I was looking at a little bamboo desk in the high street and thinking how admirably it would suit you. I'd write my sermons while you wrote your book, and sometimes we might turn round and read each other what we had done. Wouldn't it be cosy now? Doesn't it sound pleasant? She shuddered and nerved herself for a supreme effort. Al, she stammered, it has been a shocking mistake. I can't marry you. And the curate did not sleep anywhere at all in Thergrimib's. He left it the same evening. When he bade her good-bye, he said, I have released you from your promise, Gertrude, because you forced me to do so. But I shan't cease to long for you, and if you ever change your mind, you must let me know. Think things over after I have gone. I shall always be hoping to hear from you. Then he climbed into the crazy vehicle and was jolted over the white road again, a disconsolate figure beside the portmanteau that had not been unpacked, and Miss Netterville went moodily to her work. Thergrimebs consists of its dilapidated inn and a sprinkling of hovels. Half-naked children swarm in the dust and beg of any misguided tourist who happens to stray there from the towns beyond. Goat herds, dignified in their rags, roll cigarettes pensively, and prematurely old women occasionally appear at the doors and shade their eyes in the sun. These are almost the only signs of activity in Thergrimebs. For the rest, you have silence and the mountains. Miss Netterville made many expeditions up the mountains. Equipped with a scribbling block and a fountain pen, she often wrote among them. One evening, she had now written thirty thousand words, and Aloysius had been gone about a month. She heard the slow sound of hooves. Two quaintly garbed men were riding down the track. They had evidently just observed her, and as she turned, one of them waved his sombrero to her, with an impudent smile. He was the taller of the pair, a swarthy, handsome fellow, with laughing eyes and a big moustache that curled above full, sensual lips. She bent over her manuscript again with a frown, wondering why his glance had affected her so queerly. The men quickened their pace, and then dismounted and advanced to her. Her emotion was pure fear now. She got up, trembling. There is nothing to do. She is alone, said the smaller of the two, a weedy villain with a squint. You will find you have more to do than you think, she boasted coolly. I am armed. So you understand Greek, do you? exclaimed his companion. That's all the better. I like a girl to be able to talk to me. You are going to have a ride with me, my beauty. If you don't come quietly, I shall have to be rough. How is it to be? He learned how it was to be at once. Miss Netterville struck at the handsome face straight from the shoulder, throwing her body into the blow with capital effect, and took to flight as he reeled back. But the next instant he rushed after her. He seized her before she had covered a dozen yards. Now there was no chance to strike him. An arm flung round her held her fast, and she could only scream for help. He swung her off her feet and stumbled with her towards the saddle. His laboring breath was in her face, but his eyes laughed into her own, though the blood that she had drawn was trickling round his mouth. As he rode off with her, crushed against him, she could feel the heaving of his breast under her cheek. They rode some distance with her cheek strained against his breast before he spoke. Anathema ton! What a spitfire you are, he panted. Look what your fist has done. Don't you think you owe me a kiss for that? You brute, she gasped. I'd like to kill you. You're a regular devil of a woman. I didn't know they made them like you with that colored hair. You're hurting my arm, she moaned. I can't bear it any longer. Will you sit still if I don't hold so tight? I couldn't escape even if I jumped off. That's true, said the brigand, but I don't want the job of getting you up again. If I had your weight in gold, my dear, I'd lead an easy life. He slackened his grasp a little and flashed his bold, impudent smile at her, the smile that had shamed her so hotly when she first saw him. Come, it's not disagreeable to be hugged by a man. Own up. It would be very shocking if you could help it, but you can't. Remind yourself that you're not to blame, and then you can have a good time. Where are you taking me? To my hotel, said the facetious outlaw. 
What do you mean? Call it a cave if you like. I'm not proud, and I have a fancy for a quiet spot. But there's room enough for you in it, and food and wine. We'll have a bottle together. Don't look so frightened. I'll release you safe and sound when the ransom is paid. I take my oath. Miss Netterville stared into the twilight. She might tell him that there was no one to ransom her. But if he believed the statement, he would probably be reckless how he treated her, she thought. Her only safeguard was to leave him the illusion that her safety would be paid for heavily. How much do you demand? I shall open my mouth jolly wide. You are a pretty woman. You would be very vexed if I put a low price on you. He broke into a roar of laughter and clasped her more caressingly. His good humor was not without a reassuring effect. The scoundrel was very human, and her horror of him had partially subsided. Indeed, as they rode out on this close embrace, she marveled that she could bear the ignominy of it with such fortitude. It was a long ride. Her thoughts wandered in it, and curious fancies crossed her mind. She thought of Aloysius, and wished that he were different. It occurred to her that it would be pleasant to be clasped to Aloysius like this, always with the proviso, if he were different, and then she reflected that the ride itself would be pleasant if the brigand were a gentleman, and their embrace were right. Insensibly she yielded to it more and more. It grew less repugnant to her, and even, with a shock she realized what she had been feeling, and shivered with self-disgust. We have arrived, said the brigand. He carried her inside. It is nice to carry you, now that you don't struggle, he added. On entering, she was plunged into darkness so intense that she could discern nothing whatsoever. Then she found herself borne into a cave illumined by pendant oil lamps and furnished with considerable comfort. Beyond was a second cleft of light, and she perceived that the cave resembled a suite of rooms communicating with one another by means of apertures in the rock. The man who had assisted in her capture rejoined her now, and three others appeared, who saluted her with quiet satisfaction. There was no excitement, no hint of violence. To her surprise, her reception was as formal as if she had arrived at an inn, as formally as innkeepers the brigands prepared to keep her prisoner. Excepting the captain. The captain, as has been seen, did his business with Bonomi. If not the mildest-mannered man that ever cut a throat, at least he was the most jovial. No gallant ever filled a lady's glass or peeled her figs with more consideration, and when he told the company how valiantly she had defended herself, he testified to her prowess with so much humor that she couldn't restrain a smile. At the same time, it was with no little trepidation that she found herself alone with him again when the meal was finished. It proved necessary to confess that she had no friends in Greece with whom he could communicate, and, moreover, that none of her friends in England was in a position to ransom her. He twirled his moustache thoughtfully when she explained. No lover? he questioned. Rubbish! You mustn't tell me that you have no lover. A woman like you. It is true, she declared. Nor a husband? No. I was to have married, but I changed my mind. Diabole! He had no blood in his veins, or he would have carried you off like me. Well, it seems that I have made a bungle, eh? Women are all liars, but every man is a fool once, and I believe you. So I have had a punch in the face for nothing? That's a nice thing. I have a watch on, she suggested. You can take that if you like. It was a little Swiss watch that had cost thirty shillings. He looked at it and gave a shrug. Is that what you offer me to let you go? I think you are worth more. I have nothing else to offer. Besides, although I haven't any friends to pay a ransom, there are plenty of people to miss me. The search might not do me much good, but it would probably end in your being shot. As you can't hope to make any money by me, you'd be wise to set me free. You have brains, too, under that lovely hair, he remarked, appreciatively. May I offer you a cigarette? No, she said, but she eyed the packet wistfully and wished that her case were in her pocket. Now you are being a little donkey. Why should I wait to drug you with a cigarette when I could tap you on the head with one of these? He touched the pistols in the sash wound round his sturdy waist. You see I am smoking them myself. Take your choice among the lot. 
Miss Netterville and the brigand smoked in silence for a few moments. Then, every man is a fool once, he repeated meditatively, but there must be a limit to his folly. If I set you free like this, what sort of ass would you think me? No better than the wooer who let you change your mind. I should think you had acted like a brave and generous fellow. Ah, you want to flatter me into it, you cunning cat, he said. Do you know that I could love you desperately, my beauty with the yellow hair? I believe I fell in love with you when I felt your fist. I like you for having hit me. I should like you to hit me again. Come and hit me again, beauty with the yellow hair, or sing me a love song. Do you sing? No, she murmured. It's a pity, for you were a passionate woman. You would have sung well. Why did you start? She had started to discover that this bandit knew her better than she had known herself until an hour ago. I didn't start, she answered. Fire has no heat, and there is no water in the rivers. All things are as the right woman says, he rejoined. So you did not start, beauty, though you have shaken the ash off your cigarette on to your knees. Well, I will sing to you instead. I will sing at your feet while my poor comrades have only their cards to play with. It is good to be the captain sometimes. It is good tonight. He twanged the strings and broke into a serenade. The deep voice was untrained, but rich and sweet. After the first surprise, Miss Netterville forgot who it was that sang. It was an artist on the stage, a lover below a window, almost it was her own lover, whom she loved. The music knocked at her heart, and no trace of the smile that discomfited her so was on the handsome face now. Sentiment idealized the ruffian. When he finished, she was very pale. Are you as cold as the woman of the song? he whispered. Yes, she muttered. I am as cold. You lie, he cried. You love me and the next instant she snatched a pistol from his sash. I'll kill myself, she gasped. She thought her wrist was broken as she dropped the weapon. He picked it up and paced the cave with agitation, smiting his chest and ejaculating. Meanwhile, the English lady marveled why she didn't loathe him. Will you go? he exclaimed suddenly. You shall go now, if you wish it. I swear you shall be guided back. I love you, I adore you, I implore you to stay. Do you wish to go? She bowed her head. I wish to go. He called to the men, and she heard their wonderment, their departing footsteps, at last the clip-clop sound of the hoofs outside. All this time the captain had stood brooding silently. Now he raised his head, and she saw with emotion that tears were in his eyes. Goodbye, Zuemu, he said. Oh, she faltered. Did you really love me then? He opened his arms, and Miss Netterville gave herself to them with impetuous lips. All is ready for the lady, came the shout. They are waiting for you, said the brigand sadly. There, there's no hurry for a minute, Miss Netterville heard herself reply. Before she left him, he assured her that her escort might be trusted, and no mishap befell her on the road. But she had lost her nerve. A few days later, she returned to England and, perhaps she no longer considered protection so superfluous, she married Aloysius the following month, though he did not deem it necessary to inform him of her adventure. They have been married for some years now, and get on together as well as most people. Aloysius has obtained an excellent living, and the eldest of their children is a little son, who engrosses his mother's attention to the exclusion of archaeology. If it were not for her son's favorite game, the vicar's wife might think less often of her strange experience, but the boy tilts his straw hat like a sombrero and sticks a pop-gun in his sash and pretends that the summer-house is the brigand's cave. At such times Aloysius remarks humorously that a little brigand is inappropriate to a vicarage garden, and the lady's eyes are wide. End of section 10「Section number 11 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. 
Chapter 11. A Letter to the Duchess. You said to me last night, Duchess, you are a great musician, Sokolowski, but a great musician may be a great fool. I had vexed you. If I should not know that, forgive me. Perhaps it is common of me to recognize that I vexed you. I shall always be ignorant of the best manners. Pray be indulgent to my ignorance. Pray let me write to you boldly, because I have something to say. But how difficult it is! I am a vulgarian who can express himself only by his violin. I want to say that when you looked at me so kindly, I was not the dolt and ingrate that I seemed. I was very proud, very honored. If I appeared insensible of your interest, it was because I had just been stricken by a grief which I dared not hint. I arrived at your house late last night. You will be revolted to learn what delayed me. When my recital was over, and I had escaped from the fashionable ladies who scrambled to kiss my hands and pull buttons from my coat as keepsakes, I hurried to a minor music hall to hear a girl in tinsel sing a trashy song. I hurried there because I loved her, Duchess, and I had much to think of when I left. To understand what was in my heart when I reached your drawing room, you must read my love story from the beginning, my very vulgar love story that will disgust you. Most of the things that you have seen about me in the papers were false, anecdotes invented by my agent. The public ask for anecdotes of their favorite artists, and it is business to give the public what they want. I generally play the music that they want, though it is seldom the music that I like best. I say that most of the things you have heard about me were false, but this much is true. My father was a peasant, and I have fiddled in a fair. I was happy. I have been told of artists who suffered agonies in their youth, always tortured by ambition and dismayed by their obscurity. With me, it was quite different. I was more joyous in a tent than I am now on the platforms. I even knew at the time that I was happy. That says much. Ungrateful, perhaps I sound to you? Still, I shall be frank. I was 13 when I first heard the words, you will be famous. I was on my way to buy some apples, and the discussion that detained me bored me a great deal. So ignorant was I that I swear to you, fame said no more to me than that one day I should fiddle with a roof of wood over my head, and that storekeepers and farmers would spell my name from a bill at the doors. My patron had me educated. To him I owe not only my position in the musical world, but the fact that I am able to write this letter. I shall not weary you by describing the years of study. When I began to understand what lay before me, my apprenticeship looked like an endless martyrdom. More than once, I was at the point of fleeing from it. There is, they say, a special department of providence for the protection of fools. It is providence, no wisdom of my own, that I have to thank that I am not still a vagrant scraping to villagers among the show wagons. The plans mapped out for me succeeded in spite of myself. At last the time arrived when it was said, Now we will commence. Of course, I had come to my senses before this. So far from hankering after the tents of my boyhood, I was ashamed to remember that I had ever played in them. So far from picturing fame as the applause of shopkeepers in a shed, I thirsted for something more than the reception accorded me at my debut. Ambition devoured me now. If I have the right to praise myself for anything, it is for the devotion with which I worked during the five years that followed. Well, I made a furor. Audiences rained roses on me and struggled to reach the platform. Great ladies invited me to their receptions and bent their eyes on me as if I were a god. I found it frightfully confusing. Under my veneer, under my fashionable suit, I was still the peasant who had held his cap for coppers. I discovered that it was necessary for me to do more than master my art, that I was required to say interesting things to people who frightened me. My popularity suffered a little because I could not do it. The agent was furious at my bashfulness. You must speak to the ladies as if you were in love with them, he told me, 
Or if you cannot do that, be rude. Make an effect somehow. You answer as if you were a servant. Many of my eccentric remarks that you have heard, Duchess, have been composed with difficulty and practiced with care. The world will not have us as we are. My agent often returns a portrait poster of me to the printer with the instructions, put more soul into the eyes. I am coming to my love story. It was no further back than last year that I first met her. I had given a recital at Blythe Point and was remaining there for a few days rest. One evening, I went to a variety of entertainment in the pavilion on the pier. In the bill were three girls described as the three sisters Clicquot. They appeared as theater attendants, the program sellers who show you to your box, and sang to a rather plaintive air that they once hoped to be stars themselves. And then, having blossomed into gauze and spangles, they burlesqued melodrama. After their turn, Two of the trio came into the stalls, and, by chance, I spoke to one of them. A strong man had broken a sixpence in halves and thrown the pieces over the footlights. The girl asked me to let her see the piece that I had picked up. I do not suppose I exchanged twenty words with her, and certainly I gave no thought to the incident. But a night or two later, I drifted onto the pier again and came face to face with her after the performance was over. She greeted me gaily. Hello, have you been in front? No, I said, I am only strolling. Where are your sisters? Are they really your sisters? Oh no, she answered. It's Nina Clicquot's show. Good name to choose, eh? The other girl, Eva Jones, and I are engaged by her, that's all. This is my card. From a battered perch, she took a card on which was printed, Miss Betty Williams, the three sisters Clicquot. We were near the entrance to the buffet. Will you come and have a drink? I asked. Oh, I don't think I will, thanks, she said. I'm waiting for Eva. I might miss her. Oh, you'd better come, I said. We went in and sat down at one of the tables. She did not strike me as particularly good-looking then. The spell of her face lay in its changefulness, and as yet I had not seen it change, for her capabilities as an actress were of the slightest. I saw merely a pale, slim girl, becomingly dressed in some dark stuff that was rather shabby. When she lifted her brandy and soda, a fingertip showed through a glove. I wondered why I had brought her in, and was glad that there was no crowd to recognize me. It wasn't until she told me so that I was sure she recognized me herself. She said, I have never heard you play. I should love to. Did you get many people in down here? I couldn't help smiling. Yet it had a pleasant ring, that question. It revived the past, the days when I used to see the takings divided on the drum. Oh, she exclaimed, laughing. I forgot. Of course you did. I'm not used to talking to big guns. But there was no embarrassment in her apology. She might have been living among big guns all her life. How long have you been at it? I asked her. The halls? Three years, she said. I was on the stage for a little while, not that I was up to much. I was the starving heroine once. The manager said I was the worst leading lady he had ever seen, but that I looked the part because I was all bones. I am a skeleton, aren't I? I chucked the stage. The halls pay much better, and my voice isn't bad. Of course, it's not a trained voice, but it isn't too bad, eh? We have two shows a night next week. That means five pounds to me. Good for little Betty. By the way, she was not little. What do you do with the money? One must say something. Oh, I've plenty to do with it, she said. A husband to keep? Give us a chance, she laughed. No, but mother doesn't make much by the shop anymore. She's a costumier, and there are the kids to bring up. I have two young brothers. She did well once. I used to go up west to try for engagements, dressed to kill. She lent me the models to put on. I often didn't have a twopence in my pocket, but I looked a treat. The only thing was, I was so afraid of its raining, then we couldn't sell the model. You've had hard times, I said, interested. She nodded gravely. Rough. I've always found very good pals, though. 
When I went into the course at the regalia, I and a friend of mine had an ascent between us for bus fares, and there was an old Johnny, one of the syndicate, who took to us. Quite straight, he said. Look here, I know you two girls aren't getting enough to eat. I've booked a table at the truck, and you're both to lunch there right through the rehearsals. If you can't get away for lunch, it's to be dinner, but one square meal a day the two of you must have regularly, or there'll be rows. Mind, it isn't to be a meal for more than two. Her face lit with laughter. There were some boys in the chorus just as stony as we were. My friend would lunch one day, I'd lunch the next, we'd each take a boy in turn. But the old man found out what was going on, and the trot was off. I've had cases of champagne sent to me, if you please. He was a wine merchant's son, wanted to marry me. His screw in the business was about a pound a week. Nice little fellow. He always called me Jack. He used to say, I can't come in the pit to see the show tonight. I haven't got a bob. But have a case of champagne, Jack. I'll send you one round. It doesn't cost me anything. I liked it. For years, I had conversed with only two kinds of women. The women who awed me and the women who were awed. In five minutes, I was as spontaneous as she. Her tones were, for the most part, very pleasant. And now that she was animated, the play of her features fascinated me. When we had finished our drinks, we sauntered round and round the pavilion. The performing birds are on, she said as we caught the music. I hate that show. I hate an audience for standing it. Don't they know it's cruel? Performing birds make me think of the first bird you see die. You're a child. It's generally the first time you've looked at death. You bury your bird in the garden, and you line a grave with flowers, so that the horrid earth shan't touch it. Her voice fell to a whisper. By the burst of applause that reached us in the moonlight, I knew that the pavilion was packed. That's Heracles, the strong man, she said as we listened again. What did you think of him? He's in love with my sister. I mean Eva Jones. He wanted to kiss her, and she put on side. Oh, Eva was very haughty. Sir, how dare you? He had hold of her finger and he drew her to him as if she had been a piece of paper. It was so funny to see her going. He worshipped the ground she walks on, fact. That was the reason his challenge night was a frost. Didn't you hear about his challenge night? He bet that no twelve men in Blythe Point could pull him over the line. Then he got drunk because she wouldn't have anything to do with him, and they pulled him all over the place. It cost him ten pounds, beside his reputation. He cried. Ah, little girl, he said to her, it is all through you. It was amazing that on the stage she could not act. As I heard her tell this story, I would have sworn she was a born comedian. The exaggerated dignity of Miss Jones, its ludicrous collapse, the humiliation of the strong man, she brought the scenes before me. Go on, I begged. Talk some more. But before she could talk much more, the obdurate Miss Jones appeared. I was presented and wished them good night. I could have seen them to their lodging, but, well, Miss Jones's attire was not to my taste, and she had forgotten to take the makeup off her eyes. I am writing more than I intended. I had no idea my explanation would be so long. The next night, I did walk to their lodging with them. It was Saturday, their last night in the town. On Monday, they were to sing in a London suburb. Miss Jones had to leave a parcel with an acquaintance at the Theatre Royale, and, in her absence, Betty Williams and I paced the street alone. For a quarter of an hour, perhaps. She was looking forward to the week at home. She was serious tonight. She talked to me of her mother and the boys. I said I hoped she would find them well and we shook hands. Goodbye. The incident seemed closed, but I went away with an impression I had never experienced before, the impression of having met someone who ought to have been my very good friend. When I breakfasted on the morrow, I felt blank in realizing that her train had already gone. 
Every day I had to combat a temptation to run up to that suburb. When my holiday came to an end, I wondered if she was in town still. By a music hall paper, I ascertained that the three sisters Clicquot were in Derby. Each week I bought the paper to learn the movements of the three sisters Clicquot. In each week I told myself it would be absurd of me to follow her so far. Eventually, I followed her to Yorkshire. What a town! The grey grim streets, the clatter of the clogs, the women's hopeless faces under the shawls. I put up at a commercial hotel, there was nothing else, and was directed to the Empire. Their name was far down the program. Number 10, the Three Sisters Clicquot. I began to think that I should never reach it. Number 8 proved to be a conjurer, and my heart sank as I beheld the multitude of articles that he meant to use before he finished. Number 9 was a troop of acrobats. A dozen times they made their bows and skipped off, only to skip on again and do some more. At last, the number 10 was displayed. The little plaintive symphony stole from the orchestra. The three sisters filed on, Eva's Jones, next Miss Clicquot, then Betty. I wondered if she would notice me. I saw her start. She smiled. I was so pleased that I had gone. She talked presently in the passage under the stage. She was very much surprised. I did not tell her that I was there only to meet her again. Once more, I walked with her and Eva Jones to the door. In the morning, I called on them. There were luncheons in the private room that I, I had been able to secure at the hotel. I went to tea with them at their apartments. In fine, I was very much in love, and I knew that I had been a fool. I knew it for a reason which will be difficult for you to credit, Duchess. This girl, who took a brandy and soda with a stranger in a bar, who accepted little presents from others, and dined with men who had only one motive for inviting her, remained perfectly virtuous. In different classes there are different codes. She did not regard her behavior as wrong. More, if she had committed the act which she knew to be wrong, she would have broken her heart. No matter how much a man cares for a girl, she said to me once, he can't have her any more sacred than she holds herself at the beginning. A girl saves herself for a man she is thinking of. She hasn't seen him. In all probability, she never will see him. But she is saving herself for him, the imaginary man, from her head to her heels. You shouldn't tell me I shouldn't do this, and I shouldn't do the other. I don't do any harm. If you knew how dull it is on tour, you'd understand my taking all the fun I can get. When a fellow asks me to lunch, I go. I say I'll go with another girl. That tells him everything, doesn't it? I swear to God, I've only let one man kiss me in my life. And then I only did it out of pity, because he was so cut up. A man is never dangerous till he's beaten. Do you know that? Well, I was not prepared to marry her, and she could be nothing to me if I didn't. I left Yorkshire with the firm intention of never seeing her any more. However, I missed her dreadfully, and at the end of a month, I succumbed again. I went to Lancashire this time. The same impatience in my stall, the same quiver of expectancy at the plaintive introduction that was so familiar now, the same throb as the three girls appeared. Why should I bore you with the details? I was with her all day, every day. Tea and chatter in the lodging became an institution, and we grew serious only when the melancholy dusk signaled her departure for the hall. She was not fascinated by her career. How I hate going in, she murmured sometimes, as we reached the artist's entrance, with a group of loafers spitting on the curb. And I sat in front, just to see the turn, and talked to her again between the first performance and the second, in the passage at the foot of the dirty steps, where such draughts poured through the slamming door, and the gas jet blew crooked in its cage. She was fond of me. I knew it. I had only to ask her to marry me. I knew that her consent wouldn't be due to my position. There were moments when I was very near to asking her. But I was Sokolowski, and she a third-rate variety artist. I shuddered to think what the society ladies would say if their god stooped. For that matter, 
what everybody would say. No woman could have been more different than the wife I had pictured. Yet no woman had ever been so truly a companion to me. Always a bohemian at heart, I had naturally fallen in love with the bohemian. But when he draws a portrait of the wife that he desires, every man is conventional. Besides, you, and great ladies like you, had made me a snob. She drove with me to the station on the day I left. She knew I wouldn't go to her again. I heard it in her voice. That was the only time I felt dull when I was with her. We both could have said so much and were allowed to say so little. I remember the look in her eyes as the train crept from the platform. I shall always remember the look in her eyes as she smiled on the platform. Even a weak man may be strong sometimes. In the wrong place, I stuck to my resolve. At first, I still glanced at the encore just to know where she was, but before long I denied myself this too. My American tour started soon afterwards. The change helped me while it lasted, but when I came back the struggle was as bad as ever. Six months had passed, and yet every day I hungered to see her. I was desperate. I didn't know what to do to keep myself in hand. Duchess, my motive in addressing you is to write the truth, even the truth that one blushes to acknowledge. When I welcomed the dawn of your interest in me, I turned to you as a chance of forgetting her. I did not mean to prove so obtuse as I appeared last night. Perhaps a gentleman might have seized the chance too, but, I suppose, only a cad would own it to you afterwards. And I couldn't forget. I never responded to your gaze without wishing it were hers. I resented the very gowns that you received me in because she was so poorly dressed. I hated myself for being in your drawing room while she was trudging through the rain. My God, it's awful to think like that of a woman, to have the thought of her beset you as you open your eyes in the morning, to think till you're worn out with thinking of her, and pray to think of something else, to think of her till you want to escape from your own mind. Tolerate me a little longer. I have nearly done. Last Saturday, it was a year since I had seen her. I broke down. I was ready to make her my wife. I wondered if she would look as pleased as she used to look when she saw me. And then I froze at the thought that the three sisters Clicquot might be abroad, that they might have vanished altogether. When I searched the encore again, I... There were emotions. The three sisters Clicquot. I found it. They were in Portsmouth on Saturday. Yesterday they were to be in town. It was impossible for me to go to Portsmouth. My prayer was that, after my recital yesterday, I may reach the London Hall before she left. I had no means of knowing whether their turn would be late or early. All through that recital I was torn with the fear that I might miss her. The audience delayed me beyond endurance. I was trembling when I escaped from them. I stumbled into the carriage and told the man to drive like mad. He couldn't find the stage door, and, too impatient to keep still, I leapt out and went to the box office. It was all right. They hadn't been on yet. There could be no chance to speak to her until the turn was over. Just as I used to do, I sat down to wait in the stalls. Just as I used to do, I read the name of the three sisters Clicquot in a program and wished that the preceding turn didn't last so long. I had taken it for granted that they would be giving a different song now, and my heart tightened at the greeting of that familiar symphony again. For an instant, I could not look at the stage. I knew, with my head bent, the moment when the three girls filed on. I knew where they were moving, how they were standing. Now the note that they were going to sing. I looked up for Betty's face and saw a stranger. Oh, the horrible woman, the low, horrible woman. And I had to watch her. I watched her in spite of myself. The audience laughed and shouted while I sat there with the sickness of terror in me, while I watched that horrible woman posturing in Betty's place and wearing the frock that Betty had worn. Afterwards, I found the artist's entrance, as I had proposed to find it. 
Only I asked for Eva instead of Betty. She came down to me smiling in her stage costume. Who'd have thought of seeing you? She exclaimed as we shook hands. I was just going to change. How are you? I said dully, and our eyes questioned each other. I suppose you know about Betty, she said. I could only look at her. She's dead, she told me. The last turn was on. A comedian was bellowing doggerel. I listened to bars of it before I whispered, Dead? She got typhoid when we were in Lincoln. She died last month. Hadn't you heard? No. It's still the Three Sisters Clicquot on the bills. Oh yes, of course. It's always the Three Sisters Clicquot. The new girl's not as good as Betty was, don't you think so? I don't know. The comedian was dancing now. I heard the rattle of his feet. Shabby, pasty-faced men kept hurrying past us through the passage, up the dirty steps. The door at the top was slamming, and the gas jet blew crooked in its cage. It was strange to be among these things and not see Betty. Goodbye, I said. Did she ever talk of me after I went? Sometimes she wasn't the girl to say much. Betty liked you, though. I liked Betty, I said. Well, well, she said, I must get along and change. Buck up. And then I went to you, your grace. I had promised to play to your guests, and I could not break my word. But you must understand what I was feeling while I played, that my thoughts were in a grave. And when we were alone, you may understand that, though you are charming and beautiful and a duchess, and exalted me by your caprice, I could not be guilty of that outrage, that adultery towards the dead. Most humbly, I beg you to believe that I am grateful for the honor you have done a man who was unworthy, who was loyal neither to you nor to her. You will never pardon me for this letter. Goodbye. End of chapter 11「Section 12 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Prince in the Fairy Tale. The carriage is at the door, madam. How strange that still sounds when the solemn butler says it. To me, Rosie MacLeod, I go, wrapped in furs, down the great staircase, past the two footmen, whose pomposity, if I may own the truth, rather frightens me, and enter my carriage in a dream. For a few minutes my grandeur seems unreal. I am remembering winters when I used to shiver in a spring jacket and to pan my summer straw. I feel as Cinderella must have felt on her way to the ball, and, indeed, I hold my history no less fairy-like than hers, and my hero no less charming than her prince. I want to write the tale and to think that far away in dear old england other girls will read it i ought to explain that i am writing in new york a city that i never expected to see in all my life but let me begin at the beginning the beginning then was a draughty flat in west kensington in looking back at it i see always a delicate sweet-faced woman sitting by the fire and a dark slip of a girl sketching at a table covered by a faded green cloth the woman was my mother the girl was i i know now that i had very little talent 
but i meant to be an artist when i sold my copy of shoeing the bay mare one morning while i was working at the national i was prouder of myself than i have ever been since pray don't think i am vain of it now copies of that were rather easy to sell and the girls in my time were accordingly eager for their turn to begin it i only mention the matter because it was the first and the last money that my mother saw me earn dear little mother but we were very happy together weren't we although we were poor dear little mother if you were living to-day what lovely lovely things you should have at her death i was left quite alone it is true that i had some second cousins but i had not met them and they showed no desire to meet me then from one source and another i had about three hundred pounds and in my ignorance i expected to support myself by my brush before the sum had melted when i was free of the flat i took a lodging in bayswater and continued to study at a life class excepting that i worked and hoped and very often cried there is nothing to tell you of the next two years then one afternoon i saw miss niblett in kensington gardens she was an artist who had long been an acquaintance of ours as far back as i remember she used to drop in to tea about twice a year and talk of the great things she was going to do she never seemed to grow any older nor to do the great things she was a spirited chirpy little woman and when she settled in paris both my mother and i had missed her occasional visits very much in the broad walk she greeted me as brightly as ever and we strolled to the round pond and talked for an hour she was returning in a week's time and i heard that she was living there in the cheapest possible way occupying a studio and bedroom in the quarter called montparnasse and marketing and cooking for herself she told me of the great things she was going to do why don't you come back with me child she asked presently come and study in paris and then you won't be so lonely wouldn't you like to i should love it i faltered with a heart thump but but what i don't know for one thing i can't speak french tut cried miss niblett hundreds of the girls don't speak french you'll learn for a minute we sat silent gazing at the toy ships sailing across the pond then she added briskly you had better come all right i said and that was how i went yes i went to study in paris and to live in the queerest fashion imaginable our rooms were up ninety-eight stairs of a dingy house in a dilapidated court at six o'clock in the morning the court used to wake and be so exceedingly busy and cheerful withal that any one there would have been ashamed to lie abed to begin with there was the rushing of water outside for tap there was none and one by one the tenants clattered to a pump with a bucket to obtain their supply for the day then the hawkers made their appearance each with his own peculiar chant it arrives it arrives the mackerel who wishes for my fine mackerel this morning and the mussels the mussels most delicious and some milk some fresh milk and i mustn't forget the noise that was made by shaking out the rugs from every window i have never seen a city that opens its eyes so good-humouredly as paris in pictures it is always shown to us at night with its myriad lamps shining or in the afternoon when it is frivolous and its fountains flash but in my own little unimportant opinion if one would know paris at its sweetest and its best one should get up very very early and behold it smiling when it wakes to work i've told you that we lived up ninety-eight stairs i must tell you something about the people who lived on the lower landings 
of course the lower the landing the higher the rent but none of our neighbours had an air of opulence need i say it all of them bustled to the pump with pails all of them cooked their own meals and it was rather a rare occurrence i believe for everybody in that house to cook a dinner on the same day on the floor below ours there was a madame troquet who painted fans and chocolate boxes for a livelihood the expensive and gorgeous boxes covered with satin which fortunate people have sent to them at christmas and on their birthdays still lower there was an american youth who was studying medicine i am afraid he did not study it very hard i should be sorry to think that if i were ill in america one day he might be called in to prescribe for me lower still there were two young frenchmen one of them wrote verses and his companion made sketches for some of the papers and there was another american who had moved in while miss niblett was in london so good-looking he was about seven and twenty and oh he was shabby it made my heart ache to see the threadbare clothes he wore even there where i had come to take threadbare clothes for granted i used to meet him at the pump sometimes and then he always insisted on carrying my pail for me i felt horrid to let him do it i guessed he didn't have enough to eat and needed all his strength to drag his own pail up the stairs not that he showed any signs of weakness he would mount beside me as gaily as if he liked the work and the bucket were no more than a featherweight he seemed quite strong and happy and i have told you how nice looking he was haven't i a girl cannot allow a young man to carry a pail of water up ninety-eight stairs for her without thanking him i mean it was impossible for me just to say thank you as if he had handed me the toast or picked up my sunshade of course we spoke as we went up the stairs he told me he was an art student like me and i thought that no poor young man had ever been more courageous and contented with his lot if one call a little a lot he talked as if he loved the life to listen to him one would have imagined that poverty bohemianism he termed it was a kind of treat a privilege for the select like a ticket for the royal enclosure i used to forget to pity him till i looked at his coat i think you are very brave i couldn't help saying once brave he exclaimed why how's that where's the hardship i think it's just the right thing for a man to carry home his bread for breakfast and dine for a franc when he's flush it's glorious teaches him to be independent and you he went on in a different tone is it very hard for you oh i am one of the wealthy for the time being i laughed i have quite a fortune as yet what shall you do when you have squandered your millions people did not stand on ceremony with one another at our pump paint i said nobody to help you he asked my own right hand said i he regarded it ruefully the prospect is not so charming as the hand he murmured is it it's glorious i declaimed for a girl to carry home her bread for breakfast and dine for a franc when she's flush no it isn't he said for a girl it's a different thing altogether you'll excuse my contradicting you besides even a franc wants earning when you have no allowance from home i shall sell my work i declared valiantly in those days i always spelt my work with a capital w i guess pictures take a deal of selling sometimes i suppose you mean that you don't think i shall ever paint well i haven't seen anything you have done he answered how could i mean that here we are at the top we had reached our door and miss niblett was standing there a stiff little figure of disapproval 
considering that i was only showing the young man simple civility in return for his extreme kindness i am bound to say that miss niblett's later remarks were absurd miss niblett said she should go downstairs with the pail herself in future when she came up the next morning i was all ears was she alone no i could hear her speaking and then there were steps as someone turned away that mr martin is certainly polite she said as she entered he insisted on bringing it up for me who did i inquired loftily that mr martin she repeated who else do you suppose would take the trouble oh i didn't know his name was martin i explained you seem to be on very friendly terms with him tut said miss niblett don't be ridiculous child and make haste with the coffee do though i did not meet mr martin at the pump any more i very often chanced to meet him on my way home from the art school each time i liked him better and of course i knew i wasn't doing all the liking myself he never said anything but a girl can always tell can't she when i heard of the shifts that some of the young men in the house were put to for a meal and thought that his straits must be as cruel as any of them i could have cried there were moments when food almost choked me as i pictured him sitting half starved in his room his chin sunk on his breast i never saw him with his chin sunk on his breast never despondent in any way but i was sure his buoyancy was just put on to hide his sufferings when i had been living in the court for about two months the sight of his coat and the idea of his privations proved too bad to be borne we had become such comrades by then for the walk from the school took a long time especially if one didn't walk very fast that i thought he would let me speak like a sister to him mr martin i murmured one day as we went home i want you to do me a great favour please why certainly he said right now what is it well i said we are both students and we are very good friends and it's all nonsense for you to reply that because i'm a girl you can't regard me as a real chum and when i had stammered that i turned red and gazed at the tips of my shoes but i haven't replied anything of the sort he said with a laugh i'm waiting to hear what you want me to do you won't be offended i asked i'm sure i could never be offended with you he said earnestly or hurt i added i'm sure you would never hurt me well then i want you to let me lend you a little money till things are better will you his eyes widened at me and then he blushed he did he blushed i saw the colour spread right up to his temples i hated myself though i had done my best to say it all delicately i am very very grateful to you said mr martin believe me i'm not in need of money but you're a chum indeed oh you're too proud to confess i gulped and there was a lump in my throat that i couldn't swallow we were crossing one of the bridges and i stopped and looked at the sun sinking while i tried to blink my tears back he stood there by me and was quiet for a minute when he spoke i hardly recognized his voice it trembled so much will you tell me something he whispered i nodded why did you say this to me because i know you are poor and i'm poor and can understand but i could spare a small sum easily and i thought you'd be great enough to let me help you you have helped me he answered helped me to ask you a question that i hadn't the pluck to put dear little chum do you care for me yes i told him 
enough to wait till a pauper can afford to marry you yes i told him i love you said mr martin with all my heart and the boats were sailing down the river and a crowd was on the bridge but i couldn't see them in all paris there was no one but ourselves we were alone in the sunset he and i i knew what miss niblett would say and she said it tut she warned me that i was doing a rash an improvident thing and after she had reproached herself for bringing me to france and prophesied a hopeless waiting and the workhorse for me by turns she hugged me splendidly and wished me happiness there you have miss niblett then my fiance was invited up to supper and we were merry i was annoyed to see that while i was making the salad she had examined him about his prospects of course i did see it when i came back by his embarrassed look and miss niblett's air of dissatisfaction still i repeat that we were merry that evening although i could not help regretting that i had so often spoken to her of my fear that he didn't get enough to eat it wasn't quite nice while we sat at supper to think she was reflecting that a substantial meal was by way of being a novelty to my lover it hurt me that good little miss niblett though she had let me prepare the supper so that she might have a chance to pester him with questions she made amends by clearing the things away herself and shut the door behind her that was the first time he kissed me after all that has happened since the scene remains clear and living to me the little lamp-lit room half studio half parlour the scent of the mignonette in the open window and the promised land i saw beyond when i'm old and grey it will be living to me still his voice his touch and the joy that was singing in my heart and by and by we all went out i have pennies to spend pleaded my lover let's be lavish could i be wise on such a night away we sped from montparnasse into the paris where the cabs darted and the cafes glittered and we had syrups and fizzy waters under the trees in the starlight and made believe that we were rich i thought miss niblett must have been in love herself once upon a time she was so tactful it was a long ramble that we took like children we joked outside a jeweller's window pretending to choose the costliest of engagement rings like vagrants we loitered by a great house where a reception was being held yes we stood there on the pavement and watched the grand people arriving and for the first time for hours i remembered we were poor why aren't we going to a party how lovely it would be are you keen on parties my lover asked perhaps i could take you to one this week shall i try a party like that i laughed yes please ah oh, well he replied i can't guarantee that it will be quite like that still i guess it will be rather fun will miss niblett go too i she exclaimed don't talk nonsense i wonder he said which is the best place in this city to hire a suit of dress clothes for the evening my social gaieties have given me no cause to find out that was all we turned homeward i thought with miss niblett that he had been talking nonsense imagine how surprised i was to hear him revive the subject after a day or two well it's all right he said i've managed it we're invited invited i echoed invited where why to the festivity tomorrow night but i cried you didn't really mean it did you you didn't suppose i'd go the people are strangers to me oh that's nothing he answered in society they often go to strangers parties it's rather chic 
well we aren't in society i reminded him i'm not chic i can't go junketing with a lot of students i've never seen before you'll be a bohemian rosie he said you don't seem to catch on to the tone of the quarter at all now do come if you're a good girl you shall be rewarded you see i have my clothes ready and it would disappoint me some not to get a chance to show em off he made such a point of it that i promised but i wasn't pleased besides being reluctant to intrude i was annoyed at the thought of having put him to expense also the idea of his going to a party in a hired suit was distasteful to me i went to my school as cross as two sticks early the next morning he ran upstairs in a great hurry to borrow our newspaper i wondered why he wanted it for he always read la matine and we took the new york harem however we were busy and let him have it though we hadn't looked at it ourselves yet we were busy examining the white silk frock that i meant to wear i was for freshening it with some new tulle and miss niblett kept saying that it would be folly to spend the money the argument lasted such a long time that i didn't go to school at all that day miss niblett won and then behold an afternoon of amazement as i was boiling the kettle there came a rap at the door and whom should i admit but a stylish young woman with a note and a large box the note consisted of four words frills for the fairest and the box contained a dress but my dears a dress that i can't describe to you i should need a page to do it justice such a dress as the fairy godmother might have created when she changed a pumpkin to a chariot what does it mean i gasped is that from him stammered miss niblett oh don't you know it's from him i cried hotly now i see why you wouldn't let me buy the tool but how can he have paid for it and how could you encourage him i thought she was going to cry rosie she whimpered he told me he wanted to give you a dress and asked me to help him but i never imagined he meant a dress like that i didn't indeed how could i oh my child look at the name on the lid look where it comes from mademoiselle would try it on suggested the young woman coolly what does she say i demanded she spoke french of course it is to be hoped she didn't understand english she says you had better try it on this is madness i faltered i looked from the young woman to miss niblett i looked from miss niblett back to the frock madness i repeated and tried it on oh what a frock there were exclamations and pins and stitches and in the middle of it all came another bang at the door a porter in uniform stood on the landing he too bore a note and a box he too behaved as if miracles happened every day in the year four words again swayed for the sweetest gloves if you please a stack of them with i can't tell you how many buttons and the faintest odour of violets i know now that in the whole of paris there is only one shop that sells gloves quite like those and that they are famous all over the world a knock at the door by this time we opened it speechlessly we just glanced at each other and tottered and again four words bonds for the best i tore off the brown paper with hands that shook under the brown paper tissue paper under the tissue paper the glint of velvet pale blue i drew out a jewel case i pressed a spring and oh gracious screamed miss niblett shimmering on the satin with which the case was lined lay a rope of pearls fit 
for an empress not even a string a rope three times round the neck it would wind and hang almost to the waist we fell on to the sofa dazed are they real miss niblett panted oh my dear give me the case my dear they are real i'm sure they are oh my dear they must be worth thousands upon thousands of pounds what does it all mean and for the rest of the day not a glimpse of my fiance not a message from him monsieur martin was out the concierge told us when we inquired it had been arranged that he should come for me at ten o'clock and at half past eight i began to dress we lit every candle in the flat that evening at five minutes to ten i was ready all but one glove we sat trembling with curiosity then we heard him singing on the stairs and he tapped as the hour struck now we both cried perhaps you'll explain if his clothes weren't his own he had discovered a remarkable establishment i noted that despite my dizziness i fancy i have mentioned how nice-looking he was but i had never really done him justice before he was worthy to take his frock out he stood there admiringly presenting a bouquet explain he murmured oh you mean those things i sent you my dear ladies patience is one of the most beautiful of virtues let us cultivate it rosie you're a dream of loveliness i thought perhaps you'd like a few flowers shall we go and we went i had expected to see a cab at the corner there was a brougham with a footman waiting on the curb not mine said the man of mystery i assure you hired like your clothes i flashed much more so he said serenely would you prefer the window up or down dear either i said if you'll tell me where we're going why to the party he replied i thought you knew you don't ask me to believe we're going to a student's supper dressed like this well no he said i guess we'd be a trifle overpowering eh but i never told you it was a student's supper that student was an invention of your own we rolled along luxuriously to my bewilderment it seemed that all the capital was astir that night crowds crowds everywhere in the brilliant streets paris was a panorama of lights and faces after a while we began to move more slowly other vehicles impeded us i could hear the jangling of horses bits the orders of the police we're drawing close said my lover the clatter of hoofs was to right and left of us now from the window i saw the glare of carriage lamps caught glimpses of great ladies gowns and jewelled heads the brougham swung through gates into a courtyard we are there said my lover i stood on the steps of a palace on either side of me soldiers were drawn up startling spectacular music swelled through the doorway flunkies bowed at our approach where have you brought me i whispered whose house is this he's called the president of the french republic was the answer don't be shy we passed through the dazzle of the hall the lights blinded me and the scent of the roses was very strong i heard great names spoken names that made me catch my breath as those awe-inspiring names were uttered the scene became more and more unreal and the guests the guests who bore the historical names looked quite ordinary prick me and i shall bleed persons i think that was the most vivid impression i had in the elysee the difference between the persons and their names soon through the throng among the regal toilettes of the women and the groups of distinguished decorated men 
i grew conscious of the figure of an elderly gentleman with iron-grey hair and a rather sad smile moving near to us i recognized him by the photographs that i had seen and i knew it was the president himself now said the voice at my side i'm going to present you to him try to look as if you liked it for an instant i saw the other end of the glittering salon turning very very small and dim and i thought i was going to faint i hadn't the slightest notion whether i ought to put out my hand to him or kiss his hand or sweep a curtsy and if you want to know which of the three i did i am unable to tell you but my lover affirmed afterwards that i was real charming and you may take his word for it if you are kind enough i can't pretend that it convinces me for i never felt such a gawk in all my days i don't know how long we stayed at the elysee i have a vague recollection of eating an ice but the next thing i remember clearly is our entering the brougham again and driving away into the fresh sweet air then i leant towards him i said if you've any consideration for me you'll answer right off and tell me whether i'm awake or asleep i have pinched myself three times and i'm still not sure you darling he laughed i was afraid you'd read it all before i confessed that was why i stole your newspaper so you did i exclaimed why are you in the paper well you see my rosy posy i bought those pearls for you yesterday he said and i had to get the bank to identify me i suppose the jewellers chattered last night he took the paper from his overcoat and there if you can believe me by the light of the little electric lamp over our heads this is what i saw an american millionaire's son in montparnasse mr martin macleod plays at poverty the extraordinary experiment of a young croesus after that what remains for me to tell you what his father said well his father didn't object to me a bit and always declares that martin's marriage was the most sensible action of his life though that's nonsense we spend six months of the year in america and the other six in europe miss niblett is still in paris i am afraid she will never do the great things but she will never be hard up any more for my prince is as generous as he is rich the story i have tried to write is finished isn't it as marvellous as any fairy tale but it is true and i wonder if any other woman has ever been so blessed as i and thank god for my great happiness the carriage is at the door madam oh is it indeed well i am not going out just yet for there is a little girl running across the room to say that mother has been writing long enough and must come and play and there's marty marty with his arm round me looking down in my face end of section twelve Section 13 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick With Intent to Defraud He wished he were dead. It was not a phrase, a verbal extravagance. He wished it. The only time that he was free from anxiety was when he was asleep. His days were full of hard work and disappointments and efforts to make civil words do the duty of money. And it often occurred to George Collier, when he lay his head on the pillow, that if no tomorrow morning came to disturb him, it would be a blessed state of things. 
he was a writer of humorous books. When he married Eva, he had been nine and twenty, and sanguine, though his humor did not command big prices so far. The critics were very kind to him, and Eva was very admiring, and he went on writing patiently. But by degrees he saw that his confidence had been premature, and then he saw that his marriage had been premature. And then a child was born, and he gave up his ideals and sank to pot boiling, and the pot boiling did not make the pot boil very violently either. A baby added to his embarrassments a good deal. The long clothes seemed no sooner bought than it needed short clothes, and before he had recovered from the cost of these, it had grown out of them. The nurse appeared to lie awake all night, thinking what she could ask for next, and she was a superior person with imagination. Today there were school fees to be paid, and Eva was no longer admiring and their address was Pandora Road, Palham. The little house to the right was called Broadlands, and the one to the left was called The Towers, and Collier, in a fit of moroseness, had labelled their own house The Hut, and made enemies among the neighbours. Yes, Eva's sympathy had worn out, like the cheap drawing-room carpet. Balham and Tooting had got on her nerves, perhaps or George, the failure, was a different man from the popular humorist with whom she had pictured herself driving to brilliant receptions in fashionable gowns. Anyhow, when he reflected that there had been a time when secretly he wrote poetry about her, he turned hot. She was a pale, slight woman with grey eyes and fluffy hair, and a red flannel dressing gown in the morning. After luncheon, when she made her toilet, the grey eyes acquired a soulfulness that came out of a file, and nobody would have suspected the tart and vulgar reproaches that could fall from her lips. Had she been what she looked, he thought sometimes, contemplating her wonderingly when an acquaintance was present, his courage wouldn't have deserted him so soon. But if he had confessed that she weighed on him, the acquaintance would have considered him an unappreciative brute. She looked too wistful and delicate, and fragile to weigh on anyone. He was forty years of age, and soberly and deliberately he wished he were dead. Only one thing deterred him from making away with himself in a painless fashion. It was the knowledge that he would leave her and Chick unprovided for. This was his frame of mind when he came to project a fraud. He saw his way to dying comfortably while safeguarding Chick and Eva from want. That is to say, he saw his way if he could raise the money necessary to pay the premium. He proposed to assure his life and commit suicide. The curious part of it was that he had always been a very scrupulous man, as honest as the day, that day that nobody remembers. He had never wronged anyone by so much as expense, and would have confronted a cross-examination without a tremor. People had often said that he was too conscientious to get on, yet now he was meditating robbery on an extensive scale and barely perceiving his defection. A man whom he knew very well, and who frequently dropped in of an evening, was Mr. Horace Orkney, a solicitor. George was not sensible of any strong esteem for him, but, perhaps for that reason, Orkney looked the likeliest person for what he wanted. And one afternoon he betook himself to the gentleman's office. I have, he said, when greetings had been exchanged, come on rather delicate business. I needn't tell you that what I am going to say is in confidence. Quite so, said Orkney, playing with the ends of his moustache. The fact is, things aren't going well. I am deadly tired of it all, and, well, the truth is, I am anxious to make away with myself. The lawyer was only thirty-six, and he started. To make away with yourself? Oh, nonsense. I mean what I say, insisted Collier. Don't imagine I'm talking through my hat. I haven't come here to waste your time. But my life isn't assured. You see the difficulty? I've got to think of my wife and child, and they'd be practically penniless. Assure it, suggested Mr. Orkney with a shrug. I should certainly assure my life, in any case, if I were you. But, my dear Collier, do let me dissuade you from such a... Uh, such a... Upon my word, he pulled out his monogrammed handkerchief, diffusing an agreeable odour of white rose. You upset me very much. I won't trouble you with my arguments. 
I haven't come to make a sensation and be talked round and that kind of thing. My mind is made up, and I know my own mind better than anybody can tell it to me. You say assure? The point is, I can't assure, because I can't put my hands on the money. Oh, said Orkney, what did you think of assuring for? While I'm about it, I want to make a proper provision. I want to arrange for an income of, uh, say, four or five hundred. For them to get as much as that from a safe investment, the premium would be pretty stiff. A year's premium would come to, well, I reckon it's three hundred and twenty pounds. Now, my idea was... Was what? asked the solicitor blandly. George was nervous. His gaze wandered. My idea was that you might be willing to advance the sum with a view to doing me a turn and making a bid at my death. I am eager to make the proposal as attractive as I can. If you'll let me have three hundred and twenty, I'll fix up my will at once and leave you a thousand. What do you say? I think it's fair. Horace Orkney tapped his fingers together pensively. One likes to do a pal a turn, of course, but... What company are you thinking of, anyhow? You seem to overlook the fact that in a case of suspected suicide... I've overlooked nothing. I've thought it all out, and I know exactly what I shall do. A cousin of my wife's has a cottage in Kent, on the Darenth. We've often stayed there. The lawn slopes to the river, and there's an Indian canoe. No more solitary place could exist. Now, I can easily contrive so that we get an invitation to go down for a week. One evening, after working hard all day, I shall say that I am going out for a breath of fresh air. I shall ask what time they are going to have supper, and set my watch by their clock, so that I mayn't be late. I shall ask my wife to remind me of something I have to do in the morning, and skip through the window in the happiest spirits. Well, the canoe upsets. Everybody knows I could never learn to swim. But your intentions may change, my friend. And if they do, where are my three hundred and twenty pounds? In the natural course of things, you may live for thirty or forty years. I thought, said Collier, of waiting till the spring, but if you don't think it'd look suspicious, the accident can occur next month. There's not much risk of my intentions changing in a month. There was silence. I'll turn it over in my mind, said Orkney, at last. Now you must let me send you away. I'm busy. Having turned it over in his mind, he agreed. He provided George Collier with a sum of three hundred and twenty pounds to take out a policy, and George made a will by which Horace Orkney was bequeathed one thousand. The rest was left to Eva, who, to give her her due, was an affectionate mother. The humorist was now comparatively content. It was already November, and he was to die in April. He had had hopes that Orkney would pronounce it safe for him to take the step earlier, but on reflection Orkney had said that the spring would be best, after all. It was a disappointment, but George was too grateful to complain of a crumpled rose leaf. He had borne the slings and arrows so hopelessly that he told himself he would be a rotter to kick at five more monks. He was not unreasonable. And, as the weeks wore away, his satisfaction increased. He was a weary man looking forward to a perpetual holiday. There was a serious epidemic of influenza in London that year. Everybody who could afford to do so was flying to the watering places of the continent, and among those who remained in town and were laid low was Mrs. Collier. This was at Christmas. The doctor did not, at the beginning, regard her case gravely, but she got worse in spite of his optimism and after a fortnight in bed, she died. George was inexpressibly shocked. Though he had long since outlived his illusions about her, she had been his wife, his daily companion. To realize that she was gone dismayed him. He remembered the girl and shed tears at the grave of the woman, not analyzing, not drawing the distinction, but just grieving honestly. After she was buried, as he sat in the quiet parlor, smoking at night, it occurred to him that, as the child would now be doubly an orphan, he must arrange where she was to live when April came. In the circumstances, she would be an heiress, and he wanted her to be suitably brought up. Fortunately, he had a maiden sister who could be depended on to carry out his wishes in this respect. He nodded thankfully, reflecting how much troubled he would have been for Chick's future otherwise. And January came to an end, and February began and February waned, and it was March. 
George was surprised to note how rapidly time had passed since the funeral. He put March 1st at the top of a letter very slowly, and sat looking at it with startled eyes. A month more, and the consummation would be reached. Poor little chick, he would have to leave her. Oddly, now that the end of it all was so near, he felt less eager than he had done. He had been conscious of late of a certain enjoyment in life, a new enjoyment. The quiet parlour with his pipe and a novel had been pleasant. He had gone up to his room at night without a groan and seated himself at his desk in the morning with an unfamiliar zest. Only a month. Well, let him make the most of it. But that was easier to say than to do. Death no longer figured in his thoughts as a perpetual holiday. Now that he was a widower, it figured as a skeleton and thrust itself into the cosiest stars. Perhaps Chick was on his knee and he was stroking her hair and the skeleton clanked. Perhaps he was writing in the small hours, interested in his work, and the skeleton mocked him. What was the good of Chick's love when he had to leave her directly? What was the good of revising a chapter when he would be bones before the book was done? He shuddered. It was no use blinking the truth. The fact was, the conditions had altered. He would have been a cheerful man today, for all his pecuniary worries, if he had been allowed and the worries themselves looked less formidable somehow. Eva had made the worst of everything, and, heaven forgive him, had always been a muddler. It was amazing what a difference her removal made. He was satisfied with life now, and he knew he did not want to die. At last he determined to go to Orkney and beg to be released. It was an odious task, but the alternative was more obnoxious still, and he went. Orkney looked at him in blank disapproval when he had stammered to a conclusion. "'This is very unbusinesslike, he said. "'Very unbusinesslike indeed. "'You put me in a most awkward position, Collier. "'I don't want to see you die, of course. "'I, I hope I have a heart. "'But an agreement is an agreement, "'and I have pressing need for a thousand pounds. "'As it happens, I've got a bill.' "'You see,' said George helplessly, "'there's a child. "'I don't like to leave her alone in the world.' I thought you told me at the time of your wife's death that she could go to an aunt in Dorking. Yes, I did, but, well, I'm very fond of her. The parting is devilish hard. I don't see why it should be any harder this morning than when you came here and made your proposal. I did a friendly thing for you, and I must say this isn't at all fair treatment. It wasn't an agreement that I could enforce, you know. I relied on your honour. And now you put me off with empty excuses? "'Don't say that,' faltered George. "'To tell you the honest truth, I don't know how it is. "'Since I lost my wife, I... I'm not so depressed. "'I feel lighter, and there's a different aspect to things. "'I can't explain it.' "'No,' said Orkney firmly. "'I won't hear it. "'I won't have the blame laid at the door of that poor little woman. "'This is cowardly, Collier. "'Be a man and say that you've changed your mind and are trying to back out.' "'Very well, then,' replied George. I've changed my mind. I want to live and to pay you the thousand pounds as soon as I can get it together. The solicitor smiled finely. It was a very fair rate of interest for the time agreed upon. But for a period of years? Anyhow, we needn't discuss the point. So far as I understand your position, there would be very little prospect of your repaying even the principal. In other words, you won't consent? I regret, said Orkney. I regret very much that you should have put such a suggestion forward, because I am unable to consent to it, and it's a peculiarly painful one to refuse. I don't think it was delicate of you, Collier. It was in good taste. Good taste, be damned, said George hotly. Finally you insist on your pound of flesh? Finally, returned Orkney, rising. I repeat that if you are a man of honour, there's only one thing for you to do. He touched the bell, and George slunk out into the street. It was April already. He had either to break his undertaking or to fulfil it without delay. Instinctively, he saw the literary value of the situation. But the humorist felt no desire to treat it humorously. He found himself, on the contrary, perpending it as an experiment in realism. To the devil with literature. He must die, or tell Orkney that he was going to sell him. Which should it be? One cause was ghastly, and the other was disgraceful. He vacillated hourly for a fortnight, 
and Orkney, meanwhile, seemed ubiquitous. George could not take a walk without meeting him, and Orkney always stopped and spoke, and asked him very coldly how he was. George used to struggle for composure, but not with success. Then the solicitor would elevate his eyebrows and sigh significantly, and Collier went his way, feeling despicable and ashamed. The pound of flesh, to be or not to be, what a lot of titles suggested themselves for the story that might be written. The thought of it obsessed him, and one evening he actually began it. The impulse was foolish, but the occupation was fascinating, and he wrote with unaccustomed ease. He treated the subject in a serious narrative. At one o'clock he came to a point where he had to determine what the end was going to be. How was it to end? He rose and paced the room, refilling his pipe. He could not light it. It was blocked. He wasted five minutes in it, fuming. If he didn't smoke, he couldn't think. Formerly he had annexed his wife's happens in such emergencies, and, as a last resource, it occurred to him that if he searched in the wardrobe where her belongings had been put away, he might find some happens. The key was on his own keychain, and he went upstairs. The dead woman's trifles had been laid on the shelves. He saw her work basket and her dressing case, and the set of brushes with E on the backs in silver that he had given her on her last birthday. There was a hat that she had been trimming when she was taken ill, with the needle still sticking on it. He paused. Momentarily, what he was doing seemed sacrilege. Then he opened the dressing case and lifted the tray. There were hairpins scattered at the bottom. There was also a bundle of letters, tied with ribbon, and directed in a handwriting that looked familiar. George stared at it. Was he making a mistake, or what on earth had the correspondence been about? He turned white and pulled the ribbon off. The dates that the letters bore were of the last two years. There was nothing criminal in them, but they were a man's confidential communication to a woman he loved. They spoke of the writer's sympathy of his regret that he could do nothing to alleviate the dreariness of a life. There were frequent allusions to what might have been, and they began, Dearest Mrs. Collier, and were signed, Yours with devotion, Horace Ockney. George stumbled out of the bedroom and returned to the parlour. He sank into his chair there, with knitted brows, pondering. After a while, he picked up his pen again, but he did not continue the story. He wrote, Dear Sir, I restore to you here with certain letters of yours, for which I have no use. I perceive that the late Mrs. Collier's untimely decease frustrated your hope of marrying a widow whose natural attractions would have been enhanced by the possession of nine thousand pounds, and I tender you my condolence. The bequest in my will will stand, but as you once pointed out, I may, in the ordinary course of things, live for forty years longer. Believe me, I have every intention of doing so if I can. And he did, and became a very successful man. End of section 13 Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey Section 14 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Dead Violets. If you ever want me, write to me. I'd come to you from the end of the world, he had said. And she had answered, I shall always want you, but I shall never write and you must never come. She was married. It was in May that they parted. They parted on the day of her owning that she cared for him. The virtue was hers, not his. Yet, because he loved her, and realized that she was too good a woman to defy her conscience and be happy, he acquiesced in her decision, refrained from pleading to her, refrained from trying to see her again. His only indulgence was to send violets to her home in Paris for the ninth of December. The ninth of December was her birthday, and violets, she had once told him, were her favorite flower. He did not scribble any greeting with them, 
did not even enclose a card. He was sure that she would know who sent them, and it lightened his pain to feel that she would know. Indeed, to recall himself to her thus mutely was a joy, the only joy that he had experienced since the day of the goodbye. Almost it was as if he were going to her, that moment in the London florists when he held the flowers that would reach her hands. She did not seem so lost to him for the moment. The separation did not seem so blank. The next year also, he sent violets for the ninth of December. His emotions, it is true, were less vivid this time, but he was glad to show her that he was faithful. Besides, the prettiness of the reminder pleased him. And the third year? He sent them chiefly because he felt that she would be disappointed if he appeared to forget. So it had grown to be his custom to send violets to her for her birthday, though what was once an impulse of devotion was now a lie, the weakness of a sentimentalist reluctant to wound a woman and his self-esteem by admitting that he had exaggerated the importance of his feelings. And each December the woman had welcomed the lie with smiles and tears and believed that he loved her still. When five years had passed, he met her again. It was in Bond Street, and he had sent the violets to Paris two or three days before. Phil! As he turned and saw her, he thought how much better looking she used to be. She was young still, no more than thirty, but she had longed for him on every day of the five years, and her tears had blotted some of the girlishness from her face. As he turned and saw her, the woman thought how his mouth had twitched when he said, I'd come to you from the end of the world. It is among the unacknowledged truths that sentimentality may create as much ferment as enduring love, and he had suffered even more violently than she, though he had not suffered so long. What are you doing here in December? You're the last person I should have expected to see, she said. I go south tomorrow. Lucky man. And you? We're living here now. Really? You've left Paris? How long? We've been here since October. We're flat hunting. Oh. They stood looking into each other's eyes, neither knowing what to say next. Her heart was thumping terribly, and she felt very happy and very frightened. More than once she had been tempted to write to him that her courage had broken down. All resistance seemed to have left her as she stood looking into his eyes again. Flats, she added in a voice of composure, are so abominably dear in London. Where are you staying? In apartments, Bayswater. Bayswater must be a change from Neuilly. It was a jolly little place you had in Neuilly. It was rather jolly, wasn't it? My, my husband's people wished us to come over. They thought they might put him into something over here. Of course, in Paris it was cheap, but there were no prospects. I understand. There's some talk of a secretaryship if a company is floated. It was so natural to be telling him everything now that they had met. It would be a very good thing for us. I hope it'll come off. Yes. Well, how are you? I'm always seeing your name. One of the novels of the year. They aren't so good as the novels that nobody read. Not quite. Why? I'm turning out what's wanted now. One has to live. Yes. Still, isn't it a pity to... to... Oh, one gets tired, he said. Ideals make lonely dwelling places. Let me take you somewhere and give you some tea. I ought to go to some shops. I'm up west to work. Work? Spending money? Earning it? I'm doing fashion articles. You? Do you mean it? Well, come and have some tea first. It was very early, and there were vacant tables in the alcoves. As he sat opposite her, Orlebar thought what a fraud it was that the things one craved for only came to pass when one had grown resigned to doing without them. How he had besought God for some such chance as this! What a spectacle he had made of himself about her during six unforgettable months! 
and now he was sipping his tea without emotion and observing that her clothes compared unfavorably with the other women's in the room in that moment orlevar saw the humiliating truth knew that he had lived his great love down and deceived himself for years but he didn't want to see he preferred to deceive himself now it is often more congenial to be an ass than to acknowledge that you have been one it's a long time since we have had tea together lucy yes she said well what have you to tell me i think i told you everything in a breath at least what have you been doing all the time trying to kill it you're working in london now eh yes i have chambers in the temple rather swagger compared with the little shanty in the rue ravignon how did you come to take up journalism someone suggested it and my twaddle seemed to do it's pretty sickening what's the idea it doesn't pay very well does it not on my paper i get a guinea a week but ah oh, why should i bore you with all that you don't bore me lucy well i i prefer to do it you don't know everything his people have never forgiven his marriage they think marriage has handicapped him so badly and you may be sure they blame me more than him it's always the daughter-in-law's fault we've only their allowance to live on it isn't pleasant to be kept by people who resent your existence poor little woman no i didn't know oh it's not so bad as all that still i'm glad to be making something even if it's only a guinea a week i don't feel so uncomfortable when i meet them not such a dead weight we have to go there to dinner on sundays and it's rather awful they tell me what a splendid career he would have if he hadn't married damn em, said orlebar i too every sunday afternoon from the soup to the coffee well she leant her elbows on the table and smiled have i changed much no he said bravely but this is brutal hard lines i didn't dream that you had things like that to put up with you always seem so light-hearted in paris i didn't meet his people in paris besides things alter in five years i think ah oh, she broke off it's ridiculous to talk about it to you i don't know why i'm doing it have you anyone else to talk to no she admitted slowly that's it i can't talk to him because well they're his own people for one thing and besides well of course marriage has handicapped him and i suppose he knows it as well as they do do you mean you don't get on now she gave a shrug and traced lines in the cloth with her spoon what do you suppose i mean i am so sorry for you dear oh i dare say it's my fault i suppose i don't do all i ought to do to make up for what i've cost him it's difficult to do all you ought when when her voice snapped when you sometimes wish to god that you hadn't done so much perhaps you'd have done better to come to me after all said orlebar heavily he couldn't think of anything else to say i tried to be a good woman i thought you'd forget me i wanted to forget you why didn't you let me forget you why did you send me those flowers every year were you vexed with me for sending them no i'm glad i sent some to paris the other day did you i wondered if you would i've been rather impatient for my birthdays what a confession a woman impatient for her birthdays i never meant to see you any more though i swore i wouldn't but you wanted to didn't you her cup was neglected now she leant back in her chair her hands clasped in her lap didn't you he repeated oh don't she said in her throat i can't bear it phil what the life everything i'm tired of it all chuck it he muttered come away with me tomorrow she didn't speak she tried to believe that she was struggling the pause seemed to orlebar to last a long time while he sat wishing that he hadn't said it the waitress inquired if they required anything else and put the check on the table and took her tip the place was filling 
and a lady's orchestra began to twang their mandolins. "'Do you want me?' she asked, raising her eyes. "'Do I want you?' What else could he reply? "'Very well, then,' she nodded. "'I'll go. "'Let's get out of this. "'Do you mind? "'My head aches.' He knew dismally that her consent had come too late, that there would be nothing now to compensate him for the scandal, no months or weeks or even minutes of rapture. They got up, and he put the half-crown on the desk and followed her into the street. After they had strolled a few yards in silence, he said, as it seemed obligatory, "'You've made me very happy.' She answered, "'I'll try to.' He wished that she had said anything else. It was painful. We'd better have a cab. Where shall we go? Will you come to the temple? I think I'd like to go home. You can drive there with me. Can you get away in the morning, or shall I put it off? He asked in the hansom. No, I can get away. He won't be back till the evening. Back from where? He went down to his people today. They're at Brighton now. What time's the train? Ten o'clock, from Charing Cross. I was going by Folkestone and Boulogne. Are you a bad sailor? No, I like it. We'll meet at Charing Cross, then. Yes, in the first-class waiting room. If you're sure, it's not too early for you. It's all right. Is it real, Phil? Half an hour ago we hadn't seen each other. And now it's to be all our lives. Ah. <sighs> I hope you'll never be sorry. I wonder. That's unjust. Is it? Her eyes reminded him that he ought to kiss her, and he bent his head. He pitied her acutely as he felt her tears on his face, hated himself for lying to her. Cheer up, dearest. Remember how we care for each other, he said. The effort of affecting joy wore him out as they drove on. Intensely, he wished that they had found a quicker cab. He wanted a drink badly, wanted to light a pipe and give way to his gloom. Her hand, which he clasped, seemed to him to grow larger and heavier through the long drive. And when at last they parted at her door, he thanked heaven for the right to heave a sigh, for the freedom to look as moody as he felt. Five years ago. If it had only happened five, four years ago, the pathos of the situation took him by the throat. What a rotten thing life was. Again, his mind reverted to the months where he had been torn with longing for her. The longing just to watch her, to listen to her, no matter what she said. And now he had kissed her for the first time, as a duty. That abandonment of despair had played havoc with him, yet he wished that it had lasted. It would have been worthwhile, he thought. God, the ecstasy that would have been thrilling in him now if he had suffered like that until this afternoon. At the club, he ordered a big whiskey and a small soda. You're off to Rome soon, aren't you? said a man presently. You pampered novelists have all the luck. Yes, said Orlebar. The man was the editor of a daily paper. It occurred to the novelist that he was about to provide the paper with some surprising copy, also that the editorial greeting would be less informal when they met again. What a deuce of a lot of talk there would be, the damage it was going to do to him socially. Socially. It would injure him financially, too. He recognized it for the first time as he surveyed the room. There was McKinnell of the Mayfair, ragging a waiter because the toast was cold. Orlebar's new novel was to run through the Mayfair before it came out in book form. If he knew anything of McKinnell, that highly respectable gentleman would refuse to pollute the pages of his journal with the fiction of a co-respondent. And McKinnell's refusal wouldn't be singular, though he might express it with singular offensiveness. Even among good fellows it would be, "'Sorry, but we daren't run you just now in a paper for household reading.' We should get no end of protests. Awful rot, of course. But there it is. Five hundred pounds gone. Five hundred pounds was a large sum, 
he was no millionaire. And his books, the sale of his next books, would drop in this virtuous country when he had outraged the eleventh commandment. If she had been Lady Somebody, the public would have called the case romantic. It would have been a big advertisement then, but without the glamour of a title, they would only call it disgraceful. For one reader gained by the scandal, half a dozen would be lost. What a calamity is turning into Bond Street this afternoon. And how she had jumped at him, he thought with sudden resentment. She hadn't needed much persuasion. He had been an idiot to exalt her into a heroine at the beginning. Since it had been fated that he was to ruin himself, he might at any rate have done it while he was in love with her. And he hadn't even the excuse of youth now. He was making a mess of his life when he was old enough to know better. When he did know better, he was ruining himself against his will. He had another whiskey and soda, and wondered if there was any chance of his hearing that she had changed her mind. Confound it, she didn't know his address. And anyhow, there would be no chance. What was she giving up? A husband who didn't want her. If she had had a child, it would have been a different thing. A pity she hadn't a family. A husband who didn't want her. And he, Philip Orlebar, was going to take her off his hands. Oh, what a mug's game. If he hadn't gone in to have his hat ironed, he wouldn't have met her. And it hadn't really needed ironing either. He did not remain long in the club when dinner was over. After all, he had mentioned that his rooms were in the temple, and the hope that she might try to communicate with him lingered in spite of common sense. At the gate he looked toward the porter eagerly, but the porter said nothing, and the shock of disappointment told Orlebar how strong the hope had been. His portmanteau were half-packed, and he spent the evening straining to catch the sound of the bell. Once it rang but the visitor was only a bore who had dropped in for a drink and a chat. Orlebar loathed the beaming face as he gave him welcome, and like the editor, the bore made envious reference to the morrow's journey. He wished he were in the author's shoes. Orlebar was at infinite pains to affect high spirits, for it was undesirable that the man should say afterwards, I was with him the night before he bolted with her. The poor beggar seemed to have an awful hump. But presently the man said, You seem a cup low tonight, old chap. The melancholy stroke of the temple clock had never sounded so lugubrious as in the hours that followed. When he woke in the morning, Orlebar remembered that there ought to be a half bottle of pommery in the bathroom, and he had it in lieu of tea with some biscuits. The wine lightened his mood a little. It no longer seemed so hopelessly impossible to conceal his regret. And when he strode into the station, it was with a very fair show of impatience. But his heart leapt as he saw that she wasn't there. He sat down and glanced alternately at the clock and the doors, praying that she wouldn't come. She entered just as he was feeling sanguine. My darling, he murmured, here you are. Am I late? I was beginning to be afraid, but there's time enough. I've got the tickets. Where's your luggage? They've taken it through. We'd better go, then. Among the bustle on the platform, he could say little more than, How pale you are! And which are your trunks? Then they were alone, and the door had been slammed, and the train moved out. Darling, he said again. Well? Well? It seems too good to be true. His tone was lifeless. Does it? Doesn't it to you? I think it's true, she said with a tired smile. How pale you are, he repeated. Didn't you sleep? Not much. I've been wondering. Wondering? What? Whether I ought to have said no. What would you have done if I'd said no, Phil? Really? What can a man do? I suppose I should have had to put up with it. She did not reply for a moment. She was gazing straight before her with a frown. Do you think me a bad woman, Phil? 
I think you're the best woman I've ever known. It looks like it, doesn't it? The force of circumstances. If you had met me before you met him. But I didn't. It's pretty mean of me to spoil his life, isn't it? I didn't know that he cared so much about you. Oh, she hesitated. We've quarreled, like everybody else, but he's very fond of me. Of course, it'll be an awful blow. I can't forget it. I've been thinking of it ever since. Well, it just depends. The thing you've got to consider is which way you'll be happier yourself. If, I don't know, I suppose there are women who can't go wrong and be happy. I'm thinking of my duty, she faltered. You know I love you, don't you? I want you to know it to keep remembering it all the time. I love you. I love you. I love you. But she waited with her heart in her throat. But what, he asked moodily, what were you going to say? Her eyes closed with pain. Eh, he said. There are his people, she stammered. They'll feel the disgrace so much. I've been considering everything. I... I didn't know what a wrench it would be. You'll get over it. I'm not sure. Perhaps I shall always. Do you think I've made a mistake? Again, she waited breathlessly. If he would only seize her in his arms. If he would only cry, Let them all go to the devil and remember me. If you feel like that, he said feebly, of course, I hardly, I hardly know what I can say to you. You can't think of anything to say, she pleaded. There's nothing, nothing I'm overlooking. There's time. One gets over anything in time, he said incautiously. Oh, my God, she moaned. She turned to the window, her face as white as a dead woman's. The terror was confirmed that had stolen on her in the cab, that had haunted her throughout the night, confirmed by his tones, his looks, by every answer he had made to her halting falsehoods, he had learnt to do without her. She had given herself unsought. In the agony of shame that overwhelmed her, she could have thrown herself from the compartment, and it was only her love for him that restrained her. She would not reproach him by deed or word. He shouldn't be burdened by the knowledge of what he had made her suffer. Well, he said, it's not too late. No, she muttered. I can't go. His pulses jumped. For an instant, he couldn't trust his voice. You must do as you like. I don't want to take you against your will. If you wish it, you can go back from Folkestone, I suppose. If he's away, there'd be no harm done, would there? You're not angry with me? You won't mind too much? Don't worry about me. I want you to be happy. To tell you the truth, I think you're right. You are not the woman to kick over the traces. You'd be too cut up about it. Go back and make the best of a bad business. It'll be easier for you to bear than the other. Anyhow, we'll see about a train for you as soon as we get in. At Folkestone Harbor, they ascertained that there would be an express to Charing Cross at two o'clock and he paced the platform with her till it was time to say goodbye. Exhilaration had given him an appetite, but she answered that she wasn't hungry. So, as he had missed his boat, he decided to drive to a hotel on the Lees and have an elaborate luncheon when she had gone. His glances at the playbills on the walls showed him that Santoy was at the Pleasure Gardens, and he foresaw himself cheerfully among the audience in the evening. He was feeling, on a sudden, twenty years younger, and in hard as he strove to acquire a manner of tender gravity, she discerned the improvement in his spirits every time he spoke. Her train arrived in town a few minutes to four, and she re-entered the lodging house some hours earlier than her husband. But the fire had gone out, and she had to wait, shivering, till it was lighted before she could burn the note that she had left on the mantelpiece for him. A little box addressed to her had been delivered during her absence. When the slatternly servant left her alone at last, the woman dared to touch it, and fell to sobbing as if her heart would burst. It contained the violets that Orlebar had sent in token of his love. The box had been redirected from Paris. Owing to the delay, 
the violets, now that they reached her, were quite dead. End of section 14. Recording by Eva Davis. Section 15 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Favorite Plot with Variations. The financier was cracking walnuts when the curate arrived. Hello, boy, he said. Why don't you come to dinner? How do you do, Uncle Murray? Oh, it was impossible to come in time for dinner. I had a meeting at six o'clock, and it's a long way from Plaistow to Park Lane. Are you quite well? Pretty fit, said Murray Pibus. Glad to see you again. I was going to drop you a line. I go to New York next month. Help yourself to port. Thank you. I don't drink wine, said Cuthbert, a shade reproachfully. I forgot, said Pibus. Cigar? But you don't smoke either. Well, take an armchair. Make yourself comfortable. How's Plaster? The curate cleared his throat. I was anxious to have a talk with you, Uncle Murray, on a very important subject. So you wrote me. Well, I know your important subjects. You needn't go into details. Of course, it's a bona fide case. How much do you want? Frankly, I'm nervous, faltered his nephew. Better try the port, counsel Pibus. No? All right, stick to your colors, even if they are a blue ribbon. You've always been so generous, more than generous. Your subscriptions and and your proposals as regards myself, though I couldn't accept them, were natural enough. You'll have to have the lot one day. I've nobody else to leave it to, and I'm not the man to marry again, he laughed. It'll be a funny position, huh? An East End curate blooming into a millionaire? You're a queer fish, Cuthbert. I don't say any more about your not coming into the city. You weren't cut out for it. But what do you want to starve in the slums for? If the church was the only thing to suit you, you might as well have had a snug berth in it. I thought, at least I hoped, said Cuthbert stiffly, that I'd made my principles clear to you long ago. I have no desire for a snug berth. I told you so when the call came to me. My object in taking orders was never to attain material comforts. If I had sought worldly advantages, I should have embraced a commercial career instead. I choose to labor among those who need my poor help the most, and I choose to be in truth their brother, not to hold myself aloof from them, a preceptor in a pleasance. Oh, very proper, very high-minded, said the financier hurriedly. A reputation for conscientiousness, of course, is a valuable asset. Have it your own way, my lad. If I am not to do anything for you in my lifetime, we'll say no more about it. The curate flushed. As a matter of fact, he stammered, my reason for wishing to see you was to beg you to do something for me. My principles are quite unchanged. I still mean to work among the poor. I am still resolved to abstain from living among them luxuriously. But, uh, well, circumstances have arisen which uh, perhaps I had better tell you everything as it happened. Best way, said Pybus, repressing a groan. I was rather seriously unwell some weeks ago, and my vicar induced me to take a brief holiday. He's always most considerate. Any family at the vicarage? Family? There are his three daughters. Ah, murmured the millionaire. Yes, he would consider you attentively. Go on. Some pleasant seaside place was desirable, and I went to Hastings. The castle is most fascinating. Well? Well, my lodgings were not cheerful, and the weather was unpropitious, so altogether... You got the hump? I was, er, uh, rather, yes. One evening, as it was too wet to take a walk, I attended a performance of A Crown of Thorns. Of course, I had heard about it. I knew that it had been approved by organs of the press that don't mention such things as a rule, but I confess that it amazed me. I found its religious teaching quite as admirable as the historical instruction it afforded, the insight into the life of ancient Rome. 
It was practically my first visit to a theatre, and a most memorable experience. Perhaps you know the play? Girl holds up a cross in the limelight, and the lions are afraid to eat her? No, sir, there are no lions. There are lions in the pictorial advertisements of the play, but they are not actually visible on the stage. It isn't too much to say that I was overwhelmed. I was ashamed of the unreasoning prejudice I had always entertained against theatrical performances. You haven't come to ask me to endure a theatre, I hope, put in the millionaire genially. Oh, indeed, not at all, sir. The idea had not presented itself to me. Hear me out. The part of the heroine was taken by a lady who possessed such spiritual fervour that, at first, I regretted her choice of a career. How true it is that prejudice dies hard. I grieved. It was narrow of me that she was not devoting herself to the propagation of faith among the heathen of her own time instead of to the mimic. Uh, I mean, that it seemed to me she was wasting her precious gifts, that she ought to have been a missionary. I quite follow you, said Pybus dryly. I did not recognize the truth at once, but then it came to me. I understood. As I looked round at the eyes wet with tears, I saw that the stage may make for good as powerfully as the pulpit. I saw that this beautiful girl, uttering the grace that was in her to hundreds nightly, I don't know if I mentioned that she has been favoured with remarkable beauty, was stirring the minds of mere pleasure-seekers to the contemplation of higher things. I saw that she was working in the same cause as myself. "'Great Scott, boy, you've fallen in love with an actress?' exclaimed Pybus. "'So that's it?' "'Later I certainly learned to love her,' replied the curate, with dignity. "'though I don't perceive by what process you have arrived at the fact. "'I had the happiness to meet her the next afternoon "'in the waiting-room at a dentist's, "'and the passing of a magazine led to conversation. "'Did you tell her that you thought she ought to have been a missionary?' "'I believe I did say something of my earlier regret, "'and she agreed with me that she was doing equally exalted work on the stage. "'Perhaps my enlightenment may be partly due to that conversation. "'Her thoughts on the subject were very beautiful.' One answer that she made impressed me deeply. Religion and art, she said, are in reality the same thing. Without the context, it is not so forcible, but when she said it, it was a perfect expression of what we meant. It was most illuminative. How much have you been muddling yourself up with this girl? asked the financier curtly. Sir? I say, how far has it gone? What happened after she illuminated the dentists? We met often after the dentists. On the parade, we used to listen to the town crier together. She found a town crier so quaint, anything that savours of a bygone age appeals to her strongly. Fortunately, too, the company was going to London, to various theatres in the suburbs, so I was able to see her when I returned, and, uh, and she has consented to be my wife. You told her you were my nephew, uh, my heir? I saw no reason for reticence. I trust you have not formed a poor opinion of a lady whom you have never seen? Not at all. I should have a poor opinion of her if she had refused you under the circumstances. But you are making yourself ridiculous. You have lost your head over an actress. You have taken a queer clerical way about it. But you have lost your head over an actress. It won't do, Cuthbert. The thing's absurd. Cuthbert had turned very pale. I'm sorry to find you so unjust, he groaned. I had hoped, in view of the many offers you have so kindly made me, that you would be willing to, to further my happiness. Marriage upon my stipend is impossible, as you know. I trusted your affection to... to... Why, you have pressed me to take an allowance over and over again. Look here, boy, exclaimed Pybus. I am going to talk straight to you. You are the nearest relative I have got, and though you were never the sort I was keen on leaving a million to, I knew you'd waste it in a creditable and conscientious kind of way. Also, I'm only fifty, and I hoped you'd have got more sense by the time I died. But this alters matters. I shouldn't leave my money to you if you made a ridiculous marriage, and I don't part with a quit to help you to do it. That's plain English. You can tell her what I've said when you keep the appointment at the stage door tonight. She can marry you if she likes, but she'll live in Plasto on what you've got now. There'll be nothing from me. And you, observed Cuthbert bitterly, are called a man of the world. Why, sir, you are displaying all the narrowness of the least sophisticated. 
She is an actress, and so to wed her must be misfortune. She is an actress. And you are a fool, said Pybus, but I don't want to quarrel with you. I've been there myself. Thirty years ago, we have all been there some time. You go to a theatre, you see a pretty woman, and you think you are in love. You are a curate, so your symptoms are a bit complicated, but the complaint is very usual, Cuthbert. Believe me, it won't be fatal. Will you allow me to introduce her to you? pleaded Cuthbert. Will you give me a chance to overcome your prejudices? No, I won't. I haven't any prejudices. I dare say the girl's right enough for the right man, but she's a long way from right for you. You don't really suppose she can care about you? You're a good lad, but the last fellow in the world to please an actress. If you hadn't told her you were my nephew, she would have laughed in your face when you proposed to her. I'm prepared, said the curate resignedly, to suffer humiliation, if need be. Oh, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but, er, uh, well, she would. I know what actresses are like. But you don't know her. If you would talk to her once, she would convert you. You would own you were wrong. My life's happiness is at stake. Before you decide, let me bring her to see you. Surely it is no more than fair. Pybus picked up the evening papers. It's no good going on with it. That's all I've got to say. He opened the Pall Mall. Good night, sir, quavered the curate, extending a hopeless hand. Good night, boy, said the financier cordially. Whenever you want anything in reason, let me know. Cuthbert took a bus to Victoria and arrived at the Shakespeare Clapham in ample time. It was still embarrassing to him to loiter at a stage door, but a man is justified in meeting his fiancée anywhere. He endeavoured to assert this by his bearing when Lofer stared at him. Nobody was ever quite so high-minded as Cuthbert tried to look when he waited at stage doors. My own, I failed, he told her as they walked to Clapham Junction. The hand on his arm trembled. What did he say? He was obdurate. He refused point blank. Why should I pain you by repeating the insults I had to bear? Just because I'm an actress? exclaimed the girl pathetically. Oh, what we have to put up with, we artists. How uncharitable they are to us. Then it's all over between you and I? He winced. But tears were swimming in her lovely eyes. It would have been heartless to mention grammar. I cannot lose you, he cried. I cannot. We might. No, it's out of the question. What's to be done? Angela, I almost lose faith. Hush, she murmured, looking upward. It may be all for the best, dear. It must be, though it is hard for us to understand it. Do you think he would relent when we were married? I fear not. He would never know you. If he had let me take you to him, we should succeed, I'm sure. Your intelligence and beauty would win him over, though he wouldn't appreciate your soul. But he declined to see you. It's a pity I can't be introduced to him as somebody else. Go there as a hospital nurse or something? Then, when I'd got round him, and he was very grateful to me, I could say, My name is Angela Noble. I love your nephew. It is a sweet idea. But his health is robust, and besides, he goes abroad very soon. That's what I shall have to do, she said moodily. You? If we don't marry, I must take the engagement for New York. You know, I have the offer open. I shall have to go. New York? cried Cuthbert. I hoped you had dismissed the notion. He was meditative. Angela, I have a daring thought. I will not fail. Pybus was considerably surprised a day or two later at receiving a pleasant letter from the young man wishing him an agreeable voyage and inquiring by what boat he was to cross. He was considerably irritated at receiving a second letter reminding him of his permission to ask reasonable favours. A lady of the curate's acquaintance was departing for America unprotected by that very vessel, an act of courtesy that Mr. Pybus would kindly show to the friendless lady his affectionate nephew would much appreciate. It was added tactfully that, her means precluding speculation, no fear need be entertained of her angling for tips. Piper swore and dictated a gracious note, and the boat sailed. Miss Noble unpacked her cabin trunk with the painful consciousness that steamers travel fast. When she had made the chance remark that inspired her lover, she had been thinking vaguely of a sick room and plenty of time for womanly gentleness to be admired. Between Acts 2 and 3, a month lapses. An Atlantic racer was alarmingly different. And the uncle was more discouraging still. 
every uncle that she had ever known refusing his consent had a white moustache and side whiskers and was slightly bowed with age and cynicism here was a hale and hearty uncle carelessly good-humoured such a person seemed less likely to break up into slushy sentiment than the iciest cynic that ever sneered the report that reached plasto from queenstown was not a sanguine one there's just this in our favour she had scribbled he has no suspicion who i am and he can't escape me without jumping overboard you may bet bet had been imperfectly erased feel sure i shall do as much in the time as i can dear one Cuthbert kissed the ship's stationery with enthusiasm. She was a bright girl. She hasn't been seen to advantage with the curate, and she was working for by far the most profitable engagement of her career. Before the first sweepstake on the run, she began to play her part in quite another manner than the one she had mentally rehearsed. The spiritual note that Cuthbert had expected of her, to go on being the heroine of a crown of thorns after the curtain was down, wouldn't catch on here at all, she decided. There was no hit to be made on those lines. Admiration, a wide-eyed homage of the financier's cleverness? Probably all the women he met looked at him like that. It had been played out long ago. The smartest thing would be to treat the middle-aged magnate as if he were an amusing young man. She did it. It was much easier than being soulful, much less fatiguing. She laughed, she chaffed, she even flirted with him a little. Pybus, who had been prepared to find her a consummate nuisance, hadn't been on such good terms with himself for years. The day before they sighted Sandy Hook, he said, I hope I shall see something of you after we land. Are you staying in New York long? I, I hardly know, she answered. It depends. It depended on the way he took it when she sprung the truth on him directly. She felt less self-possessed than usual. Anyhow, there's my address. If there's anything I can do, I shall be glad. That's very kind of you. I wonder how much you mean it. She flashed a glance. I might ask for something big. Ah, uh, I didn't pledge myself to do anything you asked. I said I'd be glad to do anything I could. Cautious person. They were pacing the deck, and they walked in silence for a minute. She was wondering if it would be discreet to delay her confession till they had arrived. You are nervy today, said Pybus. You look as if you were going to say you had a headache. It's just the moment for a glass of champagne and a cracker. Let's go below and get them. I don't think I care about it, thanks. But you're quite right. I'm nervy. I want to tell you something. Shall we sit down? They sat down, and again there was silence. Well, he questioned. I don't know how to begin. Let me help you, suggested Pybus. Pull me up if I'm wrong. You're an actress. My nephew Cuthbert thinks he's in love with you, and you came aboard in the hope of persuading me to agree to your marriage. Whether you were going to New York anyhow, I don't know. I trust you were, for I should be sorry to have put you to so much inconvenience. Now the beginning is over. Proceed. Miss Noble had uttered a faint exclamation of astonishment. She stared blankly at the sea. You seem surprised, he said. That isn't flattering to my intelligence. Cuthbert's circle of pretty women is strictly limited, I take it. Any doubt that I had of your identity when I got this letter was removed the moment I saw you. Oh, then you do think I'm pretty? faltered Miss Noble. You're not a beauty, but your face is pleasing. I say you threw yourself in my way with the intention of convincing me that you were a much nicer girl than I supposed you to be. Am I correct? Quite correct, said Miss Noble in a low voice. It was an innocent plot. It is the favourite one. It has been in the English magazines every month since I was a child. Well, I am convinced. Don't misunderstand me. I find you brainier, wittier, and nicer in every respect. In fact, you are even more calculated than I assumed to spoil his life. Mr. Pybus! Keep your temper. It's a reflection on him, not on you. I'll explain. Cuthbert is my heir, fought the mirror, which may be translated as because I haven't a son, much as I should like one, and though I've never pretended he was the apple of my eye, I should regret to see him come to grief. If you were the flabby, phonographic sort of young woman to echo his sentiments and make him happy, I'd say, take him with my sympathy. He's yours. You are a hundred percent too charming for the marriage to be a success. You have come down to his standard very effectually so far, I admit, 
It must have given you a lot of trouble, but you couldn't hope to impose on him always. Before he had discovered half your attractions, they'd break his heart. I... I don't know what to say to you. Then... then you refuse? It's a novelty to see you at a loss. Yes, I refuse unhesitatingly. Among the few certainties of life, we may count the fact that you'll never marry Cuthbert with any help from me. For the reason that you've given me? Among others, if I may say so, for the further reason that I don't wish you to be unhappy either. You find him a pill, naturally, and you'd have been bored to death. You're despising me, she exclaimed. You think I am a mercenary creature without a heart who... Don't talk to me as if I were Cuthbert. I don't despise you in the least. You are in a very precarious and overcrowded calling, and you would have married him for position, as hundreds and thousands of fashionable and wealthy girls would be willing to marry him if I smiled approval. But I know you would have found him dear at the price. And I have a third reason, though I can assert quite truthfully that the first alone would prevent my consenting. I'd like to marry you myself. You? she gasped. Why not? Of course you are not in love with me. But you like me much better than you like him. You can't dispute it. Professionally, you are nineteen, I suppose. That's to say, you are really about twenty-eight. So I am two and twenty years older than you are. It's a lump, but I am lively for my age. And if you go on flirting with me, you'll make me feel considerably younger. It'll be rough on Cuthbert, I own. My marrying you will cost him about a million. Still, he won't have you in any case, and a hundred and fifty a year would be a great deal more appropriate. Besides, it's entirely his own fault. He should have taken no for an answer when he came to see me, and then I should never have met you. Think it over. If you regard me as a fairly young man, you needn't hesitate. And if you don't, remember that there is no fool like an old one, that you will have a very good time. You couldn't respect me, murmured Miss Noble. You'd feel that I was only marrying the money, that the man didn't matter. I'm not without some natural vanity, I assure you. Come, which do you feel more at home with, him or me? You, admitted Miss Noble softly. That settles it, said Fibers. We'll get Tiffany's to send around some engagement rings in the morning. End of section 15 Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey Section 16 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Time the Humorist. Herbert Harding was one of the most distinguished dramatic critics in London one of the most scholarly and acute. Yet no man is a prophet to his family, and at home H. H. was considered to be wasting his life at the game. Of course the old people took the paper in which his first night notices appeared, and they wrestled with his essays in volume form, essays, by the way, which will always be ranked among the most valuable contributions to the psychology of the theatre, but the references to Diderot and Stendhal and other persons of whom they had never heard before baffled them mightily, and if the book had been written by anybody but Herbert, they would never have read a dozen pages of it. As Harding Sr., a sensible and hearty Englishman, used to say to his wife, "'Thank God he wasn't literary himself!' and to discuss whether the heroine of a play would have behaved like this or have behaved like that, when one knew that she wasn't a real woman at all, seemed to him the sort of tom foolishness for young girls in a drawing-room, and not the kind of thing he would have expected a son of his to do for a living, damn it. There were persons who professed to see in the fact that Harding had always been unappreciated by his relatives, the explanation of his marriage. But there were many cultured women who admired him. Gertrude Millington's homage was not singular. She was certainly amiable, and she wrote. 
Yet, when one remembers the triviality of her stories, one would have supposed her authorship would deter rather than attract a man like Harding. Besides, he had privately resented the necessity for making her acquaintance. She was a friend of one of his sisters. He had met her when he went down to his people for a fortnight in the autumn, and his mother had said, "'Oh, my son Herbert, Miss Millington. You have often heard us talk of Miss Millington, Herbert. You two should find lots to say to each other, both being writers.' Harding, who had never heard Miss Millington's name till then, there or anywhere else, thought that his mother ought to have known better. Perhaps the girl thought so too, for her smile was embarrassed. I never expected to get the chance to meet Mr. Harding, she said reverentially. Harding thawed. Since she recognized him as a master, he was prepared to tolerate her. In five minutes he had gathered that to be talking to him was one of the events of her life. Naturally, they talked of the theatre, and though her attitude towards the drama was untrained, Harding perceived an eagerness to be enlightened, a quickness of intelligence that saved him from being bored. That, at any rate, was how he put it to himself though whether her eagerness and intelligence would have interested him if she had not been passably good-looking is a doubtful point. The fortnight proved uncommonly pleasant to him, and as he did not have an opportunity for looking at any of her work until they were back in town and he was well in love with her, the crudity of her fiction did not infuriate him so violently as it would have done otherwise. On the contrary, he persuaded himself that, underlying the immaturities of style and characterization, there was the glint of genuine talent. His income derived solely from his pen was slender, but everything is relative, and Miss Millington lived in a boarding house at West Kensington. Compared with her own, his means were substantial. To cut the courtship short, he married her. Miss Millington, the unknown, became the wife of Harding, the august. Women, who had made a reputation, called on them and wondered what he could have seen in her, they were sure. His best friends confessed themselves as a bit surprised at his choice, and Harding, with all the ardour of his intellect and his affection, proceeded to cultivate his wife's mind. Never was a disciple more devoted. She put her story-writing aside. He had advised her to do that until she was more widely read, and plodded conscientiously through the list of classics that he drew up for her improvement. As often as he obtained two seats, she went to the theatre with him and listened absorbed to his catalogue of the play's defects. Because she loved him dearly and panted to please, she never failed to assure him that she understood and thoroughly agreed with everything he said, though this was a flagrant lie, and Harding promoted her to Ibsen and expounded his qualities to her for hours on end. She grew to miss her scribbling by degrees, by degrees she grew to sicken at the intellectual stuffing. Before long her delight at going to a theatre was marred by her dread of the critics' edifying monologue when they returned, but she never yawned, she never faltered, she endured the deadly dullness of her education without a murmur. Her confinement was a holiday. Harding, however, was far too fond of his wife to neglect her because he had a son, and after she was up again, he devoted as much earnest attention to her as before. By this time she could give forth dozens of his opinions with all the fidelity of a phonograph, and he contemplated her progress with the tenderest pride. 
the baby and the nurse and the necessary change in the domestic arrangements meant increased expenses and now she sometimes reflected that the modest checks obtainable by her pen would be an aid once she said to him herbert when do you think i might go back to my work don't you think i might write something again now what do you want to write he asked with an indulgent smile i suppose what i ought to do is another book i should like to write a play though a play he stared my child you aren't a dramatist well i never shall be one if i don't make a beginning i should think i ought to be able to manage a piece after all i've read harding smiled again wryly the temerity of the novice was a wonderful thing you know more than you did but dramatic construction isn't to be mastered in a year and a half goose even by the born playwright it's never to be mastered at all without trying is it there was a touch of obstinacy in her tone and he was greatly disappointed since she could speak in so light a fashion of accomplishing a play it seemed that she had learned nothing after all the magnitude of the undertaking did not impress her in the least she talked like the proverbial amateur doesn't it occur to you he said patiently that although i know considerably more about it than you do i don't write plays i recognize what i lack and i recognize what you lack i'm not trying to make a dramatist of you my child i simply want you to have an acquaintance with what is best in dramatic literature i want you to be able to discriminate as to your writing again perhaps you will but not yet not yet by any means and when you do of course it should be a story really whether you write or whether you don't is of no importance why aspire to authorship before they married she had counted herself an author already she winced but his remonstrance affectionate as it was took the pluck out of her she let the subject down and put her aspirations on the shelf she divided her time between the baby and the books henceforth though the baby came gradually to receive the larger share they had three children and an odious little house in balham when she did pencil act one a drawing room at last she did not mean to let harding guess her project till the comedy was finished she knew that he would have discouraged her that he would have repeated that she had no qualifications for dramatic work or at best that it was years too soon for her to attempt it but she told herself that when the piece was done when she read it to him and saw his pleasure that would make amends for everything she pictured his surprise as she said carelessly oh by the way if you can spare an hour this evening there's something i want you to hear the anxiety of his gaze as she produced the manuscript and announced a comedy in three acts she could imagine that too he would sit down nervously twisting his moustache and of course her voice would wobble frightfully then presently his face would change she foresaw his smile the sudden lift of his head at a good line the growing wonder of his expression in her hopes she heard him explain that her work had wit brilliance and above all reality that she had amazed and made him proud of her it was a young and rather foolish woman's dream but it sprang from her love for him quite as much as from her personal ambitions and she wrote she drove her pen in secret for months she was not a slow writer far from it but there were few occasions on which she could feel confident of being undisturbed her best hours were when there was a first night somewhere 
for then there was no danger of Harding popping into the room before she could thrust the manuscript out of sight. While the critic sat in judgment at the theatre, his wife sat in Belham, scribbling dialogue with a rapidity that would have horrified him. Indeed, it made her distrust herself in moments. She questioned if it was possible for first-rate work to be produced so quickly. Yet, when she read the scene, it sounded capital. She came to the conclusion that her swiftness proved her to be even more accomplished as a dramatist than she had supposed. Harding generally found her in high good humour when he returned. And though it was very late, for now his notices had to be delivered before he went home, he used to tell her the plot of the play that he had been to see, and she would agree sapiently with all his observations. The disciple had in fact become a companion by now, and despite the state of the exchequer, Harding knew no regret for having married her. When he recalled the uncultured girl of the honeymoon, and contrasted her with the woman who understood most of his English references and quotations, he was delighted with the success he had effected. It was with a shock, a shudder, one day, that he picked off the mantelpiece a bill for typewriting The Audacity of Dinah in three acts. Forebodings hinted that his success wasn't quite so triumphant as he had thought. What's this? Oh, how stupid she had been to leave it there. Now she had to tell him the great news differently from the way she had planned. It's mine. I see it is, said Harding. The audacity of Dinah? Her nod was embarrassed. Yes. I didn't know you were writing. No, I didn't want you to know till I could read it to you. I meant to tell you after dinner. I am very anxious to hear if you think it will do. She flushed and smiled shyly. I'm rather pleased with it. I've been at it a long time. I think, I think I've done something you'll find a good word for. Baby, said Harding, pinching her cheek. I've no doubt I shall find a good word for it, but I'm afraid I shall have to say things you won't like, too. I shall be quite candid with you, I warn you. Oh, that's just what I want, she declared, laughing happily. I want you to forget who I am altogether. You must be just Herbert Harding listening to a new author. No compliments, no, what's the word, euphemisms. It's to be real criticism, please. All right, he said. Well, when am I to hear it? At once? I think after dinner will be best. I've always pictured you listening to it after dinner, and there'll be nothing to interrupt us when the last post has been. Mind, I shall be awfully frightened. You must make allowances for that. Something in her hearing, in her voice, more still perhaps something in the fact that she was dear to him, raised his hopes. His suspense was nearly as keen as her own while they dined, and when the servant had shut the door, and Gertrude commanded him to sit down in that chair, and to refrain from looking at her for the first few minutes, his hands were not quite steady as he filled his pipe. She drew her own chair to the table, and after an instant's hesitation, began to read. Harding listened intently, his gaze fixed on the fire, and before she had read for half an hour, astonishment laid hold of him. A while ago, catching something of her excitement, he had fancied that the play might reveal a talent that he had underrated, a promise of good things to come. Originally, he had fancied that it would repel him, but at no time had he fancied that it would be quite so dejecting as it was. He was astounded that any woman who had studied so much good work could be capable of writing so badly. The man 
suffered, silently and acutely suffered, as, gaining courage, she declaimed her travesty of human nature with gusto. He pitied her. He could have wept for her. He would rather have been compelled to sit out a pantomime every night for a year than to tell her the truth. But she closed the covers of Act I and said with her soul in her eyes, Well? He shifted the pipe between his teeth and stifled a groan. Let me hear it right through, he answered, postponing the evil moment. Act Two, she continued in a clear voice. It was eleven o'clock when the ordeal ended. His wife leant back in her seat, her hands clasped in her lap, and waited. Despairingly, he sought for some particle of honest praise. Uh, the theme isn't bad, he said. Ah, but it isn't worked out properly. Oh, he hastened to add, there are lots of very pretty lines. That's nice, she beamed. You put them in the wrong people's mouths, though. In the last act, you make your misanthrope talk like the cheerable brothers. Kindness has changed his nature, then. Don't you like the girl? She's not consistent, he complained. She's seventeen one minute and thirty-five the next. She has had no social experience, yet she scores off the woman of the world in every answer. That's the fault all through. If you see a chance for something smart, you can't resist it, whether it's appropriate to the character or not. The mother makes an epigram in the situation where she thinks her son has been killed. She'd be inarticulate. She wouldn't fire off epigrams. There was a long pause. At last she said, stonily, In other words, you don't think anything of it. He shifted his pipe again. Well... Oh, be frank, Herbert, she cried. She was very white. There mustn't be any humbug between you and me. It's no good, Gertie, he confessed wretchedly. She gathered it up and put it in a drawer and shut the drawer very quietly. Her mouth had hardened. He was a distinguished critic and her husband, but she was an author and her pride was in arms. For the first time she doubted his wisdom. For the first time she opposed her will to his. It was no good, he had said, she could not accept the pronouncement. She would prove to him that he was wrong. We won't talk any more about it, she said presently, when he offered some feeble comfort. I've made a mistake, that's all. But she meant that her mistake was having invited his opinion, not having written the comedy. She determined to submit it to the Piccadilly Theatre without delay. Of course, she would not put her own name to it now, as he thought it so worthless, he would probably object to its being known as his wife's even if it were produced. She would choose a pseudonym. And if her work were taken, if it made a success, she would mention to him very gently, but firmly, that he was too ready to find fault, that his prejudices warped his judgment, in fact, that he wasn't quite so excellent a critic as he believed himself to be. At this point, it may be stated that his criticism of the audacity of Dinah was absolutely sound. The piece was every bit as bad as he thought it. She posted the manuscript the following afternoon, and many weeks later it was returned to her with a regret. The Piccadilly, she said doggedly, was not the only theatre in London. She made up the parcel once more and sent it to the diadem. The diadem also regretted and took longer to communicate the fact. To several West End theatres the comedy was offered unavailingly, and then she reread the brief note with rapture several times, 
a manager wrote asking her to call. Not before the contract was signed and stamped did she announce her news to Harding. It was a great moment for her. Nearly eighteen months had passed since the day of the reading, but she had not forgotten the humiliation that he had inflicted. He realized that suddenly, discomfortingly, by the inflections of her voice, by the look in her eyes, by her new air of self-esteem. I am very glad for you, he faltered, and she replied, I am sure you are, dear, with a touch of patronage. He did not attend the production himself. As he explained to her, he would have been bound to express his convictions sincerely. The editor put on another man to do the audacity of Dinah, and, on the whole, the other man's notice was favorable. With a few exceptions, all the press was tolerant. Better still, the piece captured the public. The booking next day was brisk and increased steadily through the week. On the second Saturday night, they played to the capacity of the house. The comedy came to be known as one of the few genuine successes of the year, and of course it had leaked out that the author was Mrs. Herbert Harding. The illustrated journals devoted a page to her photograph, favoring their readers with details of her literary methods and with her views on the world in general. A manufacturer's advertisements informed the kingdom that the audacity of Dinah had been written with a dashaway fountain pen, price ten shillings and sixpence of all stationers. She lectured to the front row club on how to write a play. Posters proclaimed the 300th performance, and various theatrical managers expressed a deferential hope that they too might be privileged to produce some of her brilliant work. They were. She has never written anything so popular since, but she has reeled out several successful plays of similar quality. The Hardings have removed from Balham and live in a high-sounding terrace at a fashionable gate, and the children often caution Herbert not to make a noise on the stairs because Mamma is busy. Gertrude is a personage who speaks with quiet authority in the home today and drives to rehearsal in a thousand-guinea motor-car. When he goes alone, the critic takes an omnibus and feels more cheerful. In spite of the luxurious menage that she provides, he wishes frequently that he were alone for good. End of section 16